Leonard Leach, The Monster Eater Eastbound From the author of Rats of the Ruins and Icy's Song 1. Rebirth He had now been chasing the bandits for several weeks through half of Alaska. Almost every day he came across a burned-down farm, a raided logging camp, or the dead bodies of traveling merchants left by the wayside. The gang around Vincent Vargas was not in the habit of leaving witnesses behind. What really worried Leonard Leach, however, was the fact that more and more often pieces had been bitten out of the corpses as the bandits and their hunter left civilization with all its gold digger towns, stagecoaches, and saloons behind. His duty as a marshal, which he had accepted after the Civil War, was to hunt down and stop guys like this Vargas. He had done this successfully many times before and had no problem with the violence that came along. In a way, hunting down murderers was more honest and honorable than to go into battle under the flag of some cause or nation. He spat out. He had not yet seen bandits like the ones he was after. In the beginning, they had simply shot their victims down, but the corpses he now came across looked much worse. Throats were always torn to shreds, faces were bruised, bellies were slashed and intestines were spread over a radius of several meters. Blood on snow. And then, a week ago, he had noticed the absence of limbs for the first time. At first, this had occurred sporadically. An arm here or a leg there but by now Leach was certain that the bandits were cannibals. He wondered if they had seen him yet. Did they know they were followed? For a second he stared up at the black cyclopean cave entrance to which he had traced Vargas and his bunch of killers. Leach watched his breathing clouds dissolve after a few meters, listened to the steady beat of his heart. A little too fast. Then he sighed got off his horse and immediately sank one foot deep into the snow. He was not too worried about it, because the snow would not hinder him. Leech was sure that the final confrontation would take place in the cave. He checked the two large caliber, five-shot revolvers. From his saddle he removed the Winchester and the cavalry saber. His name was engraved on the blade and below his name the word sergeant. He operated the bolt-action lever and loaded a cartridge into the chamber. Then he began the ascent. Now, when he actually came for them, he realized that the entrance of the cave which he had seen from below was further away than he first had assumed. Step by step he worked his way forward, pausing now and then to listen and peer upwards. They seemed to have no guards in place. His gaze groped across the irregularly standing trees from right to left and back again, and then got stuck in the middle. There was, something. Something did not fit into the picture. He walked on carefully, circled a dying birch tree, and then he saw what had made him suspicious. On the one hand there was the path that meandered up to the cave. The footprint seemed to be only a few hours old, if Leech took the current snowfall into account. They also told him that the bandits had taken their horses on the reins, presumably to make sure that the animals, which out here were almost as valuable as a sack of gold nuggets, would not be injured during the climb. But the path and the traces were not the real reason for him being alert. What had caught Leech's attention was once to the left and once again to the right of the beginning of the path. The structures were two men high and they were made entirely of bone. Leech had stopped when he realized what he was facing here. He once turned completely around his own axis and concentrated on watching his surroundings over the barrel of his Winchester. When he was sure that he was still alone and unobserved, he lowered his weapon and stepped towards one of the strange structures. The core of the bizarre arrangement of bones, completely freed of meat remains, had an approximate pyramid shape with a base of about one square meter and reached Leech up to the shoulder. Then a kind of flagpole followed, which grew out of the center of the structure. From this, individual branches rose, whose respective ends were marked by attached skulls. What Leech noticed next was that the bones were not exclusively of human origin. He could recognize the thoraxes, spines, 
thighs and lower legs and more skulls of wolves, bears, moose, larger birds and other animals. Downwards, the withered stay of the bones told him that they became older. At ground level, the bones were so weathered that Leech was now certain that it was not Vargas and his men who had put up the morbid road markings. But then who? Indians? How old were these things? The left bone tower offered a similar sight. The marshal rubbed his eyes. If he looked too closely and tried to fathom the symmetry of the structures, which seemed to follow a strange, incomprehensible law, he was overcome by a slight dizziness. He shook off the bad feeling, gripped his Winchester tighter and continued his ascent. As it was the peculiarity of naturally formed paths, this one also led up to the cave entrance on the easiest way, which even an experienced trapper could not have chosen better. The path elegantly circled rocks and cut a creek at its narrowest point so that Leech could easily get to the other side with a big step. Besides the course of the path, which was lined every ten meters by more of the eerie bone towers, Leech's attention was focused on the tracks and the snow at his feet. Until now, none of Vargas' men had ever left the path. This fact reassured Leech. So he was sure that nobody could stab him in the back. Nevertheless, it felt the urge to turn around, especially near the bone towers. Once he even thought he heard crunching steps in the snow further down. After he had waited several minutes of listening and peering to see if someone was actually coming along the path behind him, he admitted to himself that he had probably become a victim of his own tension. He had now climbed the path to three quarters of its height. He would follow the trail for a few more meters and then leave it. Leech could not be sure but he assumed that the last part of the path could be seen from the cave entrance. It would be a pitiful death to be shot down by one of the bandits out of the darkness of the cave like a dog without having had the slightest chance to return fire. But he was too much of a veteran of many battles and skirmishes to allow that to happen. Right next to one, the 18th bone tower he had counted, Leech left the path. He worked his way carefully. The snow was here, off the trail, a little deeper and soon he was sweating under his heavy riding coat and the Stetson. He forced himself to walk more slowly so that he would not get a side sting and his breaths would not become too loud. After a quarter of an hour, he had brought himself up to the level of the entrance and approached it carefully from the side, invisible to a possible sentry, at least until he would swing the barrel of his Winchester around and enter. When five meters separated him from his target, he paused. He stretched his aching back, tried to loosen his muscles. The entrance was bordered by two more of the bone towers, only that these were even bigger and more impressive than the ones he had seen along the path. He had seen Indian ritual places several times, or the cemeteries of the Huron, and each time he had been filled with a kind of respect as he felt it in a similar way when he entered a church, even though he thought he had lost his faith since the experiences he had had during the war. But this, this did not trigger feelings of respect or even awe. When he listened deep inside himself, he felt only instinctive reluctance, spiced with a hint of fear. Then, when he had prepared himself as well as he could, he covered the remaining distance quickly but quietly. Once more his eyes groped over the weathered bones and once more he had to avert his gaze as he began to sway. He shook his head to get rid of the dizziness, forced himself to remember why he had come here. Damn bones! He crouched and moved carefully past the bizarre totem. Somehow he didn't seem to pay attention, because something suddenly cut into his left thigh just below his revolver. When he looked down, he saw that the shattered tip of a human forearm bone had protruded a little further out of the dead than the rest of the bones. A few drops of his blood stuck to it and glittered red in the light of the winter sun. He cursed silently. It was more of a scratch than a wound, but still he was annoyed by his own carelessness. It also burned a little, but that didn't matter now. In a moment he would enter the entrance of the cave, and then it would be all over soon. The gallows birds wanted to hide in a damn Indian cemetery? 
Yeah, he would come for them anyway. He would come even if they were hiding in hell itself. He wanted the bounty. Well, to get that, he would have to discard his martial S star, but that was no problem. Vargas and his men were hated throughout the country. He would simply collect the money in some town where nobody knew him, then pin the star back on his chest and ride home to again be the marshal of a miserable small town in the northwest. The bounty was not the only reason why he would let nothing and no one stop him from bringing down the men. During the war, atrocities and barbarism had become familiar enough, but the trail of dead that Vargas left behind had to end. Enemy soldiers and Indians were one thing. Settlers, traders, and gold diggers, civilians, another. He took a deep breath, took the time to consciously pay attention to the taste of the cold air, sucked it into his lungs and slowly expelled it again. The barrel of his Winchester moved, closely followed by his head, around the bone tower. The cave entrance was now directly in front of him. He was unguarded as far as Leech could see. The daylight reached perhaps four or five meters into the cave, behind it there seemed to be only blackness. The horses of Vargas gang shied away from the darkness and tried to stay in the daylight as much as the lassos with which they were tied to a dead tree trunk allowed. One of the horses seemed to be lame. This was probably the reason why the bandits had set up their quarters here. Altogether there were six animals. The saddles had been removed and placed on the trunk, the saddlebags and blankets were missing. He left his cover and entered the area, which was partly overhung by rock and somewhat wide, at the rear wall of which an approximately three-man-wide corridor led deeper into the mountain. The horses snorted restlessly, but they could smell his own animal on leech, and so their expressions of displeasure were not too loud. He drew his attention to the blackness into which he was about to enter. Leech had planned to simply grope along the wall with one of his revolvers in his hand until he could see light again. They would certainly not sit in the dark down there. The fact that he had no torch or lamp with him would prove to be an advantage. At least that was how he imagined it. He imagined the cursed cannibals sitting around their fire, completely unaware. If he succeeded in sneaking up on them unnoticed, be within firing range, it would be easy for him to kill three or four of them before they would be able to discover his muzzle flash and return fire. As he stared into the dark, his plan was thwarted for the first time by chance. Far behind, down in the blackness a light appeared, moving up and down. A lamp. The position of the light source told him that the corridor led down relatively steeply and two seconds later Leech had registered that the person carrying the lamp was moving towards him. He scurried aside and looked around for a hiding place, but there was none. Leech had no choice but to hide among the animals and try to finish off the cutthroat with his saber, or, further out, in the woods, wait until the man would retreat back into the cave. Under no circumstances did he want to warn Vargas by shooting now. But he did not want to lose time either. He did not like this place. Marshal Leach chose the first option. Between the animals he crouched down. He laid his rifle gently on the rocky ground, which, as he saw only now, was covered over and over with tiny white splinters. Even more bones. Leech slowly and quietly drew his saber and waited. He knew how to wait, he had waited many times before. At some point he heard footsteps. Five seconds later he was sure that it was only one man, who had come out the cave. The steps came closer and closer and now he could see the man's legs under the horse's bellies. The bandit had stopped, apparently to extinguish the lamp, and shortly thereafter Leech revealed a soft, Tinny noise that the man must have set the lamp down on a ledge. What was that guy up to? Take a leak? Keep watch? Feed the horses? It was the latter. Whistling softly to himself, the bandit hung the food bag over the head of the first animal and talked calmly to it. He waited a few minutes, then took the sack again and repeated the procedure with the next animal. The black horse. 
behind which Leech was hiding, would be next. Leech crept around the abdomen of the animal, which twitched nervously with its tail. Leech couldn't say whether this was due to him or whether it was just the anticipation of the upcoming meal. He peered around the animal's flank, and as he thought it would, his victim pushed aside the head of the animal he had just taken care of and approached the horse that Leech was using as cover. He could recognize the man now. It was Boyd. Leech knew his wanted poster. The guy was almost as bad as Vargas himself. The moment Boyd slipped the feedback over the animal's head, Leonard Leech took two quick steps. Boyd's startled gaze glided across his face. Leech straightened up. Boyd grasped and felt for the gun on his hip. Leech struck out. The moment Boyd's fingers closed around the revolver grip, the saber blade hit him in the forehead, penetrated deeply into the skull bone and drew a dark red line running slightly downwards across the face towards Boyd's left eye, which was half torn out of the cave by the blade. He was dead immediately. Leech left the body. He could empty Boyd's pockets later. Fortunately, the horses were quite unimpressed by all of that. He cleaned the saber blade on Boyd's pants, then he put the weapon back into its sheath. It took the feed sack immediately again from the nag and deposited it on the ground out of reach of the animals. On the way back to civilization he could use the extra food for his own horse. He peered into the darkness of the rock passage, then to the oil lamp that Boyd had placed on the ledge. It no longer burned. He fumbled around in his pockets until he had found his matches. Found them. Good. Now it was too early, but later he might need the lamp. He tied it to his belt with a strip of leather. Just as he was about to dive into the blackness of the cave, he noticed the paintings. Indian hunting scenes, stick figures more or less, smeared with dark red paint on the rock. Primitive. What was the prey that the hunters were chasing in the picture? He was almost tempted to light the lamp in order to see more, but then he heard a sound from the depths. He pulled one of his Smith & Wesson revolvers. He had hired a gunsmith, Remo Harris, to modify the barrel and drum so that he could use larger bullets, which he also had Remo handcroft. He only had five shots instead of six before he had to reload the guns but he could be pretty sure that once he had hit an enemy, no matter where on the body, he would not be able to shoot back. He cocked the cock weapon and stretched out his free hand to the side. He had intended to stroke along the rock face with his fingertips as he descended into the cave, so as not to lose his orientation, but when his fingertips now touched the wall, it sent a sudden, violent shock of lightning through him. He saw something, but not with his eyes an animal. None that he had ever seen before. It wavered, seemed to change its shape in a strange way. It spoke, but he could not understand the words. Leonard Leach grabbed his head with both hands. What was that about? The image of the strange animal slowly faded, but it still changed. He saw a hint of eagle wings, which slowly faded in the darkness in front of him. Then it was gone. Leech slapped his hands in his face. His right still held the revolver. The cold metal of the weapon on his cheek calmed him down. The fingers of the other hand were red on the fingertips and wet. He cleaned his fingers on the sleeve of his jacket, took a deep breath and shook the picture off. Then finally he began to put one foot in front of the other. After a few minutes he stopped. There was the sound from earlier again. And now that Leech had come closer, he could identify it. It was a cough. Leech went on, aware of the enemy contact coming soon and even more cautious than before. Then he noticed the brightness, at first just a faint shimmer, then it was bright enough and Leech could see that the hallway made a bend. That cough again. He went on, and then he saw her. There were two of them. Leech did not know them and Vargas was not there. They sat around a small fire. Both had their faces turned toward the passage he was just coming down. The left one, 
that was the one who was coughing, was rolling a cigarette. His rifle was at his feet, a little too close to the fire when it went to leech. The right one crouched forward on his saddle and his fingers played with the drum of the colt, which he casually held in his hands. That would be Leech's first target. While he was targeting the man's head, he was the older of the two, he was aware that the surprise advantage he was currently enjoying would be forfeited with the first shot. However, he saw no way to finish off the two bandits silently. Too bad that they had split up. He held his breath, corrected the barrel by a few millimeters and squeezed the trigger. At the same time as the bang, which seemed insanely loud in the silence of the cave, a penny-sized red dot appeared in the middle of the gunslinger's forehead, and behind him, on the other side of his head, a cloud of blood, bone splinters, and whitish brain matter rose up. Individual splashes hit the smoker's frightened face. He dropped the cigarette he had just finished, stared in Leech's direction, to where the shot had come from that had killed his comrade. He reached for his rifle, but he wanted to reach for it, because Leech's second bullet tore off half of his hand and then howled away as a ricochet. The smoker screamed like an animal, and the cave threw back his cries many times. A bullet in the heart silenced him. From deeper in the cave was called. They wanted to know what had happened. Of course. Leech let the drum of his gun slide out and replaced the empty cartridges with full ones. Without being able to understand the words, he identified Vargas' voice. He spent ten or twenty or thirty breaths listening and wiping the sweat from his brow. No steps. They would not come to look. Instead, they would dig in. Like badgers in their burrow, waiting for the dog to come and get them. In this case he did not mind being a dog. They had it coming. He saw what the two of them had lying on a carved skewer next to their fire. It was the thigh of a human being, a man, according to the hair to close. The gnawed off lower leg bone lay somewhat apart. Leech sneaked towards the fire and the bodies, so low down that he barely walked on all fours. The smoker's chest was a wet red crater, the head of the other was only a mushy mass on the back, which made it look as if half of the skull was sunk into the cave floor, just as the man was lying on his back. Leech looked at the thigh that was ready to be fried. In the area of the groin and above the knee frayed off. Poor pig. He hoped the man had already been dead when they did this to him. He pushed himself a little closer. In death they look young, the cannibals. The murderers. He took their weapons. He leaned the rifle against the wall of the cave and put the revolver in the pocket of his coat after making sure that the drum was fully loaded. His gaze glided over the fire. It was not very big, actually not suitable for frying the thigh. He got caught in the flames. In the depth of the embers he perceived the beast again. In one moment it had the head of a bear, in the other moment it had the head of a wolf, it struck with its eagle wings, rose up and then disintegrated into the sparks of the fire, which were rising upwards. Hunters. What was wrong with him? He shook off the impression, the mouth that seemed to say something to him that he did not understand, the strange jaw that seemed to be equipped sometimes with bare teeth, sometimes with those of a wolf and sometimes with those of a human being. It would have been tempting, here and now, to indulge in these bizarre images, to lose himself in them, but he had something to do. He had not been given anything to drink in the last days. That had to be it. He didn't really miss the booze, but his body seemed to have gotten too used to the comfortable marshal's life he had been leading since the end of the war. They had told him it was a reward. He had thought it was a prison. Wasn't the guard always just as much a prisoner as those he guarded? Once more he ran his hands over his face, leaving a smudged red stripe that, from his forehead, ran across his left eye and got lost on his stubbly cheek. The light of the fire told him that the walls of the cave, here where the two guards had taken up guard duty, were also covered over and over with the strange drawings that he had examined at the entrance. 
The passage led him further down, and soon he saw himself surrounded by darkness again. Once he got a fright when he ran into a spider web and could feel a vibrating crawling that transferred to his face via the sticky threads. He expelled air, but could barely prevent his fright from exploding into an outcry. Twenty paces below, he could hear them, their conspiratorial, tense whispering, the rustling of their clothes, the pebbles and tiny bone splinters they pushed over the rocky ground when they changed position. He saw them before him, pointing their weapons into the darkness, tense, ready to fire at anything the blackness would spit at them. The fluttering, faint echoes that the quiet, strangely muffled sounding noises produced were enough to let him know that it was no longer a corridor where they were waiting for him, but a kind of room. Surely this was the place where they slept and he must have been very close. He could already smell the fire. He did not understand why he could not see a light until he could feel the heavy fabric of the curtain they had put up in the hallway. As soon as he had the material, he assumed that they were animal skins, touched them and thus set them into vibration, they fired with everything they had. When the first hole appeared above him and a fine beam of light cut through the blackness, he threw himself on the ground and waited. Ricochets bounced off the cave ceiling, created sparks and disappeared buzzing behind Leech in the darkness. He waited for the pause that would inevitably follow when they had to reload their weapons, and while he waited, more and more holes appeared and with them ghostly rays of light that seemed to reach for him, indicating the trajectories of the bullets. The holes were all in the upper third of the screen, and apart from the fact that he was grateful for the new brightness that had been created, this fact told him that Vargas and the rest of his men probably had to be a little below him. Leech crawled up the curtain and peeked through one of the lower bullet holes. They had retreated behind their fire and distributed. Their camp was located in a kind of depression and the slope leading down to it was not very steep. He was the first to recognize Vargas himself. The bastard had taken cover behind a rock and peered up at him as he loaded bullets into his Henry rifle butt. Another bandit, MacDonald, if Leech was not mistaken, was lying on his stomach behind his saddle and aimed with a squinched eye also towards the curtain. He could not see the third one. He would scare them up. He put his Smith & Wesson special back into the holster and took out the colt he had captured. He hid his hands in his coat when he cocked the cock. You should not hear it. Then he fired the weapon empty through the curtain. Three of the only roughly aimed bullets bounced howling off the rock behind which Vargas hid himself. Two more missed MacDonald by a few inches and the last one went through his right boot and foot. The shrill cries of the man filled the cave. Leech dropped the empty gun. The curtain was torn aside. Vargas fired a shot from further back. Leech's hand lay on the handle of his weapons. The third man appeared directly in front of him. The one he had not been able to see. Compton. The bullet that Vargas fired at Leech hit the cave wall to his left. Stone splinters cut Leech's face, and the moment Compton started shooting, he fell backwards. He did not register the balls whistling over him. His eye, his fucking left eye. A splinter had hit it. His unharmed eye now also began to water, and through that veil Leech saw Compton, whose shots had all missed him, pull a bowie knife from his belt and try to jump on him. Echoes of the eerie murals danced in front of the marshal's wounded eye as he crawled away to the back and panically tried to pull one of his Smith and Wessons. Compton uttered an animal war cry and came after him with a bare blade. Not a second too soon Leech managed to draw and fire the weapon. The large caliber bullet hit Compton in the neck. The brawny man froze in motion, his head tilted to the side, like a tree falls in which one notches him on one side. His face expressed mild astonishment and his eyes sought leeches. Then his face exploded as the second bullet first shattered the jawbone, then the palate and finally his skull. Leech saw the knife fall to the ground, then Compton's body followed gravity and tilted forward. What was left of his head landed just inches from Leech's bloody, tear-soaked face, 
and the stench of Compton's open skull and burnt hair penetrated his nose. When the marshal laboriously sat up, and then stood up completely, he tried not to reach into the ever-growing pool of blood. He did not succeed. He would not grope for his eye with Compton's blood on his hands, which still watered and hurt like hell. The tears in his right eye, however, gradually dried up. Leech realized that Compton's attack had driven him several feet back into the hallway, so he couldn't see Vargas and MacDonald, even though Compton had pulled the curtain down. But he could still hear the screams of MacDonald. Despite the pain and anxiety he suffered because of his injured eye, a gloating smile was stolen from Leech's face as he imagined what the foot might look like in the man's riding boot after he had made the acquaintance of the bullet. Leech leaned with his back against the cold rock and replaced the two cartridges he had just fired at Compton with new ones. Then he also drew his second revolver. It was time to finish it. He moved forward. He had almost reached the beginning of the slope again, which led down into the valley, when his injured eye began to throb, no, to pulsate. He felt a soft, somehow curious touch in his head. No, not in his head. Not even in his brain, it was his soul that was scanned. Layer by layer exposed, examined. Again he had the image of the multifaceted animal before his eyes and as it penetrated to the deeper layers of his soul, to the layers he kept secret from others, and then to the layers he had even closed off from himself, the animal began to tear apart, shatter, and slit open the barriers with its bare paws so that it could see what lay beneath. The pain in his head was indescribable, increasing immensely until he carried it away, tore into the darkness and he could no longer distinguish pain from almost orgasmic ecstasy. Only one word remained in his mind, echoing back from afar, and his echo was thrown back millions of times by the walls of the cave. The word was, Hunter. It ate into his brain. Then nothing more. When he regained consciousness, he was lying on the ground near the campfire and all he could see was a pair of shabby boots. It took him a moment to realize that he had collapsed and that Vargas had tied him up. Turning his head, he saw that MacDonald, who had stopped screaming, was also leaning against his saddle, sitting by the fire, busy cutting his tattered foot out of his boot with a knife, as Compton had carried one. When he noticed Leech regaining consciousness, he gave him a diabolical grin before he gave his leader a quick glance and then turned back to his foot. Vargas snapped his fingers twice in quick succession to attract Leech's attention. Marshal Leech we suspected them several days behind us. What a surprise they have given us. Bravo. 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 He clapped his palms together scornfully. Too bad you had that little. Fit of weakness. For me and MacDonald here, of course, that's not quite such a pity. We would have had to look for food soon anyway. He was now kneeling in front of Leech so that he could see nothing but Vargas' dirty face, the dirty, pointed teeth and the occasional hair on his repeatedly broken nose. But this. He snapped his index finger in the direction of Leech's left eye, and it was only when his finger hit his target that Marshall realized it wasn't just a small splinter sticking out of his eye, and when the pain came and almost took his consciousness away again, he realized that whatever was in his eye must have been several inches long and had just been driven further into him. Oh, Marshal, excuse me. Did that hurt? You know, this may be uncomfortable for you, but I... I like the taste of pain. It gives the meat a very special spice. Marshal? Marshal, stay with me. Leech slipped away. The animal called out to him. It curled. Stroke with the back of his clawed paws gently over his head, and finally over his eye. The pain went away. The animal seemed to laugh. Again Leech saw Vargas' face in front of him. The mouth moved, telling of the desire to tear living flesh with one's own teeth, to feel the warm blood running down the throat, to feel the essence, to absorb the soul of the prey within oneself, to live on. 
Vargas' eyes began to glow, to glimmer, and with every word that came out of his mouth, he seemed to change a little more. His hands grew, bristly hair sprouted in places where none had been before. The skin pulsed in his face as well, the bones seemed to shift, his teeth grew as well, became razor sharp. Especially the canines. Everything about Vargas deformed, but Leech did not feel that it was wrong or unnatural. The longer he stared spellbound at the face of his enemy, horrified and fascinated at the same time, the more Leech felt as if the beast had merely removed a mask and was now, under the protection of the cave and illuminated by the flickering fire, revealing its true form. The shape of a wolf. Man-wolf. Werewolf. Leech knew the stories, he remembered the stories his grandmother had told him, the stories he and his brothers had made up for each other and whispered to each other softly when they should have been asleep. It's all true, he whispered with his chapped lips. Vargas' wolf face smiled, growling affirmatively. Then he knocked his teeth into Leech's body. Leech felt his flesh rip open, his blood begin to flow, but it wasn't this that paralyzed him with horror, that clasped him relentlessly, that began to grab at him and devour his insides. Vargas' malice, his hunger, his lust for killing penetrated deeper into Leech's soul with every piece of meat the werewolf tore from his body. After the third bite he could feel Vargas' lust as he chewed, tore, and devoured it. After the sixth bite, he looked forward to the next one, was united with Vargas in a death frenzy, they were two sides of a single coin. And just as Leech was about to surrender to his fate, he felt as if he heard the beating of big wings and then there was the strange animal that pushed the wolf back from him. Whenever the wolf got hold of it, it changed its shape, was in one moment also a wolf, then again an eagle, then a bear and in the next moment a blow, which hit its poisonous teeth into the neck of the wolf. The battle of the beasts seemed to go on forever and Leech's head was about to explode. Their hissing, growling and shrieking roared in his ears as they fought in him while they struggled for his life. And for his soul. Then the poison of the snake finally did its work. The werewolf staggered, the snake turned into a bear, which bit the lower jaw of the werewolf like a dry twig and hurled the enemy with a mighty jerk of its head into the vastness of Leech's mind. But before Vargas finally fled, he tore a deep notch with his claws into the substance that made Leech, a rift that would never heal again. The beast disappeared in the distance and only the animal with the eagle wings was still there. It looked down on Leech, neither good nor bad, just looked down on him, and it took another eternity to finish. Leech looked back, and at some point he realized how old this creature must be. Older than man, as old as the earth, the sun, and the moon. And he understood that it not only looked, but that it gave him something. He felt the wounds of his body close, new energy flow through him and knowledge permeate him, knowledge of the old beings, knowledge of the cycles of the worlds, knowledge of birth and death. And when he had understood all this, the beast turned his head, looked at the wound the werewolf had left in Leech's soul and Leech recognized the regret in the beast's eyes. Then it flapped its wings a few times, and the knowledge it had given it was whirled by it into the depths of its mind, only scattered withdrawn from its conscious grasp, but not lost. Then the animal was no longer there. It took Leech a third eternity to gather as much of the swirling knowledge as he could and was unable to find any more. Then he could no longer bear to be alone in his own soul and return to his body. Three weeks later he was in a hotel room in Dawson City. On the bed in front of him were several packages. All of them were custom-made products that he had commissioned. From the weapons, to the clothing, to the eye patch and the hat. By the time he regained consciousness in the cave, Vargas and MacDonald had disappeared and his shackles had been loosened. He was startled in panic, and only when he stood and realized that he could actually stand, that he was still alive, did he look down at himself in fear. His clothes had been torn to shreds and soaked in blood where the werewolf had bitten him, but as he carefully groped, he could see that the skin underneath was intact. He had been so hungry. 
Although it wasn't that long ago, Leech remembered with a kind of embarrassing pleasure how he had torn off his clothes so that he could see exactly that his guts weren't hanging out of his abdominal wall. Naked he had kneeled in front of the fire and enjoyed the warmth, had not wanted to wear his bled-out clothes anymore, had felt that he had outgrown them. He was no longer a soldier, a marshal, or a bounty hunter. Carefully his fingers had wandered over his face. Even what had been in his eye had disappeared. He had been sitting there like that for a very long time, and only when he had been ready to leave the cave and the fire had not been burning for a long time, did he realize that he could still see despite the darkness. He had experienced too many unexplainable things that day to be surprised. And his hunger had been too great. Strangely enough, the two corpses lying around the curtain of animal skins in which he had wrapped himself had not aroused his appetite. Only when he had come to the horses and seen Boyd's dead body lying in front of him, he had not been able to hold on to it and had kicked his teeth into the cold, dead flesh. By now he knew that Boyd had also been a werewolf. The memory of this precious moment made him smile. He stepped in front of the mirror and brushed shaving foam into his face. He looked younger now, much younger in his left eye was that of a wolf. It allowed him to see them. To see them as they really were. The werewolves, the vampires, the witches, they all were no longer hidden from him. He now knew how to satisfy his new hunger. The people, of course, were afraid when they saw his wolf's eye, so he had the eye patch made. And all the other things that would make his future hunts easier. He dressed. He had chosen dark colors because he would ride mainly at night in the future. And he had chosen leather because he enjoyed the animal scent that the hides gave off. Downstairs in the saloon Vargas was sitting and playing cards. Yesterday, near the city limits, he had eaten two cattle drovers. Leech did not know where MacDonald was, but since Vargas' troop was not made up entirely of werewolves, he assumed that the human members had served the others more or less as emergency rations. The guy was paralyzed anyway. Leech girded his revolvers and hung the sheath of his saber on his belt. Then he put on his Stetson and left his room first through the door and then the establishment through the back entrance. When Vargas was finished playing cards, he would go hunting again. Only Vargas did not know that he himself would be the prey that night. Leech entered the attached barn. The boy, who took care of the animals, brought his horse to him after he was done with it, looking at the eye patch in amazement. Vargas didn't hunt in the city itself, he was too smart for that, at least most of the time, and Leech had his usual routes and hiding places already scouted out. He sat up. His stomach growled, and he enjoyed the pulling in his bowels. He sucked the night air deep into his lungs, looked up to the moon, then he trotted off. Soon he had crossed the city limits and put the eye patch in his forehead. Now it was no longer dark for him, everything was open and bright in front of him. Leech waited and feasted on what his sharpened senses showed him. He saw smaller creatures scurrying away from him, watched a large owl beat a rat, and then he saw Vargas riding on him, on a candle-straight path out of the city. He dismounted, gave his horse a slap. He only did this out of habit, because he had found out that he could also transmit his commands to the animals by thinking them in a certain way. He improved. He no longer ordered his horse, he visualized his wishes. The brave and at the same time good-natured soul of the animal understood what he wanted from her, and the animal trotted away and stopped again about one hundred steps away to wait for him. Vargas had now come much closer, and Leech was sure that he had already discovered him with his predatory mind. However, he assumed that the werewolf did not recognize his scent signature. He was a different man now. Leech built himself up, put both hands on his revolvers and looked toward him. After ten seconds Leech could recognize Vargas' face. He cocked the cocks of his weapons and pulled. Vargas had often seen this gesture, this challenge, and he knew only one way to respond to it. 
the werewolf began his transformation and at the same time drove his horse to gallop. They raced with murderous speed directly towards Leech. The wolf man and his vicious nag, they would trample him into the dust if he did nothing about it. The earth vibrated under the heavy horse's hooves as Leech raised his arms and began to fire with both weapons. All but one bullet hit its target. Vargas was thrown out of the saddle, his upper body and wolf's head a bloody mass, then the riderless horse collapsed in full swing, rolled over and came to rest less than a meter from Leech's boot tips. It was still alive, and Leech ended his torment with his saber. Through the cloud of dust, he circled the dead animal and walked over to Vargas, who was lying on his back fifteen feet further on. The wounded werewolf had sat up halfway, supported on his elbows, and stared into Leech's face with eyes widened in anger and fear. You? Leech just nodded and made Vargas watch as he put the revolver back into the holster in his left hand and then, with a waving movement of his right hand, unfolded the other man's drum. As the cartridge cases fell to the ground, Leech watched as the wounds in the werewolf's body slowly closed up again. His body slowly pressed the lead out of itself, but there was still enough time left. Leisurely, so that Vargas could follow his movements closely, he took a single silver bullet out of the sewn-on pocket of his shirt. He held it in front of the hairy face of the werewolf. No! Vargas began to squirm and crawl away from him, but Leech knelt heavily on his arched chest, which was covered with strong muscles but for the moment hopelessly shot to pieces. He heard a rib break, then he loaded the silver bullet into the revolver. Vargas stopped fidgeting when the metal of the barrel, still warm from the shooting, pressed itself against his forehead. Leech smiled cold. Today I am the hunter. Then he pulled the trigger. While the dying werewolf changed back into his human form, Leech's own horse came trotting back. Leech took some empty, thick-walled leather pouches from his saddlebags, which could be pulled together and tied at the upper end several times. He divided the corpse methodically, almost expertly, with his saber, and where he could not cut through cartilage or bone, he used a butcher's hatchet that he had acquired for this purpose. He distributed the meat to his pouches, leaving only Vargas' left forearm, until he had strapped everything to the saddle and buried the remains, together with the werewolf's head. Then he took the delicious meat, sat up and let his horse trot slowly towards the city while he chewed. He had learned a lot, and he knew that he had to learn a lot more. He was a different man now. He was Leonard Leech, the Monster Eater. Part 2 The Snake Queen Leonard Leech looked out the window on the second floor of his establishment. The wild boar was a mixture of saloon, hotel and whorehouse, and it had belonged to Leech since he had taken it from a Wendigo a year and a half ago. A lot had happened in the last five years since Alaska, and he had become somewhat tired of hunting. He pensive remembered the first time back then. He had learned a lot, suffered a lot and hunted a lot, no, very much. With Vargas meat he had been able to keep his hunger in check for almost three weeks. In the meantime he could do better. Today a full-grown werewolf took him almost twice as long. He liked hunting but it had forced him to be constantly on the move and the occasions when he had found more than one victim in the same city were extremely rare. This one was much better. The small town of Plainview was on the main westward route and there was a steady stream of adventurers, desperados and other travelers who passed by here and quite a few stopped by to sleep in a real bed for a night. At least once a week there was a beast among them beasts, that's what he called his prey for lack of a better generic term. They were werewolves, vampires, other animal men, banshees, succubi, and once it was even a demon. Until now, they had always noticed too late that he was different, had only realized the danger when he brushed his eye patch aside so that he could be sure he really had a beast in front of him. His wolf's eye not only made him see in the dark, no, it also showed him the true form of the beasts, the form that normal people could not see with their eyes. It was a kind of land of milk and honey. 
he only had to stand on the balustrade night after night and overlook the saloon. If he had a suspicion, he pushed the flap aside as if it were itching, as if casually, and convinced himself. And at night, when his slaughter cattle were snoring beer-soaked or hunting themselves, he would strike. The storage room in the basement had a secret door and behind it was his private supply of werewolf filet, vampire thighs, succubus breasts, and other beast meat. Fortunately for him, this beast meat was many times more durable than others, but he had nevertheless purchased several barrels of strong-smelling spices and left them open in his secret cellar room to conceal the smell of decay. Sometimes the multifaceted animal would visit him in his dreams, usually at full or half moon, but it didn't want anything from him, just seemed to look after him and then retreat back to wherever it belonged. In all that time he had not succeeded in getting hold of it, in forcing it into a dialogue. This being was too strange to him. On some occasions it seemed to be well disposed toward him, on others it seemed to make fun of him, and on still others it was obviously annoyed. If that was the case, he woke up the next morning with a devilish headache and was inedible for the next two days. His staff in particular had to bear the brunt of this. So this was his new life as an employer, as a restaurateur, as a pimp and bartender. After he had killed and devoured Vargas at that time, he had tried to return to the small town where he had held the office of marshal. It had not worked. He had arrived there at dawn tired from the journey and in a wretched state. The few people who had already been on the streets at that time had either not recognized him or, worse, were horrified and retreated in front of him with crosses. Not only did he look much younger now than before, no, the Indian spirit had breathed so much life into him that he felt much younger. People did not tolerate such things very well. He had no other explanation, and when he had finally understood this, he had ridden further west, like so many others, to a place where no one knew him, and had begun anew to build an existence for himself. The only contact to his old life was the gunsmith Remo Harris. Leach had already lost his brothers and the rest of his family in the Civil War. The income that his business was currently generating was largely in the hands of the gunsmith, who in return provided him with everything Leach commissioned from him and that without asking questions. Silver bullets, hardwood bullets, composite blades made of all materials known to him, which were useful for killing beasts. Remo sent all of this to him in packages tied up several times in the stagecoach. Leech had an entire arsenal of custom-made items hung on the walls of his private chambers. No, actually it could not get any better. He had everything he needed and as long as the stream of settlers and adventurers heading west did not break, he got his food free. In order not to attract attention, he sometimes ate normal food in public, but they disgusted him and did not satisfy his hunger. Not really. His new hunger burned hotter than any lust he had known until then and it was much more destructive. Once, in the early days, when he hadn't been able to find a beast for a long time, he had bitten his way through an entire small herd of cattle, including the two cowboys who had been supervising them. He had come to over and over bloodstained, his belly swollen to the bizarrest degree, and he had felt dog else. He had been somehow full, filled to the brim with flesh and blood and bones, but hunger had still been there. Fortunately, a banshee of the road had soon come to call his attention to this slaughter. But since then he has been stockpiling supplies, planning meticulously and working obsessively on his self-control. He had killed people in his delusion. Something like this was not allowed to happen to him again. Now, however, after he had become intoxicated enough with his new powers, his new youth and his new life, he needed more. It lacked the sense, the purpose beyond pure survival. As a soldier, he had fought for the ideals, or rather the economic interests, of others, as a marshal, he had hunted down criminals. Now he hunted beasts, but not for a superior goal, no matter how threadbare, but because he ate them. Simply eaten up. She had to eat. 
his current actions resembled those of an animal, he thought, a clever animal indeed, but still, something was missing. He had already written countless letters to Miskatonic University in Arkham, asking for copies of the works kept there under lock and key, and there was a reason for this. He had read everything about monsters, ghosts, exorcisms, mysticism and occultism that he had been able to acquire in a normal way, but even if some of his books had shed some light on his considerable gaps in knowledge, so many of his questions remained unanswered. Although he increased the sums he was willing to pay to cover expenses with each letter, he had not yet received a reply. He needed to learn more about this mysterious second world that had opened up to him, or better, into which he had been thrown. The university, which had a poor reputation, was known for its special focus on research into the supernatural, and the stories heard there, some of them completely absurd, had captivated him. For even if he could not comprehend everything that was reported from there, he recognized parallels to his own experiences here and there. In a way, he could not blame the superiors of the university for not wanting to have anything to do with him, for he had not omitted to mention in his letters the reasons for his interest in the occult. What if he were to conduct his own studies? Would they take him seriously, grant him access if he provided them with new material? He had never been a believer, but basically he had believed in the stories of the Bible in a thoughtless, childlike way, and now he had learned that there was a second, or at least a hidden part of creation that had found no place in the Bible. What did these beings, all the werewolves, vampires, goblins, gaul, goblins, all of them, know about their own origins? About the purpose of their existence? Granted, he had never bothered to exchange more words with one of his victims than necessary. He should change that if possible. He overlooked the goings-on among themselves. Today no beast was lost in his saloon. Maybe he should go for a walk. He wriggled his way through the drinkers, the gamblers, and the demolished day laborers, nodded to this or that, then stepped outside through the wooden swinging doors, onto the streets of Plainview. He looked around. The dusty main street was empty. This disappointed him on the one hand, but on the other hand he could be satisfied because apparently everyone who went outside after dark left his hard-earned dollars in his saloon. He made sure once more that he was really unobserved, then he pushed his eye patch aside and all shadows disappeared, all dark corners spewed their secrets at him and the pale moonlight seemed almost uncomfortably bright to him. Nothing. He was not drawn in any particular direction and so he let himself drift. A hundred meters further on, a few rats came up when they noticed his aura. It was frustrating. He lit a cigarillo, waved out the match and stared pensive up at the moon, putting one foot in front of the other. When he had poured out the cigarillo in the street dirt, Leech noticed that he had arrived at the edge of town, where a shabby, half-height picket fence separated the world of the living from the world of the dead. The Plainview Cemetery did not invite to stroll, nor to mourn devoutly. It was a pragmatic place were only a few of the graves marked with simple crosses made of wood that could not be used for anything else, received any kind of care. He was quite big for that. Leech sat over the fence. With the newer graves he could still make out a little life radiation. It was similar to a fire that burned down half a day ago and still radiated a little dying heat. Sometimes he observed a few poor wretches who were trying to be grave robbers and was amused by the superstitious fear with which they went about their business. No one was here that night. Leech continued on his way and left one row of graves after another behind him. Soon the small chapel came in sight. It was just as purposeful and crude as the rest of the complex built of roughly hewn boards and beams and was neither particularly dignified nor sacred. Leech could hear the crunching and creaking of the bell rope that swung back and forth in the cool night wind. He was just about to light a new cigarillo and then continue his way to the chapel when he noticed something it was to the east of the chapel, at the edge of his field of vision. He turned his head to see it more clearly. A human aura. 
he stared for a few more seconds to see if any other auras would join him, but when that didn't happen and he could be reasonably sure he was dealing with only one living being, he corrected his course and slowly stepped towards the unexpected change. Halfway along the way he could sense that something was wrong with the aura. She seemed to be getting weaker and had not moved once in all that time. When he had again cut the remaining distance in half, Leech could see that the injured or better, the dying man was a man, and immediately afterwards he noticed what he should have noticed immediately. The man was completely in the dark. No lamp, no torch, no candle behind glass. Either he had been left here by people with lamps, torches, or candles, or he had gotten here before sunset and simply stayed in place. When Leonard Leach had come far enough, he could see that it was a black man. Since the South lost the Civil War, many former slaves and clan groups moved through the country and tried to find a place where they could wring their own little bit of luck from the country. Most of them, however, were still doing exactly the same as they had done before the war. They worked themselves to death for the whites. Leech had not yet seen this man in the city and he had not yet noticed Leech either. Instead, he stared at the sky with eyes wide open, breathing irregularly, and his mouth formed weak, soundless words whose meaning Leech could not decipher. The black man was somewhere in his forties and he was bleeding from several frayed cuts, which were distributed over the entire upper body, but mainly over the chest and arms. This had either been a very rusty and very dull knife or the claws of a beast. Angry nagging greeted Leech from the other side of the front door to Dr. Jenkins' house, then the door flew open and Jenkins interrupted his ranting immediately when he saw what Leech was bringing him. One minute later, the black man was lying on the uncomfortable-looking treatment table. The doctor cut the tattered shirt off his bulky torso and his wife Martha lit the fire to boil water. Leech, who had hidden his wolf's eye behind his eye patch again, told how he had found the man and ignored Jenky's look, which clearly asked what the hell Leech had been doing in the graveyard in the middle of the night. When Jenkins had washed away the already partially encrusted, blood so that one could take a closer look at the wounds, the conversation died down. Jenkins, who had paused and frowned repeatedly during the washing process, looked over at Leech. Ever seen anything like it? No, Leech lied. The injured man, who had already passed out completely while Leech carried him here, fluttered his eyelids as Jenkins drilled his index finger into a particularly ugly-looking wound. None of the wounds are particularly deep, except this one. If he is lucky, the kidney will recover. Provided he lives long enough. He's lost a lot of blood. Leech just nodded. He had already noticed that. You should inform the sheriff, Mr. Leech. Whoever did this is a fucking monster. Leech pretended to think for a moment. The sheriff was a terrible busybody and had his hands deep in the pockets of the local landowners, especially those of Reginald Burns. That can wait till tomorrow, document. First of all, the poor pig has to stay alive. Jenkins agreed. After suturing the more superficial wounds, Jenkins spread a blanket over his patient and tried to compliment Leech. Leech crushed this attempt by putting a few dollars next to the stove for his troubles, arguing that it was only right and proper that it be him who stood guard over the injured man. After all, it was he who had found him. Jenkins first wanted to object, then he looked at the banknotes and decided that the saloon operator was right. Even a doctor, who was usually only paid with food or services anyway, had to see how he got along. Jenkins followed his wife, who had already retired when the water began to boil. Two hours later, Leech was sure that they were asleep. He got up from the uncomfortable chair on which he had been waiting and approached the treatment table. The black man's eyes rolled under his eyelids, but his breath seemed to have become calmer. The monster eater exposed his wolf's eye. The man's aura had stabilized, but was still weak. Most of the life force was lost from the wound above the kidney. She wobbled heavily and sluggishly out of it, rose one meter and entered again, 
into the eternal cycle. Just like the smoke that is produced when you burn damp wood. He put his right hand on the wound. He was not allowed to overdo it, it would be a mystery to the doctor. Leech closed his eyes, and for a second or two nothing happened, but then he could feel the green heat coming from his hand and crawling into the wound. Leech left his hand in place for ten more seconds, then he stepped back and checked his work. No more life would escape from this wound. He wiped the beads of sweat from his forehead. The gaping rift still existed, but it could no longer be described as deep. The doc would be surprised, but not enough to develop real suspicion. Leonard Leach woke the unfortunate man. The following night he was back at the cemetery and kept a lookout. The man had regained consciousness for a short time and was still lying with Dr. Jenkins. He was already feeling a little better. Leech had found out about this when he stopped by on his way to the cemetery. Tomorrow the injured man would move into Leech's hotel and pay for his stay by answering questions. His name was Samuel, and contrary to Leech's original assumption, he was not a freed or escaped slave, but had arrived in America as a servant of a British businessman after the end of the war and soon became self-employed. Leech hadn't bothered to memorize every stop on the man's path but he had been working as an aide at Iron Tree Ranch last. At some point he had had enough of the drudgery and had marched off with his mule and arrived at the edge of Plainview yesterday. So far, so good. What was stupid was that he had hardly any useful memories of what had happened to him. But one thing was certain. He had reached the cemetery completely unharmed in the early evening hours of yesterday's day so the injuries must have been inflicted there and that's why Leech was here tonight in front of the chapel. For this reason and to look around for the man's mule. Perhaps the animal had fled when the attack on the man had taken place, but perhaps there was another, more unpleasant explanation for the fact that he had found no indication anywhere of the whereabouts of the cattle. When Leech arrived at the place east of the chapel where he found the injured man, he subjected the immediate surroundings to a meticulous examination. There was no trace of a mule to be found, and the fight in the course of which Samuel had sustained his injuries could not be reconstructed from the footprints, as the ground was simply too dry. But instead, the monster eater was stung by some blood traces, already dried and partly covered by the omnipresent dust, into his wolf's eye. Leech began to follow the trail, and in his mind's eye the events that had led to Samuel's injuries soon became apparent. The tracks led him in a chaotic zigzag through the rows of graves. It was definitely an escape, in the course of which the number of Samuel's injuries had steadily increased, and Leech reconstructed them backwards, which meant that the frequency with which he encountered traces of blood was steadily decreasing. At some points, Samuel seemed to have stopped and then suddenly changed direction, which strangely explained the fact that most of the terrible wounds were on the man's chest and arms, not on his back as one would expect. Samuel had been repeatedly cut off. Leonard Leach paused and looked at the local events. Whatever was responsible for the attack, it had to be incredibly fast in order to appear again and again directly in front of the fleeing person. He continued his search for clues, and after two more stops the trail of blood dried up. Consequently, where Leech was now, the first attack must have taken place. It slowly turned on its own axis. He was a little less than ten meters from the back of the chapel and a few steps to his right was a fresh grave, next to which, in wise foresight, two more pits had already been dug. He took a long look at the grave, then at the empty graves next to it. No, no ghoul or any other creature that fed on the dead had been here. He turned away. When he had circled halfway around the chapel, he clipped. The wooden wing door was open on one side by a gap. Leech drew his revolver and crept up. Shortly before he opened the open door wing completely with his foot, he cocked the cocks of the weapons with a click. His hunter's gaze revealed to him what the darkness was trying to hide. The chapel was empty. Empty, except for a mule and Reverend Starling. Both were dead. 
the mule had made it to just before the altar, the body of the reverend had been bound with his own intestines to the simple wooden cross that dominated the chapel. Leech's boot heels hit the wooden floorboards hard as he walked towards the morbid still life. The closer he came, the stronger the stench became. With every step his wolf's eyes searched the chapel for possible dangers and although he couldn't see a trace, not a breath of life, he felt observed. That was new. At first he left the mule unnoticed and devoted himself to the reverend. Leech had never liked the man, but what he had obviously had to suffer neither he nor anyone else deserved it. If Samuel had already been badly beaten up, Starling had been ten times worse. The cuts all over the body, however, left no doubt that the reverend had been killed by the same assailant who must have been responsible for Samuel's injuries. They ran crisscross over the body that had collapsed in death and was robbed of its intestines, just as malignant and frayed as the wounds of the black man were. The eyes of Reverend Starling were wide open and directed against the ceiling, the jaws were wide open and the balding head was skinned by the cuts in many places down to the skull bone. Leonard Leach was about to turn to the mule when the Reverend's body moved. Under the dead skin it began to bubble and all over the body the cuts pulsed. The members of the priest seemed to develop a life of their own and wanted to escape their fetters. Leech fired two bullets from each weapon and one ironwood and one silver bullet each hit the chest and skull. The force with which the bullets hit their target and which drove them through the undead body completely loosened the arms from the intestinal loops and with an indescribably disgusting sound the body fell to the ground. Leech could hear how one of the maltreated legs broke. The monster eater had rushed a few steps backwards to put distance between himself and his target and now stared over his weapons at the bizarre spectacle. It was still seething inside the body, but Leech was disappointed. The dead priest had landed face down on the mule carcass, and Leech had expected that the dead man, controlled by unnatural forces, would stand up and attack, but this did not happen. Only this pulsation and the premonition of being observed. He waited a few seconds, and when still nothing happened and the pulsation just wouldn't ebb, he cautiously stepped closer again. Just as he touched the corpse with the tip of his boot and was about to turn it on its back, they swelled out. From the wounds of the priest and from those of the mule. A flood of writhing bodies, a choir of high, pointed screams. It had to be over one hundred of the small, snake-like creatures that moved towards him surprisingly fast. Before Leech could react, a handful had already reached him, they wriggled up along his legs and began to bite the coarse fabric of his pants with tiny, razor-sharp teeth to eat their way into him. He fired reflexively. His bullets tore the ball apart, tore some of the creatures to shreds and finally hit the bodies of the mule and the priest. A good dozen of the snakes had lost their lives in his shots but that was only due to the fact that they had been so close together in the beginning. The second the first of his bullets had torn one of the creatures apart, a bloodcurdling, animalistic cry of rage was heard. Leech ignored the painful bites of the snake's brood and tore his head upwards, towards the origin of the scream. She floated down from the ceiling, her naked, body-pale body covered with boils and ulcers, but he recognized her nevertheless. The one who came screaming in clawed fingers was Reverend Starling's housekeeper, Mary Barker. Or at least she used to be. Her incisors were needle-sharp, and where her hair had once been, now countless snakes grew from her skull, snapping in his direction. A Gorgonian. The monster eater made a jump backwards and the medusa landed exactly where it had been a split second before. She sent her rage and hatred towards him in a telepathic blow that made him stagger back a few more steps. She jumped at him as he dropped his empty revolvers and drew his cavalry saber. Just in time he managed to get the steel between himself and the attacking beast and to parry a huge claw blow with the flat blade. For a few seconds he faced the beast, whose body seemed to grow to twice its size as it assessed him from its snake eyes, breathing heavily. Then the fight began. 
Leech almost completely forgot the offspring of the beast that ate into his legs while he was busy escaping the powerful blows. Medusa drove him through the whole chapel and where her blows missed him, they shattered wooden benches, tore deep furrows in the floor planks and more than once they tore their own brood, which Leech had also begun to chase, causing the beast's hatred for the intruder to grow immeasurably. Leech watched in horror as the few cuts he had been able to make to the monster quickly closed again. The saber was useless, his revolvers lay empty on the floor of the chapel he had to leave here, back to his hotel, where he kept the rest of his weapons, if he wanted to have even the slightest chance. He stumbled backwards, continuing to try to escape the blows with ever more destructive force, while at the same time maneuvering himself toward the door. Just as another of his useless counterattacks had led and thought he had a second to turn his head so he could see how far away he was from the door, the Medusa's claws caught him on the side of his upper arm. The four parallel cuts let his blood flow instantly, his saber slipped away from him and remained clattering on the floor. The beast hissed to jump, threw him down and nailed him to the ground with its claws. The horny claws penetrated his flesh, deeper and deeper, and while the Medusa obscenely rubbed her abdomen against his body and seemed to secrete poison and acid even there, the serpentine mouths that sprang from her head bit Leech's face in two. The disgust and agony of the monster eater mingled with indescribable pain, while his fists hammered helplessly on the sides and back of Medusa. He felt infinite pain, felt snake venom dripping into his tissues and began to decompose him from within. And when he realized that the brood of Medusa now also reached him and began to gnaw at him, he only wanted it to be over in death to finally come to him as well. He did not want to reach into the depths of his soul to find the healing powers that were waiting for him somewhere there. With this he would only prolong his suffering and prolong the torturous embrace of the beast to infinity, only to finally succumb to the monstrous forces. He fell deep and deeper and deeper into the blackness, surrendered to the beastly, malicious lust of the being until he saw a light in the infinity of his spirit. A faint light, but it became brighter and brighter and with every new wound that was torn into his body it came a little bit closer. And then he realized that it was a panicky thought of caring. Care. His care for the black man. He had healed one of his wounds. One of many wounds and in each of these wounds slept a deadly danger, slept a snake. A danger for Samuel, a danger for the doc and his wife, and a danger that might eventually wipe out all of Plainview. They would hatch. When these thoughts had manifested themselves and he had understood their scope, two other lights appeared in the darkness. One glowed green, pure and friendly, the other red, evil, and as animalistic as the ghost of the gorgon beast that was feeding on him. It superimposed his pain and brought back his anger. When Leonard Leach was himself again, he felt sick. In his stomach was almost the entire brood of the Gorgonian and some of their... Well... Hair. He could feel that some were still moving and were decomposed by his stomach acid while still alive. A grim smile played around his tattered, bloody mouth during this performance. He dragged himself over to his saber and picked it up. Then he killed the rest of the brood of snakes and looked around. The Medusa was no longer here, he could no longer feel her presence. When he had torn the first hair from her head and devoured it, she had learned, perhaps for the first time in her existence, what fear means. He hadn't been able to kill her. He had waited too long for that before he had called the Fury, and had been too weak already, but after he had taken some more hairs from her and had bitten one of her decaying breasts, she had taken flight and left her brood behind. Leech looked down on himself. There was not much left of him, and now, with every second that passed and the malignant burst of energy that his anger had given him ebbed away, the pain came back. He sat down on one of the few benches of the chapel that had survived the battle and closed his eyes. He searched for the green glow. For some terrible seconds he could not find it. Then he realized that he first had to push the red glow aside. He did so, and finally his hands surrounded the pure green, drew strength from it, 
and then he enlarged the radius of the billowing light until it completely enveloped him. First, the poison was squeezed out of his body. Pus colored from the countless wounds that littered his body, the pain made his muscles cramp and a scream came out of his throat. But then the cuts and bites began to heal from the inside out, the maltreated tissue closed up and Leech could feel how the healing process consumed the monster meat in his bloated stomach. When he stepped out into the dawning morning, he was outwardly apart from his clothes like born again, but inwardly the burden of his failure pressed him down. He had waited too long, taken too long to save the people of Plainview from danger. His hesitation had cost lives. The ignorance of his own abilities and his obtuseness had led to the fact that Samuel had probably been consumed and killed by the Medusa brood in the meantime. Leech hoped that the doc and his wife had somehow managed to escape. He began to run. Leonard Leech was standing next to the couch on which the body of Samuel was found. The wounds had burst open again and there was no sign of the snake brood. Leech found the bodies of Dr. Jenkins and his wife in the marriage bed. No doubt it had been the Gorgon. The small snakes could never have inflicted such wounds. She had fetched her brood and had disappeared again. Martha Jenkins' head had been severed in half and her rib cage had been torn apart at the solar plexus, so that her breasts, which could be seen through the tattered fabric of her nightgown, pointed towards the mattress. The doc hardly looked better. One of his eyes was missing, the other dangled down a nerve cord on his slashed cheek. The monster eater laid the dead on the floor in the middle of the treatment room and poured lamp oil over them. He stood still for a minute and memorized the disfigured faces. Finally he tore a match, threw it into the pool and left the house. Even if the residents of Plainview were soon to delete the doctor's house, they would never know how these people had really died. From a window of his hotel facing the main street, he later observed the united efforts. In the end it was a partial success. The house burned down, but the fire did not spread to neighboring buildings. Good. In the meantime Leech had put on new clothes. He was sure that no one had seen in what condition he had arrived here. At least that was what he had achieved he thought to himself as he loaded his revolvers. The writing of letters to the Miskatonic had not been fruitful. Very well, then he had to go there himself. He would not be refused. Too much depended on him learning what there was to learn about the world of monsters. Too many lives. But before he could begin his journey, he would hunt down the cursed Gorgon. That morning, Leech had neither the strength nor the presence of mind or the ability to burn down the chapel as well without being discovered in the light of the rising sun. Of course the mule and the reverend had been found. The same day that Dr. Jenkins' house was burned down. The unsuspecting sheriff had the brains to connect the two incidents. But when he could not make sense of the strange wounds of the corpses in the chapel, his explanation was that it must have been the third man, the unknown man whose body, burned beyond recognition, had been found in the doctor's house. Case closed. That the reverend's housekeeper had also disappeared did not strike him until much later, and he assumed that she had simply left the city and looked for a new job in another place. Leech, on the other hand, had searched the reverend's house and especially the small room the woman had occupied, but found no clues that could explain the snake woman's whereabouts or even her condition, her birth as a being of the other side. For two weeks he had waited at night in the chapel for the beast, the Winchester on its knees, but it had not come back. It took Leech another week to come to terms with the fact that the Gorgon had left the area, presumably to raise its brood and grow some hairs. At some point he had resigned and started to prepare his departure to the East Coast. He had hired a capable man as managing director, who would take up his duties next month and organize a party for the first Sunday of that month that would mark the turning point in his dazzling career as a hotelier, pimp and casino operator. He had no money worries. He had large reserves and his establishment would continue to make good profits. In the first night's nightmares had haunted him. 
In the meantime they came only every third or fourth night. The grimace of the gorgon, who snapped at him with her thousand mouths, rubbing her sex against him in a greedy perversion of an act of love, his own guilty excitement, the crucified reverend, the mule, Dr. Jenkins, they all whirled around him, screamed at him, and then, at the end, just before he awoke, he looked down on himself as he sank his teeth into the monster flesh, greedily devouring the Medusa's brood. Then he woke up and he was sick. He thought he had gotten used to his new nature, had seen it as a gift and had let off steam like a greedy, insatiable child, and slowly but surely he began to see it as a responsibility. He was determined not to use his guilty conscience as an excuse for inaction and self-righteous lamentation. No, he told himself, he was allowed to make mistakes, but only as long as he learned from them, after all, in the time concepts of his new world he was just an infant. Well, but he still had to eat, and after his fight in the chapel and the subsequent healing of his wounds had nearly exhausted all his reserves, his supplies had shrunk considerably during the weeks of his Gorgonian watch. Thoughtfully, as he did every evening, he stepped onto the balustrade and looked down on the gamblers, the drunks, the show-offs and the workers who spent their money with him night after night. The two werewolves, who had just entered the saloon, stopped and looked around, came to him as if they were called. He had already noticed them with his normal eye, but when he pushed the eye patch aside for a split second to be fully convinced, a hungry smile came over his face. They had been tanned by the merciless sun and it was obvious that they had traveled far and were used to carrying weapons. He could tell from their unshaven faces that they were killers. Presumably, like himself, they had fought in the war on one of the two sides. A battlefield had to be the purest paradise for beasts, and he was sure that he, too, would have made use of his opportunities if his new life had not found its way to him only after the defeat of the South. They both carried revolvers and knives on their belts and their luggage in sacks and bags over their shoulders. That was perfect. Those who carried their luggage in here didn't just want quick pleasure, they wanted to spend the night here. For such guests he had arranged a special room, one that made hunting extremely easy for him. Leech was just about to go downstairs to offer it to them when the two wolves stared at each other and then actually lifted their noses in the midst of people, scenting each other and fleeing the saloon. It hit Leech like a punch in the stomach. He had never been scented before, not as a hunter, not as a monster eater. Had anything changed in him? Could they all smell him now? This would make his hunting almost impossible, and just as he saw himself crawling across the prairie, half mad with hunger, the gorgon entered his saloon. She dragged one of the werewolves behind her. He was dead. As Leech drew his revolvers and the first saloon guests flinched from the naked monster with their mouths open in surprise and horror, he could see that the snake hairs he had bitten off had actually grown back. They were not yet as long as the others, but they hissed just as viciously. One of his whores was the first to scream and the first to die. A claw blow from below slid her open from the pubic bone to the ribcage, the intestines spilling out and the bleeding once beautiful body falling over to the front. Now everyone began to scream in panic and fear, and a handful of the men even reacted with anger to the terrible threat they faced. Two of them drew their weapons and fired. One of his girls dragged two others with her towards the stairs. Safe to get to the top and lock yourself in one of the rooms. One of the men, in his fear, fired all six rounds of his colt past the gorgon. One of the bullets killed Mike, Leech's best bartender. The others hit the big mirror and the liquor bottles. Glass splinters flew around and about a third of the guests had managed to escape the horror that was about to come. The second shooter aimed a little better. He hit the gorgon twice in the thigh, but the wounds closed again in seconds. Leech wanted to prevent what was coming and fired both weapons at the beast but even the hail of silver and wooden bullets could not stop the gorgon from literally ripping the head off the man's shoulders. She threw him at the shooter who had killed Mike. The litter hit him in the solar plexus and he went down struggling for air. 
As Leech reloaded his weapons in no time, he saw the panicked man desperately trying to find shelter under one of the tables. There was no longer any victim in the immediate vicinity of the monster, which now built itself up in the middle of the saloon and stared up at Leech on the balustrade. If this was at all possible, the Gorgon became even bigger and bulkier, although it had hardly fitted through the swinging doors of the saloon before. She now raised her right claw, the one with which she had killed the werewolf, hissed and pointed to Leech. Next to him, the three girls had reached the top of the stairs and ran past him through the door. Occasionally guests still fled the saloon in the back of the gorgon and screamed for help outside. Leech let the drums of the revolvers snap back in. The bullets had done nothing against the full-grown beast, but now that he knew that, he knew what he had to do. In the past weeks he had explored the red glow of his soul. Now he no longer had to absorb it completely, no longer let it break out, like in the chapel. He no longer had to become a beast himself to use it. No, he was able to channel a tiny portion of it into his weapons, just enough for the silver and ironwood bullets to penetrate the monster's flesh and cause permanent damage. At least he hoped so. Its red made the weapons glow eerily. The Gorgon saw it, took a few steps back while looking up at him. You won't flee from me, Leech yelled down with all his lungs. But the beast hadn't intended to do that at all. She took a run up. Leech fired a shot from each of his weapons. The silver bullet separated a toe from the creature's foot, the wooden bullet missed the Gorgon and punched a hole in the softer wood of the floorboards. The snake creature was not in the least impressed by the loss of her toe and jumped. While the gigantic body with outstretched claws flew towards Leech, he fired four more times. Three bullets penetrated the gigantic chest, piercing fatty tissue, ribs, and organs. The fourth bullet perforated the wrist and made the hand useless to the beast. The monster eater saw the beast flying towards him, involuntarily took a quick step back, then the wall behind him stopped him. He emptied his revolvers. Finally, a wooden bullet shattered the right zygomatic bone, a silver one entered the eye just above it, one went wrong and the last bullet hit the middle of the forehead. The creature's obscene body went limp in flight, bouncing against the balustrade railing, which instantly gave way and splintered off in Leech's direction. For a second, the dead monster was stuck at Leech's feet, then it fell with a tremendous roar onto the tables below. Leech stepped forward, reached the splintered wood and looked down. Yes, the gorgon was dead. At last. After a while of horrified silence, restlessness arose among the remaining guests and Leech tore his gaze away from the gorgon. The sheriff and two of his deputies had come in with their guns drawn, and when Leech noticed them taking in the devastation, the dead, and the monstrosity at his feet, only to stare at him spellbound afterwards, he realized that they were all actually staring at him. Him and not the dead Gorgon. They did not seem relieved that he had killed the Gorgon. No, they seemed scared. Before him. Only when the sheriff was the first to point his gun at him and yell at him did the monster eater realize that his own revolvers were still shrouded in an eerie red light. A thought shot into his brain. Salem. The witch trials. He had to get out of here. Epilogue. They had stormed his hotel and hunted him down, but he had managed to escape the mob for the time being without having to kill any of them even though it had been quite close on several occasions. How could they understand what he was? He had not even come close to understanding it himself. In Arkham, he hoped they would help him. However, the chase that was made at him had driven him in the wrong direction. It would take quite a while before he would arrive at the East Coast but he was in good spirits when he sat in the stagecoach and examined his fellow passengers who were just getting on. As they slept, he carefully pushed the eye patch up. He had been right. They were all blood drinkers. So food was provided. Part 3 A Man of God Come on, faster. 
Reginald Burns gave his horse the spurs, just as he had done far too often in recent days, and sat at the head of his seven-man troop. It's about time we finally got that son of a bitch, he shouted. Riding right behind him were Father Sinclair and young William Hoffa, a half-breed who had been all too eager to leave Plainview for an adventure. The other four were Edmund Jones, Daryl Davids, Joe Turner, and Miles Abbott. The men had survived the Civil War together and now earned their living as cowboys on Burns' land, and, when the opportunity arose, as bouncers or, as now, as henchmen on more daring ventures. Come on, come on. The veterans changed meaningful looks. They knew that the horses would not make it much longer. Not that this fact in itself played a big role, because Burns would simply buy them new ones if they were ridden here. The only problem was that when the time came, they'd better be somewhere where they could be. Not here, in the middle of the prairie. The half-breed knew this too, but in the last days he had learned that his word did not count for much in this group. Turner nodded towards the priest riding in front of him and the other three followed his gaze. Father Sinclair now also drove his horse and caught up with Burns. Burns! Wiping the impure from the earth requires patience. Patience and a strong faith, but horses do not believe. They need rest and water. We are in the middle of nowhere here. If the critters collapse beneath us and we have to continue on foot, we will lose the trail in the end. Oh, the naggers will get it right. I want to drag that bastard back to Plainview and nail his hands to the door of City Hall. He has brought death to my city. To my city, Sinclair. Yes, he did, he probably did. But be reasonable, Burns. Why did they telegraph for me if you won't listen to me now? I have telegraphed for you to help me hunt down the cutthroat, not to hinder me. I need your knowledge and the power of your blessing, not your nagging. You know what we found in the saloon? Oh, what am I asking? You have seen it for yourself. Sinclair, he ate her. Eaten, cured, pickled, and eaten. There. Over there. Burns headed for a burnt-down wildfire on her right and the whole squad swung in and finally came to a halt surrounded by a cloud of dust. Injun, go see if you can find any tracks. William Hoffa's angry look bored into Burns' back, but only for a fraction of a second. Then he did what his employer had told him to do. The thing was just this, he had grown up in plain view and could read tracks about as well as a blind mule. But he kept that to himself, especially since Burns did not recognize the truth anyway. To him, he was red, which, in addition to being a lower life form, automatically made him an accomplished scout hunter and trapper. Well then, let Burns get what he wanted. Hoffa did his usual show, got off his horse and examined the area around the abandoned fireplace. The other men watched him with reasonable interest, only Burns had averted his gaze and searched the horizon. Nothing special, just the usual tracks. For horses as draft animals and one running after them on a leash. We can see that for ourselves. Nag Turner. That's all there is to S.E. What's up, Injun? Burns now turned back to him. There, in the campfire. It's an arm. Father Sinclair now also dismounted and walked closer. In fact, bones lay half covered by the ashes of the fire. Upper and lower arm had been gnawed off and torn apart. A large, half-burned hand was attached to the forearm. The clergyman knelt down beside the half-breed and pulled the leftovers from the ashes. Hands don't seem to taste this devil, he murmured, looked at the gruesome find a little closer, finally dropped it and stood up again while wiping his hands on his dirty, formerly black coat. The ashes aren't quite cold yet, Mr. Burns. We are close. If we... Well, let's go. Mount. We shouldn't keep Leech waiting. Yes, Burns, we should. Not only because of the horses. 
the creature we hunt can see at night how all the horrible creatures that walk the earth with the blessings of Satan. Then it is better to catch him in daylight, do you think, priest? Father Sinclair nodded. Conflicting feelings were evident in Byrne's face. So be it, but we will not stay here. We follow the tracks until we find a good campground and leave at sunrise. Let's go. He gave his horse the spurs once more and the six others followed him. The two blood drinkers, who were still alive, had been hungry. Leech had tied them to the large rear wheel of the sloppy black-painted Concord carriage with ropes around their necks allowing them some freedom of movement, their hands and feet tied together with some play, and watched from the other side of the campfire as they laboriously and greedily tried to rip open the fresh coyote he had thrown at them with their teeth to get at its blood. He had killed their leader the very first night and eaten the best pieces in front of everyone. An example that had had only one purpose the one to clarify who was in charge from now on. The coachman, who had not been a blood drinker and did not know how happy he could be about Leech's appearance, he had previously chased away at gunpoint. Well, Wolf Sai, you enjoy that, don't you? To humiliate us with a coyote? The dress of the blood drinker was torn in several places, a result of her numerous escape attempts. Her male counterpart had more quickly adjusted to his fate and did not even raise his eyes when Leech replied. You will get no more human blood, ever again. You are now at the other end of the food chain. Out here on the prairie, Leech didn't bother to use his eye patch and hide his wolf's eye. While he threw a few dry twigs into the fire, he added. You better hold back with remarks, otherwise your friend will drink your coyote empty. That worked. The woman's head flew around with blowing hair to her conspecific, the fangs grew in seconds, and when they began to fight over the coyote's carcass, their auras turned deep red. Leech watched them with an expressionless face, but his thoughts were in another place. In Arkham, at the Miskatonic University he had crossed the country with his food in the carriage, avoided settlements and encounters as best he could had made hooks, laid false tracks and accepted long detours to conceal his true goal. The Gorgon in plain view. A disaster. The first pursuers who had been after him in the saloon immediately after the shooting had left unprepared. He could easily get rid of them, but in the meantime his secret storerooms had certainly been found. His weapons. His food leftovers. By now, his profile would probably be on every bulletin board and every sheriff's post and cavalry fort between New England and Mexico. Under these circumstances, how could he ever get a foothold in Arkham? With his eye patch and everything, he was easy to recognize and hard to miss. He would have to come up with something, because one thing was crystal clear, here in the prairie, or in the forests of Alaska, or in the deserts of Nevada he would not get any answers. He looked up. On the other side of the small fire the squabbling over the coyote had developed into a real fight. The male blood drinker, his face full of animal blood and distorted with greed, knelt on the woman's chest and tried to put his claw-like hands around her neck. Leech thought for two seconds, then he shot him in the head. During his time as saloon owner in Plainview, he had sometimes lived almost ascetically, he pondered as he removed the empty ironwood cartridge from the drum and replaced it with a full one. He had tested how he could get along for as long as possible with as little of his special food as possible, and had also rejuvenated him during his transformation and filled him with undreamt of energies, so he had aged a little during this time. What if he overeats himself, keeps himself permanently full, no, oversatiated? Would his appearance change so much that he would no longer have anything in common with the man on the wanted posters, apart from the eye patch? He walked around the fire and pushed the body of the blood drinker with the boot down from the body of his conspecific. Longer than he actually wanted, he looked down on her blood-stained body. Take his things, he finally said, your dress is nothing but rags. Surely you're not afraid of my flesh? 
He heard the lurking, false invitation in her words and replied. Get his things, I said. You are food, nothing else. He loosened her bonds and watched at gunpoint as the defiance in her gaze finally broke and she obeyed, watched as she stripped off her dress and began to laboriously put on the trousers and shirt of her dead companion. Why don't you kill me now? Like Marx and Lamont? Good question, Leech thought, but he didn't give her an answer. Instead, he renewed her shackles and then he began to eat. Maybe because you just gave them names? Maybe because I learned a lot about you during my time in the carriage? For example, that Marx and Lamont only transformed you to keep them company at night? Maybe because I want to learn? From you and about you? Perhaps. Then, when he felt how the flesh of the blood drinker fired up his powers more and more, he thought nothing more. The cross, which hung on a chain on Father Sinclair's chest, sparkled in the early morning sun. It also sparkled in the eyes of Reginald Burns. Mount. Go, go. Today we're gonna get that son of a bitch in his damn coach. They rode all morning and Burns never tired of cheering his troop on and stopping to hurry. They willingly let themselves be infected by his fanaticism. Long enough they had been after this leech, the beast of Plainview. Now was the time. It's time to kill the prey and collect the promised reward. After a good hour of dusty riding, the seven men came across the next campfire. There, he did it again. And this time it is a whole corpse, not just individual bones. Father Sinclair pointed with outstretched arm and pale face to the remains of Leech's meal. The half-blood descended and went nearer. This time he even ate his hands and feet. There's almost nothing left except the bones. Bite marks everywhere. Reginald Burns also swung out of the saddle. He knelt down and examined the skull of the blood drinker. The skin and facial muscles were missing and the lower jaw dangled down on one side. Shot, then the skull crushed and gnawed off or the other way around, he noted, the brain is also missing. The four former soldiers, watching their leader and the half-breed, cast restless glances at each other and whispered together. What is that in the ashes? Looks like a dress. So he had a woman with him. Or he still has it, but without the dress. Dream on. When they were all back in the saddle, Sinclair turned his horse and turned to the men, while Reginald Burns watched him with skeptical looks. The horse danced nervously as he began to speak. You have all seen more than once what this beast does. I know that most of you are not here to execute God's will, but to be paid, and you will be. Yet that is exactly what we do we carry out the will of God and will wipe this evil from the face of the earth once and for all. Hallelujah. Father Sinclair's eyes shone feverishly as he added, Follow me, and dashed forward. Another hour later, they had stopped on a gently rolling hilltop, which was not really high but still gave them a good view of the otherwise flat landscape, they saw the carriage. That's about five miles, I guess. More like four, half-breed, don't you have eyes in your head? Did he see us? Doesn't matter, we are definitely faster. Two of you boys stay with me, the others ride with Father Sinclair and the Redskin. We'll take him from two sides. Take no chances. If you can place a shot, do it. Leonard Leach heard them before he saw them. The distant thunder of the hooves tore him from his thoughts and he got up from the coach box without letting go of the reins. An old, superfluous habit, because he actually didn't need it anymore to tell the horses what to do. Now he searched the horizon. From the south, Three riders approached at full gallop, and from the northwest, four approached at high speed. His wolf side groped for auras. People. He didn't know whether this should calm him down or worry him, but he knew that he didn't want to waste his ironwood and silver bullets on them. He had taken their weapons from the blood drinkers and stowed them under the seat, a fact that now suited him very well. 
He gave the horses orders in his mind to head for the eastern ridge, and as quickly as possible, planted images of fire and death in their heads, and the carriage accelerated to a breakneck speed while he checked the weapons. What's going on up there? Why do we drive so fast? Are they Indians? The voice of the blood drinker came from inside the carriage. No, they're suicides. They're coming for you, Wolf's Eye. Now you are at the wrong end of the food chain. She laughed rough. I am quite inedible. Now shut up. If you give me a gun, maybe I can help you. By shooting me in the back? No, thank you very much. Leech stuck two revolvers loaded with normal cartridges in his belt next to his Smith & Wessons, loaded one Winchester and got a second one ready. Come on, Wolf Sigh, if they're shooting, I'm in the same danger as you are. At least give me a chance. Lie down on the floor and keep quiet, this is your chance. You tied me to the bench, remember? Really? Too bad. One more minute and they'll be here. The group of three, approaching from his right side, would be considered to come into range first. Leech squint his eyes together to look at them more closely. Was that possible? That Reginald Burns had followed him from plain view to here? Something about the aura of the front rider reminded him of Burns, certain opacities that Leech had always associated with his greed for money and power. On the other side the group of four. On the chest of the rider at the top something flashed, he seemed to wear some kind of amulet. The rifle the man held in his left hand was also different from the shotguns of his companions. It seemed to be somewhat larger and had two barrels arranged one above the other. A shot cracked, a bullet whistled past Leech from the right and he tore his head around. Yeah, it was Burns. The group of three had now come within range and galloped at a slowly decreasing distance of about seventy feet from the carriage, while the group of four continued to dash straight toward the carriage as if to ram it. Leech sloppily aimed in Burns' direction and pulled the Winchester's trigger. At the same moment, Burns bent over the neck of his animal and gave him the spurs to drive it to even greater haste, and the bullet went missing. Damn it, Leech growled into himself. In some moments he would be shot at from two sides if he did not do anything about it. An idea. If he could control his own horses with his thoughts, would he not then also succeed with those of his persecutors? More shots were fired and bullets hit the wood of the carriage. The blood drinker cried out and Leech emptied the Winchester towards Burns' squad to keep him and his men at a distance. When he saw that his action was successful, he retracted his head and searched for the souls of the mounts. His spirit found theirs, but something distinguished these horses from his. At first Leech couldn't tell what it was, but he tried hard until his wolf's eye was burning and watering. Then finally he could see it. Only very weakly at first, but then more and more clearly. A kind of glow, white interspersed with rotten green spots, surrounded the animals and the riders equally. To test it, he carefully pressed his spirit against the field. And flinched back. It felt as if he had burnt and cut himself at the same time. At the same moment a picture flashed through his brain, a face. A man with the white collar of a priest, with shining eyes, grinning scornfully at him. Nice try, it seemed to say. Leech withdrew his spirit abruptly, hoping that the priest had not noticed his horror. Another telepath. He had not known that there were also people who could do this. The Gorgon in plain view had done it, the blood drinkers could not. The man with the white collar was a human being, wasn't he? Leech turned his head to the left, even though Reginald Burns was raising his revolver on his right. Yes. The aura of the priest with the double-barreled gun was human, no doubt about it. Burns' bullet grazed Leech's shoulder, but he ignored the pain, sought its green glow and immediately closed the wound. His gaze crossed that of the priest. With telepathy he wouldn't get anywhere at the moment, but he had to do something. 
If he didn't do anything, sooner or later he would get a head hit, and then telepathy would be over anyway. Leech shot one of the two captured revolvers empty. Five of the six bullets missed their target, due to the wobbling and rocking of the ludicrously fast carriage, but the last one swept one of Burns' companions off his saddle, which, wrapped in a cloud of dust, lay behind them. The hunt continued. Now the balls hit the concord from both sides. That won't last much longer, Leech reminded himself once again as he shot the half-breed and its nag with the bullets of the second revolver. The eyes of the priest narrowed in anger when he saw the young man fall. Leech grabbed the second Winchester and stared at the hills in front of him, approaching much too slowly. How long would he be able to keep this up? And his horses? As if the priest had read his thoughts, he aimed his double-barreled rifle at one of the front animals of Leech's team. Leech saw it out of the corner of his eye, but he wasn't fast enough, he couldn't prevent the shot. The bullet tore a large piece of meat from the animal's shoulder, the horse tried to break out, the carriage began to roll and the piebald's panic spread to the other animals. Leech dived down, looked for the green glow, tried to send it to the horse to heal the wound and calm it down, but he couldn't send it outside. He only saw a whirling storm that knocked him down. A chaos of all possible colors and, floating in the middle of the storm, the grim face of the priest. In panic, he began to collect every bit of green he could get his hands on, formed what he could tie into a ball with his hands, and then hurled it with all his might, through the storm, into the aura of the injured horse, where it instantly rose up. Much of the healing energy had been swept away by the storm in the few meters, but the animal slowly calmed down, and when Leech sent additional reassuring images of food and water and lush grass waiting for the horses behind the hills, the animal's panic was almost overcome. It worked, the animals headed towards the group of hills at an unchanged speed. But he had left his pursuers out of sight for too long, had not fired back for too long. In quick succession, three bullets penetrated it. One of Burns smashed a rib on his right side and then got stuck in his liver, another from the gun of the man riding five yards behind Burns ate into his right thigh and got stuck in the bone, and then the priest's bullet hit him in the left shoulder and the force of the impact almost threw him off the coach box. Leonard Leach only saw blurred shadows, felt his own blood flowing out of him, but he still fired, took aim at the shadows, pulled the trigger again and again despite the pain and repeated the Winchester until it was empty. Then, finally, his carriage had reached the narrow valley between the first two hills, and his pursuers were forced to unite their groups behind the carriage if they did not want to lose speed rapidly or expose themselves and their horses to the danger of falling. This time he searched for the green for himself, desperately trying to take advantage of the ceasefire while hoping that his horses were intelligent enough to avoid obstacles on their own. But the priest's spirit increased the intensity of the storm and Leech thought he could hear his gloating laughter. Still, he struggled, fighting for every particle, but what he could finally scrape together was barely enough to stop his bleeding, let alone straighten his bones or heal his flesh. Wolf's eye. Wolf's eye. What's going on up there? The voice of the blood drinker tore him back into the physical world. He had completely forgotten them in the last, turbulent minutes. He was a little better now, but he was still badly injured. From further back, he could hear Burns' orders roar, which he did not understand. Just as he was about to answer the blood drinker, for shots rang out, the carriage pulled to the left, slowed down a bit, but then raced on, still pulling to the left, the right rear wheel lifting off the ground. Picked up too far from the ground. The Concord overturned, Leech was thrown away, the blood drinker screamed, her voice echoed in his ears, and before he hit the ground he thought, the fifth horse, the one that had been tied to the carriage. I did not think of cutting it loose. And they shot it. When Leech came to again, it was night. It took him a while to realize that he was still alive, and even longer to become aware of his surroundings. The five hunters who were still alive had gathered around the campfire. 
three lay on the floor and seemed already asleep, but the outlines of Burns and the priest stood out against the flickering flames. They talked to each other. Leech could not understand the words, so he turned his attention to the rest of the environment. Of course he was tied up, and of course to the carriage wheel to which he had tied the blood drinkers the night before. The blood drinker. Where was she? When he turned his head to see more, a sharp pain went through him. His neck was a single, pulsating agony. Fuck it, I don't need my eyes to see, he thought and wanted to glide over to the auric view, but... Nothing. Nothing. He could not even see the color chaos of the hurricane, not to mention ordered auras. Nothing but blackness. Confused, he slid back. When he looked back at the fire, he realized that the priest turned to him and, with a tiny smile on his gaunt face, looked at him for a long moment. Then the man turned back to his interlocutor and paid no further attention to him. Until Don Leach tried to free himself, but the ropes were too thick and he was too weak and too badly injured. He was no longer bleeding, they had even bandaged his wounds, but the bones were still broken and the bullets were still inside him. Except for the priest, who was still awake, at least Leech had this impression, since the man had not abandoned his sitting posture in front of the fire all night long his hunters woke up one by one. Burns was the first to come over to him. He built himself up broad-legged in front of Leech, looked at him for a second or two, then said. And all of a sudden you don't look so scary anymore. More like a greenhorn. How did you do that? Healthy food, Leech murmured, but the kick to his injured leg made him regret the flappy response immediately. Burns squatted down in front of him so that their faces were at the same level. You know, we're not quite sure what to do with you yet. Father Sinclair over there would like to crucify you upside down, then cut off your head and burn the rest of you. He probably wants to murmur a lot in Latin. I have nothing against it, on the contrary. Only I would like to do it in plain view so that the widows and children of the men whose deaths you were responsible for can watch. Until we have made this decision, we will stay here. We are tired, and of the horses only three are usable at the moment. We recover first. I'm going to have breakfast now, with the others, but then I'll come back and we'll talk a little. Burns went back to the fire and sat cross-legged on the floor. Again Leech tried his aura view. How much he needed the green glow now, but again there was nothing. When he returned, Father Sinclair had turned to him, grinning at him from the fire and tapping his index finger on a spot under his collarbone. Leech looked down on himself. Something glittered silver. A chain, narrow and delicate and so light that he had not even noticed it until just now. Quickly he looked over to the priest again. No, it was not the chain with the cross that the man wore around his neck. The way the priest grinned, he knew exactly what was going on in Leech. The chain cut him off from the auric vision, prevented him from healing and relieving his pain. Damn it! The priest had turned away from Leech again and whispered with Burns, and the other three men took care of breakfast and the horses, not without throwing hateful looks at Leech every now and then. It took Leech a few more minutes to admit to himself that there was simply nothing he could do at the moment to get himself out of his predicament, but when the time came, he finally managed to relax and think a little. A greenhorn had called him Burns so his feeding frenzy had probably helped, changed his appearance, rejuvenated him. Although he did not feel particularly young and energetic, on the contrary, it was good to know that in this way he could change his appearance at least a little bit from the portrait on the wanted posters that he saw hung up in his mind all over the country. And there had been something else. Something in Burns' eyes. Envy? Greed? During his time in Plainview, Leech had lived a very disciplined life, feeding on his prey for as long as he could. Consequently, his appearance had remained relatively constant. Yesterday he had a whole blood drinker stuffed inside him, even the parts he normally didn't like he had eaten while the woman, 
the blood drinker, watched him with an interested mind. She had had no pity for her conspecific. Why should you? Sure she had wished for another life, at some point, but if she had hoped he would give her something, well, she was wrong. Didn't really play a big role either. As long as he was tied up here, her flesh was out of reach for him anyway. So back to Reginald Burns. His greedy look never left Leech's mind. Of course. How old might Burns be? Somewhere shortly before his 60th birthday. Still strong, I guess, but Leech still knew how it felt when age knocked softly. He had to be smart now. Burns knew him from Plainview, had seen him almost daily, in Leech's saloon, and although they had both immediately noticed a certain reluctance to get involved with each other and had avoided each other after Burns' first, unsuccessful attempt to involve Leech in windy business, Burns must have noticed the rejuvenation. Maybe Leech could use this fact for himself. Sinclair looked up as Burns sat down beside him. You shouldn't talk too much to that devil, Burns. It's not that hard. The guy hasn't said much. Not guy. You should stop thinking of him as a human being. He is a beast. It eats people. He is dangerous. For a second, Burns didn't answer anything, but occupied himself with the small coffee grinder that he pulled out of his saddle bag, filled it and then started to turn the crank. He looks different from Plainview. Younger. How does he do that? In the necklace? She really takes away his powers, ha. Huh? This time it was up to Father Sinclair not to answer immediately. He patterned Burns' face with a wrinkled forehead. He had not failed to notice what Burns' real question had been. But he decided to get over it. It does not take away his powers directly, but as long as it is around his neck, he cannot access them. And that's safe? You can never be really sure about something like that. The devil is tricky and so are his creatures. Beware of his words too. Don't worry, nobody fools me that easily. That's good, Mr. Burns, that's good. A request, Mr. Burns. Reginald Burns put his head to one side questioningly and still managed to radiate disinterest. Yeah? Send Turner and Davids to bring the bodies of Hoffa and Jones. I will give them a good Christian burial. Let Mr. Abbott search the carriage until he does. Yes, good thinking, Father Sinclair. Reginald Burns gave his men the appropriate instructions and after breakfast was finished, they set to work. Sinclair and Burns watched as Turner and David, who was leading a lame horse on the reins, took off then looked over to a bot and the carriage. When a bot disappeared inside, Sinclair said. A true miracle that the carriage did not break apart in the accident. Stable, these concords. In fact, apart from the numerous bullet holes and in view of the fact that it had rolled over several times, the carriage was in a surprisingly good condition. Maybe we can get her back on track, Burns replied. Anyway, we don't have enough nags left to ride, and Leech's nags have run off. Father Sinclair nodded with false sympathy. Poor creatures. Tied together and injured, they are easy prey, and if one of them is lame, they have no chance anyway. Then he turned his head in Leech's direction. His gaze darkened. Yes, take a good look at us, beast. This is of no use to you. When we have buried our dead, we will let you pay a little bit. This will not be very nice for you. Inside the carriage Abbott drove around and finally came out loaded with a few suitcases. Luggage of three persons, according to the papers of Theodore Lamont, a Stephen Marks and a Miranda Harper. Nothing else is to be found. Leech obviously had no luggage except his weapons. Father Sinclair nodded his head. We will send letters to the relatives. Leech watched as the men dug the graves. It had taken a long time for Turner and David to return with the bodies of the dead. 
By the time they reached the temporary camp, they had tied the bodies of Jones and the half-breed across the horse's back. The sun had already reached its zenith. It burned mercilessly down on the men. Leech had asked for a hat, his own had gone missing and of course they had not granted him this request. They dug the graves. Even Burns and Father Sinclair helped. When they were finished, the priest approached Leech in the carriage. With petty satisfaction, Leech noted that Sinclair suffered at least as much from the heat as he did. Nevertheless, the priest certainly made a much more vital overall impression, Leech pondered. During the morning, a fever had joined his pain and he could feel it spreading further and further inside him. It started from his left shoulder, from where the bullet from Sinclair's double-barreled gun had hit him. When the priest stopped a few meters in front of Leech, he thought that Father Sinclair wanted to talk to him, but when he raised his head, he noticed that the priest looked at the carriage with a searching look. I want nothing from you, beast. I only need decent wood for the crosses. The poor bastards you killed deserve better than just a few twigs tied together. You should have just left me alone, and they would still be alive. We shall not depart from thee, creature of hell. Neither Mr. Burns, nor I, nor the men riding with us. Creature from hell? Why don't you ask the fine Mr. Burns what else he saw that evening in the saloon? I was by no means the worst devil that evening. I wanted to save the people. Oh, yes, the Gorgonian. Burns told me about it. Thanks be to the Lord and praise be to his name, this abomination was destroyed. You have fought it, that is true. But that doesn't make you any better. All the body parts in the hidden rooms of your salon, all the spoiled books you've collected. Oh, that won't surprise you, will it? Burns searched the saloon well before he gave the order to set it on fire. Rage twitched through Leech's face. Father Sinclair drank from his canteen and continued unimpressed. Either way, Mr. Leech, anyone who was in the saloon that night saw that you were in league with the devil. It was the multitude of testimonies that finally convinced me to comply with Burns' wish and come here. There's no name in my order for something like you, Sergeant Leech. Your medal? The order. We have made it our business to carry out the will of the Lord by whatever means may be necessary. We are the fire and the sword, if you will. Only now did Leech notice that the priest had taken his cavalry saber and fastened it to his own belt. I'm going to kill you, sooner or later, that's for sure, that's what the Lord wants, back in plain view at the latest, to do Burns that favor. But the how is negotiable. It depends on how cooperative you are. Whether you are ready to tell me about yourself, Mr. Leech. About yourself and everything you know. Leech laughed out loud, but the laughter quickly turned into a coughing fit that catapulted bloody mucus from his lungs into his mouth, now dripping from his lips in long threads. He knew nothing. You're a hypocrite, like all priests. You are not quite normal yourself. What you did with the horses the astral storm, that chain around my neck. You are not a priest. What are you? A magician? Ha! Ah. Hardly. The sorcerers are an abomination to the Lord. He broke off, choosing his words carefully as he noticed that Burns and Turner had moved closer and were listening spellbound to their conversation. The holy light of the Lord penetrates me. He has made me his instrument, the executor of his will. Hallelujah. But enough of that. We will talk in more detail later. With this, Father Sinclair moved closer to the carriage and paid no further attention to Leech. Instead, after a few more seconds and as casually as one would pick a flower, he ripped the carriage door, which was still open after a bot search, off its hinges. Wood for the crosses, he explained his act and set to work. When his hunters were finally ready to perform the burial ritual that was so important to them, Leech's fever had risen even higher. His temples throbbed, his stomach cramped, 
and the outlines of the two crosses and those of the five men on the hill blurred before his eyes. He became dizzy from this, so he looked away and finally he closed his eyes completely. That was already better. The outlines of what he had just seen danced, yet whirled through the optical part of his brain, mixed with memories of the fight he had fought with the Gorgon, mixed with his dreams of the multifaceted animal. Why didn't it come to help him, as it did when Vargas had dug his teeth into his flesh? Could it not reach him? Not getting to him because of that thin, silver chain that was wrapped around his neck? Was Sinclair that powerful? More powerful than the incomprehensible being that had given Leech his new life? What if the priest was indeed an instrument of God? As if in response to this thought, the words of Father Sinclair sounded on the hill. Lord, give these brave souls peace. Lord, receive your servants in the kingdom of heaven. Give them eternal life. Let them be your angels. He promises eternal life, Leech thought. Is that what this is all about? Then the fever took him. Part 4 Sister of Mercy When Miranda Harper came to, it was dark and she was in the open. Immediately after she opened her eyes, her instinct to flee set in and when she noticed that she couldn't get up and run, she started to crawl. Her bound hands felt cool, dry earth, interspersed with small stones and boulders that bored into her knees and palms. Slowly, as she pushed her tortured body inch by inch, the memory came back. How it had initially only annoyed her that she could not see what was happening outside the carriage. The rumbling, the calls of the hunters, the stomping and neighing of the horses, the shots that had repeatedly punched holes in the walls of their raging prison, and the longer this threatening situation, which was completely beyond their control, lasted, the more their anger turned into fear into a fear that grew with every second. She wanted to be brave, but after she had been narrowly missed a few times by the bullets that were meant for the damn wolf's eye, not much was left of her bravery and when the carriage finally finally overturned and the bar to which this leech had tied her to broke out of its mount on one side, she was actually kind of relieved. She was thrown against the ceiling, against the walls and back to the floor. Her arms, her wrists, everything hurt, was sore and bruised and throbbing or bleeding. She had expected to lose consciousness, she had hoped. The powerlessness and the horror she had experienced in the power of the wolf's eye, the omnipresent fear of death, which now gnawed on her nerves even more greedily, to watch how this strange man, this strange being had eaten up her companions, had cut them up and gutted them, factually like a butcher gutting meat all that had just happened in the last weeks had made her tired and tired and weak. But the long for peace was not yet granted to her. No rest for little Miranda. She suppressed a giggle. Instead of drowning in darkness, instead of simply refusing service because of the sensory overload, their senses were sharp and crystal clear. She heard how the riders who were after the wolf's eye and probably, hopefully, did not even know she was in the carriage, rushed past the damaged vehicle. She also heard her cries, from which she could tell that Leech had been thrown off the carriage. When she heard one of them shouting, Now we've got him, she knew that she had to take this opportunity, because there would probably not be another one for her. She did not take time for subtleties. She did not carefully peer past the smoke-dark, dirty curtains through the window, she did not listen further outside to get an idea of the situation. She simply opened the door that was turned away from the men, which was already hanging loosely on the hinges, and crawled and crawled away. Away from this wolf-eyed demon and those who hunted him. Security was what she needed now. With her last ounce of strength she circled a hill, and when she had brought it between her and the men, the powerlessness she had so longed for finally came. And from that very impotence she must have just awakened. She looked up. The stars and the moon sparkled down on them coldly and hostilely. She was thirsty. What she had gotten from the coyote leech had shot for her and Lamont was not nearly enough to quench her thirst. 
Strictly speaking, nothing could appease this unholy desire, this greedy fire that always burned within her. That's the way it was. She herself, her whole species was driven by this thirst from prey to prey, from victim to victim. She had once been a prey herself. Those of Marx and Lamont. That night sixty-eight years ago, they had first wanted her body and then her blood. And they had got both. But then, just before her death, before the reaper had reached out for her, Lamont Marx had called back. He had bent over her, looked at her closely for a while, and saw something in her. By this time she had already been unable to move, from pain and blood loss and fear. But seeing and hearing, she had still been able to do that. Wait, Lamont had said. It's different from the one we usually have. Marx, drunk with her blood, had left his friend his will. Lamont had performed the ritual and so she had become one of them. A blood drinker. Her slave first, then her lover, then her friend. This had taken decades, decades in which it had changed more and more. From prey to predator, and then, at some point, it was she who made the decisions and it was Lamont and Marx who followed. She had forgotten what it was like to be weak, had forgotten what it was like to be used and humiliated, had forgotten what it felt like to be afraid. And then Leech had gotten into her carriage, with his black eye patch, and everything had changed again. The night had been hell for Leech. Burns and his men took it upon themselves to take turns maltreating him, drawing lots to see which of them would be allowed to take what part of Leech's body. Underneath all the kicks and punches Leech had to endure while tied to the back wheel of the carriage, his mind took refuge in a stoic apathy. The pain became more abstract from blow to blow, gradually losing its physicality. Leech immersed himself in his fever, in reality, memories and dream images mixed together. Yet there was a part of him, somewhere deep below the surface, who still worked logically and who realized that Reginald Burns was careful to ensure that his men did not overdo it. Father Sinclair had stuffed and lit a pipe while sitting by the fire and watched with a quiet mind while he sipped his canteen from time to time. At least at first, because after a while he lost interest and took a big book a Bible, Leech assumed out of his saddlebag and started reading. Before the men got bored with their game as well, Burns approached Leech again. This is how it will be every night from now on, until we are in plain view. Oh, what am I saying? Tomorrow evening, the priest would like to join in a round as well. That will certainly be exciting. Burns had a dirty laugh. Probably his little Pfaffenschwanchen is already standing by watching. Crazy guy. He said he still wanted to prepare himself. Prepare ready, do you hear me? He will surely think of something nice for you. Then they finally left him alone and assigned the guards. The carriage was indeed still roadworthy, at least to a limited extent. The three horses that had survived the hunt unharmed pulled the vehicle, and the others, those that were lame or had ridden to shame, were summarily shot and their meat enriched the menu, even though most of it would probably go to the coyotes in the end. Burns and Father Sinclair sat in the Concord's perforated cabin, keeping silent most of the time or staring outside through the big hole left by the missing door. Two of Burns' men, Turner and Abbott, had taken a seat on the coach box with their rifles on their laps. David's dangling his legs from the luggage rack at the back, watched Leech, who, tied at the wrists and with a rope around his neck, had to walk behind the slowly crawling carriage. That had been Sinclair's idea. Running will keep him tired and will not slow us down any further. Anyway, we cannot go faster than marching speed. Both axles have got somewhere and the left front wheel does not run smoothly anymore. Every two hours they gave him some water. After all. Sometimes he could pick up scraps of conversation but Burns and Sinclair were careful most of the time not to let their voices get too loud, if they ever spoke at all. So he couldn't do anything with most of what he picked up, but his attempts to interpret the men's soft murmurs helped him stay conscious. 
soon he lost all sense of time, his body carried out the movements necessary for walking on its own, and gradually he lost himself in feverish dreams, from the depths of which he only emerged again when the carriage stopped and his guards began to set up camp for the night, tying him to the rear wheel again with his wrists. We need more wood. That was Father Sinclair's voice. But we've already brought everything we could find here. I need a big fire today. So if you don't find anything flammable here, then you'll have to walk a little further. Let's go. The two men, Turner and Abbott, looked questioningly over to Reginald Burns, who together with David looked after the horses. Burns nodded at them and they ran off grumbling. When the animals were fed and the measly fire was burning, Father Sinclair instructed David's, Please feed our guest of honor, will you? He must be strong, because I intend to have a detailed conversation with him. He should not make me prematurely tired. David obeyed and began very rudely to force leech into his mouth from the much too hot, soggy stew. He made no attempt to chew or swallow, but he did not spit out the food. He simply left his mouth open and stared at David with his yellow wolf's eye. Father Sinclair? David asked uncertainly. He won't eat. Then, in the name of the devil, force him. Or no, wait. Sinclair came over to the two of them, stood next to David and looked at Leech for a while. Then he murmured something into himself and finally said. Let it go. Place the large cooking rack next to the other and fill the pot with water. And then go and look for Turner and Abbott. We really need a decent fire. Leech, Burns and Sinclair stayed behind, while Davids disappeared to the southeast after completing the first part of his assignment. When he disappeared first out of hearing and then out of sight, Leech spat out the food. The taste of human food left a stale, moldy feeling in his mouth. If he had swallowed it, he would probably have felt sick. Another thing that had changed over time. Leech stared at the floor in front of him but tried hard to eavesdrop on Burns and Sinclair's conversation. Mr. Burns, it is quite deliberate that I have sent your men all away. It would be best if I could be alone with him. But I am of course aware that you will not be sent away like your henchmen. So I want to warn you, Mr. Burns. You will see some things today that are not suitable for the eyes of normal people. I must ask you to assure me that no matter what may happen here and now, you will make no attempt to interfere and that you will keep silence about all events until the end of your days and beyond. The annoyance was more than obvious to Burns. Pa. What I talk about or not is still my business. I don't own eight-tenths of Plainview because I have to be told what to do. And at the end of the day, it's still me who pays them. You do not pay me, Mr. Burns. You contribute to the welfare of my order. In the pact you sealed, the one that came into effect with my arrival in Plainview, well, you should take it seriously, Mr. Burns. Sinclair, don't irritate me, I will take this piece of paper, this pact, seriously, but don't try to make me compliant with vague insinuations and mumbo-jumbo. The tension between the two men continued. For a few seconds neither of them said a word. Leech carefully lifted his head. They measured themselves with glances and in the end it was Reginald Burns who first looked away. All right. I will not interfere and will not talk about what I will see. Happy, preacher? Very satisfied. That's all I wanted. A false smile played around the mouth of the priest. Then I'd best start with the preparations. I'm glad we came to an agreement. Leech watched as Father Sinclair took his saddlebag from the carriage and returned with them to the campfire, where he took several items from them. The outlines of the priest were dark, almost black, in front of the fire. Only now and then did the priest turn his face, distorted with concentration, so that Leech could see the worldly expression on it. Reginald Burns kept himself a little away and he too watched with fascination each of the priest's strangely ritualistic movements. 
Sinclair's mouth moved, constantly articulating syllables, but not a sound was heard as he plucked a variety of different ingredients powder in cans, colored liquids in vials, and small chunks of a scab-like substance from his saddlebags and placed them in the boiling water. It didn't take long before a scent that was hard to describe blew over to leech. At first the monster eater had to think of mint, a strong herbal brew, but soon heavier components were added. The steam smelled earthy and old and still Father Sinkler's lips found no rest. Reginald Burns became restless, Leech noted. Patience and obedience were only very rarely pronounced qualities in men like him. But the large landowner still managed to pull himself together, and he left it at that, now and then frowning. But Leech could see that it was hard for him not to ask what the priest was brewing in that pot. It seemed to have added all the necessary ingredients and stood up. Still mumbling silently, he reached for the cross on his chest. Holding it stretched out at half arm's length, he began to walk in a circle around the fire and the pot, slowly, with measured, stiff looking steps. At every fourth part of the circle described in this way, he stopped knelt down and remained with his head bowed for almost a minute, then kissed the cross and continued the ritual. Leech's actions reminded him of what he had read about the rituals of the Wicca or other witch cults, and seeing this priest act in this way seemed strangely inappropriate and wrong. Father Sinclair ended the procedure by breaking a host and sprinkling the crumbs over the brew. He then took the pot from the fire and placed it on the floor near Leech. The whole process must have put a lot of strain on the priest. His eyes lay deep in the caves and his face shone with sweat. He sat down moaning next to Burns and began to stuff his pipe. Now we wait. Wait for what? To several things. The brew still has to connect completely and settle down a bit, then I need more wood and. Well. The moan. The moan. I see. What is all this? In the end, are you a medicine man, Sinclair? The priest laughed softly. No, no, Mr. Burns. This brew is. One of the tools that the Order gives to its warriors to be able to execute the will of the Lord. You'll see if you don't prefer to close your eyes and ears when I start. Pa. I hardly think so, preacher. However, I still do not understand what you want to achieve with this survey. The matter is clear. The man is in league with the devil. A murderer and a cannibal to boot. He has to be killed, so that the will of the Lord is done, isn't it? The Order has its experience with many unholy beings, Mr. Burns. But with someone like him, he nodded over to the bound leech. We have never had anything to do even though the order is old and its records go back a long way. If this guy was a normal obsessive, or a witch, I would execute him immediately, but... Father Sinclair paused for a moment to study Byrne's face. But what? Sinclair still hesitated, wrestling with himself, but finally he kept talking. The body parts you found in the hidden cellar in the saloon, they are not human, Mr. Burns. The priest's words struck Burn's brain as a bullet would have done. What? But. But there were so many. No people you say? But that means. That means. Never before had Leech seen his self-righteous hunter so stunned. Yes, Mr. Burns, that means that there are many more demons and other unnatural worms on earth than pious, good people want to admit. And him? He. Eats them? It certainly looks that way, doesn't it? For the order this is quite interesting, as you will certainly understand. Hence the. Questioning. Then he too is a tool of the H. Do not jump to conclusions. I'll find out what he is tonight. Slowly Reginald Burns regained his composure. No. He cannot be an instrument of the Lord. In the end he brought death to my city one way or another. The poor reverend, Doc Jenkins, his wife, the people in the saloon. 
that is enough for me to judge him. And the good citizens of Plainview should see it. I can protect my city, Father Sinclair. The preacher's face showed no emotion, but Leech thought he saw an amused flash in his eyes. Sure you can. If tonight's survey does not produce results that suggest otherwise, I will be happy to help you, Mr. Burns. Burns drove up. What's that supposed to mean? We have a pact, an agreement, we. Father Sinclair raised his hands in appeasement. Of course, of course, don't worry. Ah, look, here come their men with the wood. Turner and Abbott approached the campfire cautiously and with questioning faces, and Father Sinclair instructed them to deposit their spoils of dead branches and dry buffalo field next to it. Reluctantly they obeyed. The men could sense that something had changed between their leader and the priest. It makes them nervous, Leech thought. You could clearly see that Burns had the words of the priest in his head. Father Sinclair, on the other hand, was the silence itself. While he sucked his pipe again and again, he thanked Abbot and Turner Wordy, blessed the two men and concluded with the words. Please bind the prisoner according to Jesus' example, will you? Standing, arms stretched out to the sides? That would be very friendly. And then please leave overnight. Mr. Burns and I have a lot to settle with the beast and it's not for her eyes. Once more the men looked at their leader to have the priest's instructions nod from him. It worked in Burns' face for a moment and Leech expected to contradict Father Sinclair's instructions, but then he waved it off with a resigned gesture. Do what Sinclair says. He knows his trade and will already know what the right thing is. Turner and Abbott approached Leech, loosened the necessary shackles and pulled him so roughly and jerkily on his feet that he was dizzy. Resistance was not to be thought of. Splinters of his rib stabbed painfully into his flesh and the wound in his left shoulder reopened and started bleeding. Leech left himself with clenched teeth to the rough treatment. The rope construction with which they then fixed him in the posture desired by Father Sinclair looked adventurous, but was extremely stable. A real cross would probably have been better, the priest murmured softly before saying louder. Thank you, gentlemen. In my saddlebag there is still a bottle of bourbon. Take it with you as a sign of my satisfaction. May it keep you warm at night, but leave everything else alone. When the men were gone, Burns turned to Father Sinclair. You might have offered me some of that bourbon. So you can blame everything you see tonight on the booze? Oh, no, Mr. Burns. You wanted to be there. Then so be you with all your senses. Turner and Abbott, under the stern gaze of Reginald Burns, not without now and then casting an anxious glance over their shoulders in the direction of the carriage and the campfire, set off to find their own campground half a mile away, looking out for David's presence along the way. Now that they were gone, Burns sat cross-legged in front of Leech and stared at him incessantly, as if he wanted to use the power of his eyes to figure out what to do with him. Behind him, Sinclair had stretched out on his sleeping roll. We must wait until the moon is in the sky. Wake me up in time. Yeah, go to sleep, dirty monkey. Burns said softly. Out loud he said. Of course, Father Sinclair. Leech, whose arms were slowly going numb, could see from Sinclair's amused grin that he had understood the words of his backer. Abbott and Turner shrank high as the wind brought the first cries. Such agony lay within them as they had never heard before, not even on the battlefields of Ball's Bluff, or the following year in Pease Ridge. Guess we're lucky Sinclair sent us away. Turner took a sip from the bottle. A bot nodded gloomily. Let's just knock off the bourbon and hope the night is over soon. At the carriage, Reginald Burns was almost ready to wish to join his men. The transformation that the belligerent priest had made had been so absolute, so unexpected and sudden that Burns wondered if he still had the same person in front of him. 
Even in Leonard Leach's feverish eyes there had been astonishment and a touch of fear when the priest stepped in front of him and, with slow movements, stripped himself down to his trousers and boots. His pale, gaunt torso shone in the glow of the fire and was covered with countless pink scarred bulges. You look thirsty, Mr. Leach. You should drink something. Wait, where's the... Father Sinclair went over to his saddlebags and returned shortly thereafter with an engraved silver chalice and filled it with the brew he had mixed, which had cooled down sufficiently in the meantime. Don't worry, Mr. Leach, it's not poisonous, see? Father Sinclair took a big gulp, his larynx bounced up and down and then, after ten seconds, strong spasms whipped through his body. The cramps lasted for several seconds, and when they were over, he said breathlessly, Ah! It turned out well. Leech tried to resist when the priest effortlessly forced his mouth open and poured the liquid down his throat. Then something strange happened. As soon as the brew touched Leech's mucous membranes, he suddenly gave up his resistance and drank with an obsessive greed that turned his face into an almost horny grimace. More, Leech gasped as the silver cup was empty. But Father Sinclair did not grant this request, not even when Leech again asked for more. Instead, he took a step back and let his eyes rest on Leech. Burns first noticed the change in Father Sinclair. It had grown bigger, no, not bigger, rather more voluminous. His muscles had grown. He was now much more upright and some of his scars seemed to have disappeared or had become paler. Then Leech also went through this elusive transformation. The monster eater had drunk much more of the brew than the priest. Burns heard fleshy wet smacking and rubbing of bone against bone. Then three soft, wet noises as the bullets that were still in Leech's body were pressed out of the wounds and fell to the ground. Leonard Leach breathed the first time in his captivity without pain and sucked the air deeply. Ten seconds later the shine of the fever had also disappeared from his eyes. Immediately, the monster glutton began to fight against its chains and let out animal-like rage cries. But Abbot and Turner had done their work conscientiously, so that he achieved nothing but that the ropes cut even deeper into his joints and neck. The resulting abrasions and bruises healed almost as fast as they were made. Don't worry, Mr. Burns, the grinning priest turned away from his victim. They all do at first. Once again, Father Sinclair walked over to his saddlebags by the campfire. He pulled out a bundle of leather rags and rolled it out beside the fire. The blades, scissors, and saws glittered viciously. The priest chose some of them very slowly and placed them in the embers at the bottom. After a few minutes, he took one of the surgical instruments out of the fire again. A pair of scissors. Then he approached Leech and cut off two of his fingers. With eyes wide open in horror, Leonard Leech saw his fingers fall to the ground. It was only when that happened that the pain came. A pain like he had never experienced before. He writhed in his shackles and screamed, and it felt like an eternity, but then all of a sudden a feeling of warmth, a soothing tingling that emanated from his stomach, crawled through his body, and finally settled in the crippled hand and then, then they could all watch as the fingers that Father Sinclair had cut off half a minute ago grew back. A primal feeling of happiness would have made Leech stagger if he had not been tied up. But when he looked into Father Sinclair's diabolically grinning face, he suddenly realized what it meant to him and the euphoria gave way to sheer horror. Well, Mr. Leech, I see from your face that you have fully understood the situation. Agony and ecstasy are very close to each other, and they still have much of it ahead of them. I can do this again and again, Mr. Leech. As long as the potion works, everything I do to you will heal instantly and I will do it again unless you tell me what I want to know. Reginald Burns' gaze glided back and forth between the severed fingers at Leech's feet and those that had just grown back. Perversely, that is perversely natural. With righteous indignation he jumped up. Sinclair, you're a man of God. How can you do such a depraved? The Lord gives power to those who serve Him, 
and this power can sometimes be terrible. I warned them. And now Mr. Burns sit down again, sit down and be silent. Keep your stupid mouth shut and pay attention. Burns was paying attention. Father Sinclair gave him another angry look. Then he began the questioning. Burns was dead pale when the sun finally rose. At the feet of the crucified man, parts of his body piled up, up to his knees. Arms, fingers, chunks of meat that Father Sinclair had cut out of his thighs, eyes and teeth, ribs and shins, and when the sunlight hit him, the nauseous heap, this testimony to Leonard Leach's infinite torment, began to dissolve into a white, heavy mist that almost completely enveloped the campground and in which the men thought they saw devilish grimaces again and again. Father Sinclair, unimpressed by this, cleaned his tools and himself with water from a leather hose. He was in a bad mood. Oh, yes, of course Leach had cooperated and told everything, his whole story, but the man with the one yellow eye hadn't been able to answer most of the priest's questions. What kind of demon the multifaceted animal Leech had spoken of was, if he could summon it, what it wanted, if there were more of its kind, if it ate people. Leech either didn't know the answer to all this, or Sinclair didn't believe him and used his tools again. The screams still echoed in Burns' head, the sound of breaking bones and the bloody smacking of flesh, or the ripping of the optic nerve when Sinclair ripped out the man's wolf's eye for the seventh time Burns would dream about that night for a long time, he was sure of it. Now this leech was hanging limply on the ropes, but he was awake and outwardly unharmed. Fearful and hateful at the same time, his gaze rested on Sinclair, and his body, now dressed only in bloody rags, involuntarily tensed up whenever the priest made a quick move or came near him. Burns could understand that very well. After all that had happened, he also found it difficult to even look at the preacher. Father Sinclair was now fully clothed again, and only the shadows around his eyes spoke of the efforts of the previous night. His face was hard, again and again he muttered incomprehensibly to himself while he stowed his tools in his saddlebags. The effects of the potion had dissipated, Leech and the priest had returned to their normal form. Sinclair looked gone again, there was nothing left of the upright posture and the swelling muscles, and Leech was just a mess anyway, but that had more to do with his spirit, as the bullet wounds and fever had been healed by the potion. The priest seemed to be able to read Burns' thoughts. Shall we put some more bullets in him? For safety, what do you think, Mr. Burns? I don't think he's a danger at the moment. Just look at him. If he makes trouble, we can always add to it. Yeah, doesn't he look a little limp? Father Sinclair giggled. An autumn night like this takes a lot out of you. Fall night? Burns was going to ask, but then he came up with it himself. Falling leaves. Who was the bigger monster here? He pulled his face in disgust. This whole manhunt had gone differently than he had imagined. With difficulty he got up, and he and Sinclair silently beat the camp. Where are your men? Sinclair had already taken his seat in the carriage, while Burns, who now turned to him, was still standing around the campfire. The fog that had risen from Leech's severed limbs had not yet completely dissipated and obstructed the view. Well, if they won't come to us, we'll just go to them. I want to get away from here anyway, he said, trying, as he had done all along, not to breathe in any of the fog. After checking once more that all the weapons and other equipment was safely stowed away in the carriage, Burns climbed onto the coach box and drove the horses, while Leech stumbled behind on his rope. They had just left the eerie fog behind them when the front of the three horses shied away, Burns cursed, and as soon as he stopped the carriage, Father Sinclair, his double-barreled in hand, jumped out from inside and walked towards what had frightened the animal. It is David, or what is left of him. Probably didn't make it back to Turner and a bot. What? David's? It can't be. Get off the carriage and see for yourself. Burns complied with the request, then knelt beside his henchman and turned him on his back. 
his throat was torn to shreds. There's not a single drop of blood left in that guy, Sinclair noted soberly. Took you by surprise. And what? What surprised him? One of those grimaces in the mist you conjured up, twisted bastard? No, don't. They are only images, mental reflections, completely harmless. I don't believe a word you say, preacher. Reginald Burns built himself up threateningly in front of Father Sinclair and the priest's hands closed tighter around his gun, but his voice remained calm. I understand that you are upset, but we must remain calm. If I say it wasn't the fog, then it wasn't the fog. Don't make me laugh. I. Burns. Accept reason. Fog cannot rip open throats or drink blood. You see, there is not a single drop on the ground around the body. Reginald Burns gathered under great effort of will and looked at the dead man once more. His left eye blinked uncontrollably. All right, Parson. If it was not the fog, who was it? Leech followed the scene attentively, then a cold smile came over his face. They had forgotten something. Quietly and weakly, so that the two men could just about understand him, he said. Oh, you are wrong, he found them, his friends. His tracks come from the hill on which they have set up camp. He ran. Burns and Sinclair turned to him. Leech continued. He is not wearing his gun belt and I don't see his hat anywhere. They were surprised in their sleep, I'd say. The beast is right, murmured Father Sinclair. Turner and Abbott are also dead, you can be sure of that. Otherwise they would have helped their David here. Don't you think? Leech interrupted. Burns hit him. Shut up. We have to look. Come on, Sinclair, get in. And you, Wolf's Eye, run. When they arrived at the men's camp, they saw Leech's prophecy confirmed. Turner and Abbott were lying on the ground, their eyes wide open in horror, directed towards the morning sky. They were as dead and bloodless as David. Leech noticed that a gun belt was missing and he expected another outburst of anger from Reginald Burns, but none came. He stood motionless and with grinding jaws before his dead. Those were my men. They were good men. He turned to Leech. Are you really worth all this? His voice was soft and fragile. To do the work of the Lord has always required sacrifice, Mr. Burns. Our actions are good and just and your men are sure of a place in the kingdom of heaven if it comforts them. Shut your mouth too, Father Sinclair, and do not open it again until you complete the funeral. I dig the graves. You go back and get David. Burns' tone was imperious and cold, and the priest swallowed his reply and did as he was told. Leech recognized the advanced obedience in his eyes. It took the two men all morning, but finally they stood before the graves of Turner, Abbott, and David. Father Sinclair moistened his throat with a sip from his canteen and spoke the necessary words. He had also torn out the second carriage door and made crosses from it. When the ceremony was over, Father Sinclair advised that the journey be continued quickly. We should hurry and cover as many miles as possible before nightfall. No way, Sinclair. Surely you are not afraid? We will find the beast that will do this, he pointed vaguely in the direction of the shallow burial mounds. Is responsible and they judge. I will not return to Plainview until that is done. Mr. Burns, if something or someone can kill three men in one night without a single shot being fired, it can do so again. Are you trying to insult me, Sinclair? The men were drunk on the bourbon you gave them and distracted by the devilish cries of the wolf's eye, you know that very well. We, we will be awake. Be awake and wait. Father Sinclair sighed theatrically. Mr. Burns, I am very sorry to have to tell you this, but at no time were you the leader of this enterprise. You and your people have been quite helpful, I must admit, 
and the order owes you thanks for bringing him to this depraved creature. He nodded over to Leech, who was tied up and sitting cross-legged on the floor watching the two of them. Have drawn attention, but... A shot cracked and a hole appeared in Father Sinclair's forehead. His blood splashed into Reginald Byrne's face. Although the priest should have been dead immediately, he turned back, with a hint of astonishment on his face, and Leech could see that there was a hole in the back of his head as well. Then Sinclair broke down. Reginald Burns had meanwhile drawn his own gun and was looking for a target. Leech followed his gaze. Twenty meters away, beyond the graves, stood the blood drinker Miranda Harper. The gun in her hand was still smoking as she cocked the hammer again and walked calmly toward Reginald Burns. I don't know who you are, but since you rode with that disgusting son of a bitch of a priest, I'm inclined to put a bullet in you too unless you drop your revolver, sit on one of the horses you have left and ride back to where you came from. Her words made Burns hesitate. Just as he was about to reply, she fired three times in rapid succession. I guess I was lying, she smiled coldly. Burns staggered, walking backwards toward the carriage, his fingers groping over the holes in his chest, then slumped down next to Leech, his back leaning sideways against the rear wheel of the Concorde. Monster, he whispered as Miranda Harper approached. Monsters everywhere. Yes, exactly, she said, kneeling before him and gently stroking his cheek. The world is full of them. They like to lie. Then she also shot him in the head. She had taken the horses and most of the weapons with her. In fact, she had taken almost everything with her. The double-barreled shotgun of the priest and Leech Smith and Wesson, the silver chalice even the Bible of this mad preacher and actually everything that was somehow valuable. And she had let him live. I have seen what the priest has done to you. I consider the crimes you have committed against me and my people atoned for, she had said. Then she had thrown a saber at his feet, not without first sucking the blood out of Reginald Burns and Father Sinclair. You'll be able to free yourself somehow. Then she had ridden away. Leonard Leach dragged himself further, away from the place of his torment and away from the bodies of the men responsible. The damn silver chain Father Sinclair had used to cut him off from his powers was taken off as soon as he finally got his hands free, and then he put it on. In the saddlebags he had thrown over his shoulder was everything Miranda Harper had left him. It was not much. Epilogue The moon shone down on Father Sinclair, cold and bright, and slowly, agonizingly slowly, the hole in his head closed. The coyotes, which had eaten from him, whimpered in fear and searched the distance. With difficulty he rose. Fortunately they had not buried him. For centuries it might have had to lie on the prairie, until at some point wind and rain would have made sure that the light of the moon could feel it. And luckily he took some of his special brew every day. The moonlight did the rest. He watched as the wounds that the coyotes had taught him closed up. Then he looked around for his canteen. The corpse of this idiot Burns stared stupidly at the sky. Reluctantly he spoke a blessing. There was nothing to see of Leech. Sighing, he sat down on his knees and began to dig another pit with his hands. At least the guy would be buried beside his men. Nowadays one could not simply leave the dead lying around. He grinned crookedly. Part 5 The Beasts of Fort Hunter Leech had been on foot for nine days, heading for the east coast. The torture to which the self-righteous priest had subjected him had left its mark. Now that he didn't have to wear that damn silver necklace anymore, he could fall back on his auric vision, but he only saw the shapes and colors blurred and indistinct. No wonder, Leech thought grimly, the priest had gouged out his wolf's eyes several times in a row. Each time, only to watch it grow back immediately, only to remove it again from its den in an even more cruel way. And so it went on and on. Although Leech was physically intact, at least superficially, 
the memory of his torment was still in every cell of his body. Everything felt sore and sore and hurt. Hunger did the rest. Despite the regenerating suds that Father Sinclair had forced on him before the torture, Leech had used up almost all his energy reserves that night to survive the torture, and his stomach felt empty and hollow. He let his gaze wander over the slowly greening prairie. Nothing, only seemingly endless vastness and neither his human nor his wolf's eye even felt the trace of a prey that would have come into question for him. Tired and slightly disgusted, he nibbled on the hind leg of a coyote he had shot, knowing full well that the fibrous flesh would not satisfy his hunger, but would rather make it worse. Miranda Harper had left him his saber. He had found a belt with the accompanying revolver and a few cartridges Leech believed it was David's under the carriage, along with another colt. Otherwise she had taken almost everything she could carry with her. He wondered whether he would have let her live under reverse conditions as well. Probably not. Miranda Harper, the blood drinker. Whether the same hunger burned in her as in him? Maybe he should have spoken to her more? Oh, nonsense, he scolds himself, if she were here with him now, he would put a bullet in her and sink his teeth into her tender flesh. Bite. Rip. Damn hunger. The multifaceted animal had appeared to him again, in his dreams. Last night and the night before. It had, it seemed to leech, wanted to express sympathy and anger at Reginald Burns and Father Sinclair but it could not help him. These dreams always left Leech with a desire for more, raising more questions than they answered. Why had it transformed him, back then in the cave? What was the purpose of all this? Of course, this strange creature, this ghost, or whatever it was, had saved his life back then, when the werewolf had knocked Vargas' teeth into Leech, and it had given him powers he would never have dared to dream of. It had given him access to a completely new world, a world full of dark dangers, but also full of unexpected joys and desires. He wondered whether the death of Reginald Burns and Father Sinclair had finally put an end to the hunt for him, or whether new men would appear with his profile in hand, eager to judge him, the monster of plain view. In the evening, just before sunset, a herd of buffalo crossed his path in some distance. They grazed calmly and seemed to take no notice of him, which put him in the comfortable position of being able to observe them for a while. For a short time he toyed with the idea of killing one of them. But what for? It seemed that a part of him was still not completely used to his new existence, he thought, and decided to leave the animals alone. He had just made this decision when the herd became restless. The leading bull lifted his head and roared out a warning. When the call had died away, Leech heard the hooves of at least a dozen horses in full gallop. A second later, a group that actually consisted of a dozen riders came crashing over a gently rolling hilltop and opened fire on the animals at full gallop. Leech had a box seat. The buffalo fled in panic to the left, northward, and from his right side the hunters approached. The three bravest horsemen steered their animals right into the middle of the herd of buffalo and shot in all directions, while most of the troops stayed behind the herd and aimed at the hind legs of the animals. The shot animals were left in the dust of the hunt. The shouting and roaring of the buffalo was deafening. Calves, cows and bulls were equally beaten down. At the moment, the riders were only interested in wounding as many animals as possible in the smallest space and shooting them when they were unable to escape. After only a few seconds the air was filled with the smell of blood and the painful sounds of the animals. Of course, Leech thought, this way they maximized their yield. They could still kill the injured buffaloes later. However, this procedure was fraught with dangers. And indeed, one of the hit buffalo, which the riders had left behind in the meantime, fought his way back up again, snorting with rage. Blood ran from his right flank and soaked his shaggy fur, and as he stormed after the still-shooting riders with an aggressive roar, Leech thought the bullet could not have penetrated very deeply. 
With a speed that it would have never expected the animal, the buffalo reduced the distance to the slowest of the riders more and more, then the gigantic animal collided with its gray mare. One of its horns dug into the horse's hind leg, and with a playfully light-looking rotary motion, the buffalo tore open the animal's flesh. The mare screamed almost humanly and climbed up, the rider was thrown off. The buffalo, which had been carried on by his momentum, described an arc about thirty feet away, came back and now headed straight for the fallen one. Leonard Leach instinctively drew a revolver, although he knew full well that he was too far away to intervene. The hunter rappelled up, looked around in confusion and saw the raging buffalo rushing towards him. Desperately his hand groped for his holster, but it was empty. His colt must have gotten lost in the fall. Leech saw the panic creep into the man's gaze, then the buffalo rammed him at full speed and one of the arm-thick horns bored into his abdomen just above the crotch. The beast took the man with it and for a second, as an expression of primal triumph, it raised its head to the neck, whirled the helplessly wriggling man back and forth and threw him into the dirt like a doll. The hunter was still alive, tried to get to safety with dislocated limbs, but there were none. Again, the buffalo described a wide circle, pulled a cloud of dust behind him, let the crawling one see what he was doing. Then he was with him once more, trampled over him and this time the hunter did not move. Leech could see the man's blood running down the horn when the animal finally let go of the dead man and, obeying its primal instinct, set out to follow its herd. This one had disappeared a few seconds ago along with the hunters in a hollow, but Leech could hear that shooting was still going on. Slowly he followed the trail of dead and wounded animals with his eyes. Of course they would come back to get their prey. The monster eater went to the dead man in peace, looked at the body for a while, then sat down on a dead buffalo and waited for the hunters. After a little while he noticed a movement. The injured gray mare trotted slowly back to her unfortunate master to spare her leg and stopped at a few steps from the corpse. Certainly she was waiting for the man to get up again. Loyal animal. He went over to her. The hunters now had one horse too many and an injured mount was better than none at all. How many do we have? Seventy-eight skins, one hundred and seventy-four horns, and more meat than we can transport. Did you send out Hodges and Smith to steer the carriages here? Yes, they just left, but they won't be back before noon tomorrow. Okay, we have enough to do anyway, with the skinning and all. What are we gonna do with Fairman's body? Let's take him away so his wife can at least give him a decent burial. She will hardly recognize him. Nevertheless, wrap him up in his blanket so we don't have to stare at him all the time. And tonight we're gonna let the hat go around. Okay, Mr. Carson. The man who took his instructions left, the other stayed and turned to Leech. And now to you. What the hell are you doing out here, alone and with a saber for a crutch? Leech was monosyllabic. On my way to the East Coast. I have work to do there. My nag broke his leg, so I have to run. Jake Carson examined Leech. I patch, pale, clothes torn and full of old, dried blood. Someone who was hiding something, someone who was perhaps dangerous, no doubt about it. But anyway, the man was alone, and sometimes it was not wrong to have a dangerous man with him. Is that a cavalry saber? Are you a soldier? Deserted perhaps? That was a long time ago. Honorable discharge. Sergeant. Then marshal. Now freelance. Hmm. You don't look like she has enough dollars to buy the gray mare from Fairman. Leech stopped stroking the mare for a moment and thought of the priest's silver necklace he had with him, but immediately discarded the thought. Maybe this strange artifact was his ticket to the Miskatonic University. He could not possibly exchange it for the horse. No, I don't look like I can pay for the horse. And I really can't. Carson pondered for a moment, then he said, Well, Mr. Leech, 
in a few days we'll be passing Fort Hunter. I will feed you until then. We have enough meat. You may ride the mare, provided that you make yourself useful and do not chicken out before unpleasant tasks. And keep peace with my men, understand? Thank you, Mr. Carson. Leech lowered his head slightly. Jake Carson waved him off. Keep the scavengers away from the buffaloes tonight, which we have not been able to dismantle until then. Yes, Mr. Carson. Leech turned away and Carson left to help his men skin. Leech thought about Carson and his troop. When they had not yet noticed him, he had removed the eye patch and looked at their auras. None of them was a beast and therefore could not serve him as food. That was the first thing he had checked. Afterwards he had looked at the men a little longer and had been astonished. None of them was particularly aggressive or violent, at least not apparently. And this, even though they had ended so many lives in the last twenty minutes. Apparently the hunt, if you wanted to call this carnage that, was really just a way for them to earn a few dollars. He began to treat the gray mare's wound and one of the hunters told him in passing that her name was Snowflake. The buffalo had saved most of its anger for man, it seemed, because the wound was not very deep. Leech cared for her as best he could, brushed Snowflake's fur out and rubbed the animal. He then had a lasso given to him and helped the hunters as much as he could despite his weakened condition to drag the buffalo bodies lying around everywhere into a pile, using his saber now and then to give the coup de grace to animals that were still alive. No, not like that. Through the eye. Do not make a hole in the coat more than necessary. Think about the dollars. Pierce through the eye. Leech obeyed and his efforts were thanked in the evening, because while buffalo meat was roasting on two fires, one of the men, a guy named Svensson, gave him his spare shirt and offered him a bottle of whiskey. Leech gratefully accepted both. Keeping the scavengers away from the shop buffalo in the dark was easy for Leech. His vision was still slightly blurred, but he still noticed the coyotes and birds of prey and the other animals much earlier than a normal human being would have been able to at night. What made his task even easier was the fact that the animals also noticed him and seemed to perceive his otherness. He did not even have to reach for their consciousness, they circled around this banquet attracted by the smell of carrion and repelled by it, or rather confused by its presence, he did not know for sure. But none of them dared to approach him or the buffalo. They would probably stay hungry tonight. This thought brought him back to his currently most urgent problem. Damn it! He picked up a stone and threw it at a coyote. He put a tiny bit of his red in the litter, although he should not have done so, starved as he was. He shouldn't waste his strength, but it still felt good. The stone hit the animal with force on the chest and the coyote howled. As Leech watched the coyote howl as he left, he thought of Miranda Harper. For various reasons. Leech still had his hunger under control and knew from his experiments at the beginning of his time as a monster eater that he could hold out for a while. Maybe he was a little irritable. At some point the sun came up again. The hunters woke up, one by one, and Leech curled up in their place in a holy blanket to catch up on a few hours of sleep. He only woke up shortly before noon, but none of the hunters seemed to resent it. He left the breakfast that had been left for him and threw himself into work with the other men. Hides had to be stripped and cleaned and meat had to be cut up. Much to Leech's relief, not much was said and towards evening the carriages and teams of oxen that had traveled behind the riders of the hunting troop finally arrived at the camp. Each of the companions was manned by two men, one holding the reins and one with a rifle, whose job it was to look out for possible dangers. The coachmen were at least as sunburned and weathered as Carson and his men. They welcomed the newcomers with loud howling, because the carriages not only had the task of transporting the prey away, but also brought new supplies. Tonight, Jake Carson said to Leech in a good mood, let's have another good time and leave for Fort Hunter in the morning. Sounds good indeed, grumbled Leech, 
who had already toyed with the idea of simply sitting on the gray mare and continuing his way on his own. But this way there was no need to become a horse thief. How big is Fort Hunter? Carson pondered briefly. Hmm. I estimate about 120 men. Good news, Leach thought, as Carson had gone on to supervise the loading and also to do the job himself. Among the 120 men there would certainly be one beast, probably a werewolf or another predator hybrid. This variety was often found among soldiers. The binge that Carson had announced was not as excessive as Leach had assumed. There was liquor and beer and plenty to eat, but each of the men was eager to leave early the next morning, so consumption was limited. In the fort we can make or exchange some meat and skins for money. The rest is then smoked and salted there. On the way home to Scranton we can fill up the free space on the carriages with new buffaloes. If we don't find any more, it doesn't matter. We have made good booty. Carson was satisfied and his men cheered him on. Leech, who, in order not to attract attention, had choked down some beans and buffalo meat after all, found no sleep because of hunger, because of real hunger got up and relieved the man who had the carrion guard that night. He walked up and down nervously and was happy when they finally left the next morning. Carson and he rode at the head of the small troop, while the rest of the men in loose chains flanked the carriages. Leech was relieved that Carson did not resent his taciturn manner and refrained from engaging him in conversation or questioning him. Around noon, with the prairie stretching seemingly endlessly before them, Carson pointed to a cloud of dust on the horizon. This herd must be huge. Leech discovered the dust cloud at the edge of his field of vision and turned his head. Yes, he just said, and Carson went on. It's a pity that we are already fully loaded, otherwise we could. Wait a minute, what is this? There, a little bit behind the herd. Leech tried to discover what the man next to him meant and when he had finished, he said, that's smoke. Yeah, it sure as hell looks that way. Is that the fort? Leech was worried. No, it's much further east, we can't see it from here yet. Leech nodded once to indicate that he understood, and then again to the distant, tiny column of smoke compared to the dust cloud. Shall we ride up and have a look? No, too dangerous. You may be an adventurer, but I have an obligation to my people. They and their families. They reached the fort in the early afternoon of the next day. They were spotted from a great distance by the sentries on the palisade ramparts, and as they approached further, the gates opened outward, spitting out a welcoming committee of about forty men galloping toward Leech and the hunters. Carson gave signals to stop and together they awaited the soldiers. They rushed directly and in formation towards the retinue, just as one might expect from the cavalry. The hair on Leech's arms straightened up when he felt the earth vibrate under the horse's hooves. Carson was also impressed, but still he turned to Leech. Well, that brings back memories, Sergeant, huh? Leech looked away. The soldiers were led by a dashing young man whose dusty but otherwise impeccable uniform gave him the rank of major. At the last possible moment he bridled his animal and came to a halt in front of Carson and Leech, while his men, also dressed in blue uniform, circled the caravan. Just like in a textbook. Ah, Carson, it's you. The colonel sent us as escort for the last mile. Having some trouble at the moment. Good afternoon, Major Silvers, tapped Jake Carson on the hat. Have the chariots full of meat. May I assume we are welcome? Why, certainly, Mr. Carson. However, the colonel is not in the best of moods. The dirty redskins raided a stagecoach station. We saw the smoke. What tribe? Does it matter? They all look the same. The major's gaze scanned the baggage train, stuck on Leech and his cavalry saber for a second, then turned back to Carson. New guy? Yeah. Fairman got it. 
didn't pay attention. Shame. Yes. This seemed to say it all. The major turned his horse and the troop, which had grown to about three times its size at one time, started moving again. The fort was tactically well placed. Its palisade walls enclosed the only hill within a radius of several miles, a circumstance that made it possible to quickly detect any enemy from any direction. The mounted soldiers in their blue uniforms joked with the hunters and it was noticeable that they were looking forward to stories of hunting and buffalo meat. Leech himself was patterned from a respectful distance, as if they sensed he was different. Like the coyotes at night. Until now, he had not yet dared to take his eye patch aside to take a closer look at the soldiers. If someone should discover his wolf's eye, it would quickly be over with the camaraderie that was shown to him. He also regretted that he had given his name to Carson. That had been stupid, but now it could not be changed. As they trotted towards the fort, he imagined how his wanted poster would flutter all over the palisades and how he would be surrounded by countless men upon arrival. Much to his relief this was not the case. The whole retinue dismounted, and first the horses and oxen were freed from their burdens and watered. The soldiers were housed in stocky barracks and there was a separate stable for their horses, while Leech and the hunters had to find a place for themselves in the open air. But that didn't bother anyone. The men were glad to finally have walls around them again, shielding them from the dangers and the vastness of the prairie, even if it was only for a short time, and the walls were made of wood. So the hunters spread out across the courtyard, into sheltered corners and under the verandas of the stables, barracks and storage buildings, sat together in groups and let the bottle circle. Leech himself had found a spot opposite the largest building he thought was the officer's quarters. Towards evening his assumption was confirmed. Accompanied by Major Silvers, a man about fifty years old stepped out of the building and walked straight towards Jake Carson. He held himself straight as a die and his temples were already graying. The two greeted each other and then strolled together across the courtyard. When the group of three got closer to him without paying him any special attention, Leech could tell from the uniform, which the man wore much looser than the other soldiers, that it had to be the colonel. Jake Carson and the colonel apparently negotiated the price of the buffalo meat and the conditions for processing it, while Major Silvers dutifully trotted behind them. Leech watched them negotiate for a while, then his stomach started to rumble. He looked around. Work was going on all over the fort, and those who were not working were absorbed in conversation or fiddled around with small cooking fires. Could he dare? Once again he made sure that no one was watching him, then he pushed his eye patch aside by a tiny amount. What his auric vision showed him shocked him beyond all measure. All the men he could see, it had to be around eighty, every single one of them was a human being. Damn it. How could that be? So many soldiers, and not one beast was there. Not one. No one with whose flesh he could satisfy his hunger. Yes, yes. There had to be more, in the buildings, yes, definitely, it couldn't be any different. So many people, and one of them was certainly a beast, yes, certainly. Right? Or not? Leech? 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 Are you okay? What? Yeah, 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 thanks, I'm fine. Jake Carson stood in front of him and looked at his face with narrowed eyes. Most men are happy to be able to enjoy the protection of Palisades for a few days again. But you look as if you've just aged ten years and found that you can't get it up and you're constipated. Are you sure everything is all right? Yes, yes. It's all right, Mr. Carson. I. Ah. Uh, was probably on my own for too long. All these people here. All right. But gather yourself, man. The colonel invited us to dinner. Make sure you wash and rest a little. Dinner, Leech thought grumpy. Great. 
Colonel Redbone received her on his porch and led her over the creaky wood into the interior of the house with a pompous, elegant gesture that did not at all match his sloppy uniform. The ceiling was quite low, which didn't surprise Leach much. Wood, especially construction timber, was a precious commodity out here in the prairie and was therefore used very sparingly, especially for purely functional buildings such as a fort for the cavalry. The furnishings, however, were absolutely appropriate for a colonel's rank, even though Leach did not believe that this man cared much for pomp. The furniture in the entrance area and in the dining room was beautifully crafted and seemed to come from the old home. Heirlooms perhaps, or loot from the villas of the southern states, Leach appreciated. The flag hung proudly and just behind the chair at the front of the table where the colonel was seated. Mr. Carson, Mr. Leach, please sit down. He pointed to two free chairs on either side of him, while Silvers, who had entered the room just behind Leach, was already about to sit down opposite the colonel, which earned him an angry look. Ah, uh, yes, sir, thank you, sir. My name is Leach. Mr. Carson has already told me that. Did you serve, Mr. Leach? Yes, sir. In the cavalry? Yes, sir. Redbone nodded. Her saber caught my eye. What regiment? The Hampton, sir. After Brandy Station I joined the infantry. Really? Why is that? Internal difficulties, sir. My commander has signed the petition with a kiss on the hand. Carson pricked up his ears. Finally he learned a little more about the taciturn man he had taken into his group. Silvers played absently with his fork. Ah! A troublemaker then. Sir? Well, never mind. The war is over, and we're managing the rubble, aren't we? For a brief moment, the colonel seemed to travel back in time, then he smiled bitterly and watched Leech for a long second. Then his body stretched and he clapped his hands loudly and audibly. Leech turned jerkily in the direction of the sound that was made when a door opened in the wall behind him. Relax, you're not on the prairie anymore. This is just dinner, Silver smiled. Yes, the colonel picked up the thread. Nothing special, I'm afraid, but it'll do. For women in almost identical clothing carried plates with pots and bowls on them. The colonel and Major Silvers watched their every move very closely. None of the women raised their heads. Leech looked over to Carson, who caught his gaze and looked away again shortly after. The women wore hoods to hide their hair, and to Leech's astonishment, a kind of veil of thin fabric. One of them stepped next to him to put a bowl of potatoes on the table and he noticed that the skirt she was wearing had been cut open in the middle from top to bottom. The fabric gaped apart as she bent over and revealed a streaked, blue-stained buttocks. Major Silvers began eating as soon as it was on the table. Redbone frowned again, but said nothing and shortly afterwards officially opened the dinner with a small gesture. Carson took a bold approach, while Leach considered how he could reduce food intake to a minimum without being noticed. As the last of the women was about to leave the room towards the kitchen, Silvers raised his voice and pointed to one of them. Stop, not you. Pour us some wine, and then get my cigars and port from my room. At his temple a vein was throbbing. The colonel bridged the sudden silence that followed Silver's words by addressing Carson. You have made good booty. Yes, sir, we were very lucky. It is very gratifying that you can take so many buffaloes off our hands. Well, Carson, I guess you and your people really had double luck. The last two supply coaches have unfortunately not reached us out here, so we have increased demand. Jake Carson sensed a deal. Sir, we still have two covered wagons with other goods and equipment with us. What do you lack? No need, Carson, chewed the colonel. We'll deal with the problem ourselves tomorrow. A few Cherokee have settled down nearby. In the beginning they were quite peaceful, 
but then they became quite fast overconfident, you know the savages. Not only did they intercept our supply deliveries, they also burned down the stagecoach station. Unfortunately, we were too late to hold those responsible to account, let alone help the staff. Cherokee? Leech asked. Yes, as far as one can say with certainty. Red is red, isn't it? Well, in any case, we know where they are stored and we will visit them tomorrow. When was the last time you rode with the cavalry, Mr. Leech? As I said, sir, Brandy Station. You're welcome to come along if you get itchy in your fingers, Leech. What do you say? To the old times and in honor of the flag? Leech hesitated before finally answering. I think not, Colonel. I, I've outgrown the uniform, I think. Fiddle dee dee. Once a soldier, always a soldier, Leech. But all right, as you wish, I just thought you might welcome a little diversion. Pa. My cup is already empty again. Squaw, come here and fill this up, you cunt. The woman, who had followed Silver's orders and stopped in a corner of the room with her eyes lowered, shrank and Leech slowly began to understand. Why hadn't he noticed this earlier? He could only attribute it to the gnawing hunger in his bowels and the slight nervousness he felt around the colonel. The women. They were Indian women. All of them. Even Carson, who until then had also paid no attention to the women, now raised his head. Squaw. Oh yes, the colonel grinned and let a hand disappear in the folds of the cut skirt. She flinched. We've had our share of run-ins with the redskins lately. He grinned spitefully, took a sip of wine, and then went on talking. Of course, as good Christian people, we try to alleviate the suffering of the savages. We have taken in the widows. At the moment we have a good dozen of them in the fort. We instruct them in our customs. I took the liberty of choosing a few for you and your men. You should not lack for anything. After all, you are good citizens and welcome guests and after all, man does not live by bread alone. The colonel seemed really friendly for the first time that evening. No, Leech thought. No, he does not. But no matter what he thought of the colonel and this Major Silvers, he soon had to get something to eat, something real. With uneasiness he remembered the herd of cattle he had put down when he had been starving the last time. Something like this was not allowed to happen to him here. Eventually, dinner was over and the colonel dismissed Carson and Leach, not without again announcing their participation in the punitive expedition planned for the next day. I'll think about it when the time comes, Leach had hummed and Redbone had let it go. Surely he still wanted to devote himself to the one or other squaw, as some of Carson's hunters did, as he could see when he stepped out on the porch with his benefactor and the colonel had bid them farewell. The Indian woman did not resist but still she was held by two men one of them was Svensson, who had given him his shirt while others took turns at her. Her eyes were staring into the night sky. And so he wonders why they are attacking his supplies, Carson murmured half to Leech and half to himself. They could ban it. Carson started rolling a cigarette and also offered Leech some of his tobacco. Yes, I could but then I would hardly get good men together for the next hunt. My command here is only temporary. Leech had a light, nodded to Carson and went to the corner where he had spread out his sleep roll, the sleep roll of Reginald Burns, to be exact and lay down and pretended to be asleep. In truth he listened. Listened to his hunger, his conscience, the laughter of the men and the quiet whimpering of the squaw. After a while it became quieter in the fort, the amusement had come to an end and the men around him slept for the most part. Only the guards on the palisades spoke quietly with each other now and then. Leech stood up. There just had to be a beast for him somewhere. It had to. It was dark enough now, he thought, that he could push the eye patch aside a little bit, a tiny bit, without the risk of being exposed for what he was. 
the buildings and shelters of the fort lay before him as bright as day. Avoiding the casual glances of the guards was not particularly difficult, as the men either dozed off standing or, if they did not, stared outside into the night. First he went to the soldiers' barracks, crouched down along the raw wooden wall, until he could peer into the interior through a sloppily hung window. The auras of sleeping men. Two of them dreamed restlessly and one of them began to move under Leech's gaze, as if he could feel him resting on himself. No beast among them. After he had stalked up to the second barrack, he found the same picture there in a different version. People, people, people everywhere and nothing to eat for him. That could not be true. Should he sneak out of the fort? Steal a horse? And then what? What other possibilities did he have? The latrines? The storage rooms? The ammunition depot? Yes, that was good, that would surely be guarded. Maybe one of these guards was a beast? He was not allowed to lose his temper here in the fort under any circumstances, not to give in to his urge to kick his teeth into raw meat. He became dizzy, and he succeeded in suppressing a budding. He staggered, supported himself on the barrack wall. The animal, the multifaceted animal was there, pushing itself into his brain. It hurt. His back slipped along the wood to the ground, grabbed his head, his wolf's eye throbbed and then the pain was gone. The multi-face wavered in ever-changing shapes before his inner eye, sending him emotions of incomprehension, of blindness, of indignation. Then it suddenly disappeared, and in its place appeared ghastly figures, demons with bloody claws and horse heads with sharp teeth and pulsating muscle strands and decaying, hairy skin. They surrounded Leech's dream self and the ensuing fight was short and merciless. Leech's spirit welcomed him, rejoiced in his own savagery, and at the end of the fight the horse creatures lay torn to shreds and bruised in their own blood. Leech watched his ego rip the head off one of the demons and, accompanied by an animal triumphal roar, lifted it up and caught the dripping blood with its mouth open. Leech perceived all this within a very short time, saw it as through a kaleidoscope. Then the images were blown away by a gust of wind that wasn't actually there and Leech was left alone in the black plain that the many face chose as the site of her cryptic dialogues. He was alone and with one foot already back in the real world, noticed that he had stopped breathing, gasped for breath and tried to stay, tried to call the many face, roared his questions into the mental void for the thousandth time, demanded explanations and answers and for the thousandth time the many face eluded him and when his will was exhausted, he regained consciousness. Headache. Blood in the mouth. His. The multifaceted animal had wanted to tell him something and it had to be important, because it had never visited him before when he was awake. Not a particularly pleasant experience, he thought, and spat out some blood. Dazed, exhausted, and still hungry, he dragged himself back to his sleeping roll, but it took him a long time to rest and fall asleep, and when he finally did sleep, his dreams had teeth. The lower ranks were the first to begin their daily work. Leech watched them. Feeding the horses, mucking out the stable, changing of the guard, quiet, rough joking of the men, Major Silvers took the morning roll call. He had not felt the need to put on his uniform jacket and looked as if he had been drinking hard until a few minutes ago. The men of Carson's hunting party were also already on their feet, and set about rolling the raw buffalo meat and the salt that Silvers had brought them in two large barrels. Leech admired their thriftiness and the efficiency with which they carried out their work. It was not the first time you did this. Jake Carson spotted Leech on the palisade waved and then came up to him. Mr. Leach, this is for you. It's not much, but the boys and I have decided that you should be compensated. Leach reached for the dollar notes and put them in his pocket without counting. I don't suppose I could buy a horse for that, could I? Carson smiled regretfully. Unfortunately, no. The way I see it, you have two options. 
they take part in the punitive expedition and capture a horse from the Indians, or they work with my people until they have earned enough to buy Fairman's gray mare free. My offer stands in any case. Think it over. Thanks, Mr. Carson, but I really need to get to the East Coast as soon as possible. The West is not. Downstairs, a small commotion arose when the door of Colonel Redbone's residence blew open with a wooden bang and a squaw came running out, the colonel close behind her. The woman was naked and bloodied. Catch that little cunt again, and then put her in the stable with the others. Carson frowned disapprovingly when the order was immediately obeyed and two eager men dragged the squaw across the square, seized. It took quite a long time until they returned from the stable. The colonel looked around satisfied, nodded briefly at Leach and Carson, then went back inside. How long has he been doing this? With the squaws? Carson shrugged his shoulders. Since I've known him. Why that look? Where are their warriors? I can't see any, Leach asked as he bridled his mare beside the colonel's horse. He had ridden along with the punitive expedition of about eighty men and now they were watching the tents and the cooking fires from a hilltop while waiting for the men to get into attack formation. The colonel laughed. Yes, that's right, Silvers, where have all the warriors gone? Do you have an idea? Silvers, who came trotting close behind Leech, sounded cheerful when he answered. There can be no more than a handful when they tried to burn down the fort last week, we took care of most of them. I haven't seen any bodies, Leech objected. Oh. We let them take her. When they bury their dead, they have no time to concoct new devilries. The colonel spat out. And now let's get the rest. Silvers? The person addressed took a small trumpet from the saddle and the wind carried the attack signal far into the country. Go, Leech, go. Time to swing the saber. Redbone and Silvers galloped away, and eighty men did the same. Leech's mare also wanted to run away, was restless and wanted to run with the herd, but he held the animal back. Down below the Indians had heard Silver's trumpet. Seventeen men came out of their tents in confusion. The colonel didn't give them a chance. Leech pushed his eye patch aside to see if there was a beast down there. He had a box seat. The Indians fled in panic to the left, to the north and from his right side the hunters approached. The three bravest horsemen directed their animals right into the middle of the camp and fired in all directions, while most of the troop stayed behind the fugitives, targeting the backs of their heads. The shot ones remained in the dust of the hunt. The shouting and roaring of the animals was deafening. Children, women, and men were equally put down. At the moment, the riders were only interested in wounding as many as possible in the smallest space and shooting them without being able to escape. After only a few seconds the air was filled with the smell of blood and the painful sounds of the Indians. Of course, Leech thought, that's how they maximize their success. On the way back to the fort Leech rode at the end of the troop. The colonel was not interested in further talks. He had called him a coward a disgrace to the flag. Leech had to smile. In front of him, eight naked squaws dragged themselves along with lassos around their necks, which the colonel had let live, and the soldier, to whose saddle the ropes were tied, tried not to ride too fast, although the colonel had ordered to hurry. Redbone wanted to be back at the fort for dinner. When they arrived, they were greeted by rejoicing. The colonel was proud to have lost only two men, only one of whom had been hit by a tomahawk. The other one had simply not been a very good rider. Colonel Redbone gave a pathetic speech for the two, which Carson and his men also listened to devoutly. Then he had schnapps served and the women handed around. Leech kept himself apart. As he watched the hustle and bustle, he thought of the burnt-down stagecoach station. Yes. Maybe some desperate men would do such a thing if they had no other way to get revenge. 
and perhaps, if they were particularly brave, they would also attack a supply convoy guarded by soldiers, which was intended for the fort and whose route passed through their territory. But maybe this was all just a pretext for Redbone and maybe the Indians had only planned to bury their dead and then finally leave the place that had cost their tribe its existence. An Irish-born soldier played the fiddle, men roared and the laughter of Silvers and Redbone blew in. Leech's hunger was almost unbearable. Hey, Silver, tell me, did you hear that? The two men supported each other when they stumbled into their quarters. No, I didn't hear anything, Colonel. Shall I get some more of those fresh pussies right away? She can't get it up anymore anyway. And neither do I. The colonel stopped abruptly. San Esi Mal, Silvers, is it really bad when you do it with these animals? Isn't there a word for? Silvers also stopped in the middle of the movement and thought hard. Yes. Yes, sir. The word is sesotomy. Then you're a soda tenant, Silvers. Yes, sir, and you too. Leech could hear their drunken laughter as he entered Silver's bedroom at the back of the building. A flag hung on the wall above the bed and on the small bedside table was a Bible. Gee, good night, Silvers. Be proud of yourself. Yes, sir, you too, sir, good night, sir. Silvers opened the door to his chamber and entered. Damned liquor. Where is the lamp? Good evening, Silvers. Leech's saber pierced Silver's neck, slipped through to the hilt, and the monster eater was surprised at the ease with which this happened. A gurgling sound escaped Silver's throat and before he could hit the floor and make a noise, Leech had grabbed the dying man and laid him down on his bed. Silver's mouth moved silently and his eyes followed Leech's movements as he involuntarily groped for the blade in his throat to find out what it was that was inside him. Leech sat down on the bed next to the man, as a father would do with his child, just before the lights go out in the evening after the bedtime story. He reached for Silver's hand, took it in his own. The major was far too confused to resist. You know, Silvers, sometimes you should follow your dreams. Yesterday I had one that was very... interesting. I didn't understand him immediately, as I have to admit. But now, now I think, I know what he wanted to tell me. Silvers tried to follow the words, but he did not succeed. Nevertheless, he nodded slowly as best he could, as if he could avert his fate by doing what the man with the yellow shining wolf's eye expected of him. I'm glad it worked out, the one with her neck and the saber, I mean. They can't scream, but they still get a little bit. Then Leonard Leach put the major's hand to his mouth and bit off his little finger. He chewed extensively, almost devotedly, then swallowed the porridge of meat, skin and thin bones carefully and waited. Please let me be right. One breath while Silvers twitched on the bed next to him, making ridiculously feeble attempts to snatch Leach's crippled hand away. One more breath. Then Leech, weak, much weaker than usual, felt far back inside himself how his starved body took on the flesh. He almost laughed and cheered euphorically. Silvers? I love to eat you, Leech turned to his victim again. You and the Colonel. Part 6 Blood Toll Leonard Leech had left Fort Hunter three days ago. He had not bothered to explain anything to Carson. Useless. Pieces of silvers and redbone were still in his saddlebag. He would, if he was thrifty, get by with it for a few weeks. The squaws were a different matter. He had not wanted to take them with him, they would only have stopped him. If he had freed them, where would they have gone after the colonel had wiped out their tribe? Chances were good that once the death of the colonel and silvers had been reported, a new commander would come to the fort one who was not a human beast. Perhaps they would be released. Maybe not. After all, he had ended the reign of Redbone and Silvers. Should others clean up the debris? He had to grin. 
he almost felt sorry for the poor bastard that had found what was left of Silver's and Redbone. He had left the heads on their respective pillows, the genitals in each other's mouths. He had also swapped the holes. He would have liked to think up more humiliating games to taunt the two beasts, but he didn't want to take too much time. He had taken the arms and legs with him, wrapped in woolen blankets. After the celebration the colonel had ordered on the occasion of his glorious campaign, it had not been very difficult for Leech to steal two horses, knock down the drunken guards at the gate and the saddlebags full of meat and ammunition leave the fort behind. Not to mention the contents of Redbone's safe, which he found open when he attacked the colonel in his bedroom. The scumbag deserved every second of the suffering and panic Leech had caused him before he finally let him die. Anyone. The vault contained the fort's payroll, and so, from that time on, he was anything but penniless. Leech was still overwhelmed by the energy pulsing through him. At last he was able to command over his powers again, though not in the way he would have been able to if his two victims had been real, genuine beasts. But something had distinguished them from normal people, and this something he could extract from their flesh and store it within himself. He thought of the vision with the horse demons. He had correctly understood the polymorph. Even humans could be beasts and they could sate him. Not like a banshee or a werewolf would have done, but it worked. But one thing was absolutely clear. He would continue to be hunted, probably even more vehemently than before. Unlike in plain view, he had not been seen, but the cavalry would certainly need some talking if they were to get hold of him. At least Reginald Burns and the crazy preacher were no longer a problem. Perhaps, he thought, he should have done it more cleverly, taken more time in Fort Hunter, but the hunger had simply been too great and his anger even greater. But it was the way it was, and at least he was finally on his way back to the East Coast. To Arkham. About Miskatonic University and the answers he was hoping for so much. The only other way to escape persecution would have been to kill every single person in the fort. He doubted that he would have been able to do it, and even if he had, Jake Carson and a few of his men and some of the other soldiers had been all right and didn't deserve to be shot by him. Also not, if they were cowardly fellow travelers and duck mice. If you wanted to go after that, you would have to exterminate almost the entire world population. Apart from that, his red and green were not inexhaustible and if he used too much of them, the rejuvenating effect would become weaker and weaker, which would reduce his chances of passing as someone else. Between the fort and its current location, Leech had destroyed every telegraph pole he could find. Maybe this way he could delay his pursuit and gain some time. Time he would probably need in Arkham. He hoped so much to find answers there, to learn more about the beasts that walked the earth about their origin and about himself. The many face had appeared to him only once since Fort Hunter. It had visited him in a dream and communicated its satisfaction with him. At least that was how Leech had interpreted the dream. In a few miles distance a tall, slender structure rose up in front of the slowly setting sun. Another telegraph pole. There he would rest, cut the wires and incorporate a piece of kernel. A week later Leech had chosen the most expensive hotel, the most expensive barber and the most expensive saloon in town. After the torture by the priest, the deprivations of the prairie and the events at Fort Hunter, he just wanted to feel clean and not be bitten by fleas or other insects. Interestingly, his telepathy seemed to work only with mammals, best of all with horses, dogs and cattle, and generally with animals that were used to receive commands from humans. At least that's what he suspected, and then added in his mind, and that only if the commands are simple and supported by images. On the way here he had practiced with the horses and taught them to take care of themselves outside the city, to avoid people and to wait for him. He didn't want anyone to take a closer look at the brands. Although he had overburned it on the second day after his escape from the fort, he had not done so well, and so he had walked the last miles to Stockbridge, torn down and dirty, but his pockets full of dollars. 
the first thing he did was to adapt his wardrobe to his new fortune. Two sets of dark clothes made of noble cloth, even with vest, new boots, new holsters for the two revolvers, a pocket watch, and, last but not least, a new eye patch. Therefore he was not surprised when he was invited to play poker in the saloon on his first evening. He had not taken all his money into the city. About two-thirds of it, along with his meat supplies, was buried a few miles outside the city between the roots of a gnarled old tree. Of the third he had taken with him, there was enough left for a decent game and if he lost, it would be no drama. He narrowly bowed before he sat down on the free chair and placed a bundle of dollar bills on the table in front of him. The evening was not yet very far advanced and the men were happy about the new player. A young blonde man sat there, and under normal circumstances Leach would have immediately identified him as the loser of the evening, but the pile of money in front of him on the table told a different story. Leach admonished himself not to judge too quickly. To the right of the blonde sat his exact opposite. The man was rattled and scarred by age, but his formerly black hair and beard were still full and not yet covered with gray everywhere. The third man in this motley crew was a strong Irishman, who could be seen to have gone to sea once. Pockmarked and weather-beaten, he looked like a dumb dock bat, but Leach noticed the calculating intelligence in his eyes. It was the skinny old man who first spoke. To whom do we have the pleasure of speaking? Leach smiled friendly. My name is Howard, he said, tapping himself against the hat. And who am I playing with tonight? The young man here is Billy Sanders, the one with the fat arms, says he's the Earl of Dublin, but nobody believes him. I'm Doc Rogers. Doc? You are a doctor? Practice only rarely. Shall we begin? The Irishman spoke up. Hope you're pocketing more money than what's on the table in front of you. Of course, your grace. Leach showed him and the Earl of Dublin grunted contentedly. They played until late into the night. Billy Sanders knew his way around the cards, but he was not a strategist, he was more of an impulsive player, and so his cash grew and shrunk several times from almost zero to quite considerable and back again. Doc Rogers was already a completely different caliber. He quickly gave up a leaf if he didn't like it from the start, even if Leach would have thought it was quite decent, it would have been his. The doc seemed to be more concerned with the evening itself, with the excitement, the banter and the company, and he seemed determined to play in such a way that the pleasure lasted as long as possible. From the red-haired Earl of Dublin, Leach called him Eodian spirit, he didn't quite get the hang of it. But after a while he realized that he was losing very small amounts, if any, and his stack was steadily growing while everyone else's stacks, including his own, were steadily shrinking. From time to time Leach scratched his eye patch to get a quick, blurry view of the auras around him. Nothing special. He had completely forgotten what a carefree evening with beer and cards felt like and he was surprised that he could enjoy it so much. He decided to take advantage of this fact and ordered a round of beer and stew for himself and his new friends. Secretly, he hoped that the interruption that spooning the stew would bring would make for a casual conversation. He wanted to know about the surroundings, about Stockbridge, wanted to hear gossip, even if he did not intend to stay long. Unfortunately, only Doc Rogers was in the mood to chat and tell a little about the most curious and remarkable cases he had treated in his active time. Most of the anecdotes were of a cheerful nature and ended well for the patient. With the last one, however, he was interrupted from the neighboring table as soon as he had started it. Let it go, document. The story is bad enough. Don't ruin the evening for us. No offense. The doc turned to the man. Of course, you are right. Why should I spoil our evening with this? Just as Leach was about to ask about the nature of the story, Eody slammed his bowl on the table suppressed a burp and postulated that now goddamn it should be played again. Nevertheless Leach had become curious. 
From the first sentence the doc had said before the interruption, he had picked up the name Bohannon. He would ask the doc about it again later. What now followed was a streak of bad luck like Leach had never experienced before. Seven leaves in a row had started very promisingly. Often only a single card was missing to turn a very high hand into an unbeatable one. Accordingly, Leach made high stakes, but the card that should have completed a full house, straight, or foursome was denied him each time by Fortuna. After he had lost a considerable amount of money for the third time, he began to become suspicious. It had always been Eodi who had won the pot at the end of the round. But no matter how closely he watched him, he could find nothing in the Irishman that would have justified his mistrust. The same applied to its aura. The man was just damn lucky. Anyway, I still have enough money. As if to prove his suspicions about Eodi were wrong, Billy Sanders won the next two rounds and the one that followed went to Doc Rogers, leaving Leach with just enough money to play one last game. It was his turn to deal and he could hardly blame anyone else for the cards he dealt. They were not so bad, he found out when he picked them up and turned them around. He watched the faces of his fellow players. Billy Sanders frowned strained, as if trying to decide which combination options to play. The doc sighed theatrically and threw his cards face down on the table. Only Eody grinned over both ears. He had done that before, Leach remembered, and he had bluffed and lost. Leach selected the two cards he wanted to swap. He was more than satisfied with the new cards he received. A street from the seven to the jack. That was a good way to work. Billy Sanders had exchanged three cards and did not look happy at all. If you did that, you were hoping a little too much for happiness, Leach thought. Billy had not had one. He fit, and with that, there was only Eody and Leach. The Irishman did not seem to pay the slightest attention to his cards. He had pushed his hand together and tapped lightly, slowly but continuously, on the tabletop while examining a spot on his own hand. Leech followed his gaze with his eyes. A mosquito had taken a seat on the hairy paw. When she sank her trunk into Eody's skin and began to drink, the Irishman stopped tapping, put down his leaf and struck. Without taking his eyes off the little bloodstain on his hand, he said, I'll raise you twenty dollars. Then he looked up and checked Leech with a cool look. This turned over his pitiful cash assets. I only have thirteen left. Well, one I, I guess I win. But wouldn't that be detrimental to the tension, and wouldn't deliberately creating such a situation be a move that would not suit an Earl of Dublin very well? To win in such a way, Leech tried to worm his way out of the situation. Yes, indeed, the doc interfered with a grin. Extremely unaristocratic. The Irishman also grinned. Nice try by you too. The Earl is willing to accept Mr. Howard's two beautiful revolvers as compensation for the difference. But be warned, Mr. Howard. Either way, I can only win this round and I am telling you this now out of pure chivalry. Leech pondered. He did not want to part with his revolvers. He would probably be able to get new ones the next day without any problems. But he still didn't feel comfortable with the thought of being without weapons. Apart from that the weapons were worth more than seven dollars. He thought about it further. Wait a minute. He put his new spurs on the table, a lapel pin and his pocket watch. The Irishman looked at the object's board. Sterling silver? Yes, sir. Good. Let the watch be the watch if you don't want to part with your guns. Leech began to tinker with the chain to unhook a fine piece of European engineering, as the salesman had assured him earlier that day, from the chain. Aha! The chain is part of it. What would I want with a watch without a chain? You have already won so much money today, you can afford your own chain. Damn it, Leech thought. He had thought it a good idea to carry the strange necklace Father Sinclair had used to cut him off from his powers, 
so that he could always keep it in mind. At the same time as a reminder to always be on guard and as a reminder that there were other people in the world who knew more about the beasts than he did. He also liked the idea of disguising such an artifact as a simple watch chain. The best place to hide a book is a library. Excellent idea. Now he could not row back without losing face. Mr. Howard? I'm getting tired slowly and don't want to wait much longer. Could we uncover then? Fine, leech side and place the watch and chain in the middle of the table. Well, then, the Irishman grinned and reached for his cards. One little moment, my good Earl, the doc interrupted him in his action. With an amazingly nimble movement, the old man grabbed the watch and looked at it closely. Billy Sanders, who had stayed at the table out of courtesy and because he wanted to know the outcome of the game, the Earl of Dublin and Leonard Leach watched Doc Rogers carefully slide link by link through his fingers. The Doc almost seemed to be in a kind of trance, but finally he looked up jerkily. I think our Mr. Howard here has a certain past tied to this piece of unique blacksmithing. Dear Earl, would you allow me to provide the missing seven dollars for Mr. Howard? In case you lose the game, Mr. Howard, you can surely pay me back the money within a week, right? Yes, of course. Leach wanted to say, but Eody was faster. No, document Mr. Howard is neither the first nor the last to lose an heirloom on the poker table. I have shown enough patience, I think. We're going to uncover now. Half an hour later he was standing at the bar with Rogers and the last drinkers of the evening. Thanks for sticking up for me, Doc. It's a shame you lost, Mr. Howard. And clever of you to take part in this Earl of Dublin theater. He does not take it well at all when he is told that there is no Earl of Dublin. Many a person has had to leave a few feathers there. But he let them get away with it, Leach said, sipping on his whiskey. Where did you get that necklace, if I may ask? A remarkably fine work, I must say. The old man stared at Leech with disquieting attention. The monster eater tipped the rest of his whiskey down in one go and theatrically pulled his face to gain time and not to betray his facial expressions. Someone gave it to me. A preacher. He had a great influence on me at that time. Are you religious, Howard? No. The two men thought for a second, then they burst out laughing. Not so tragic, document. The Earl will surely give me the opportunity to win her back. But another topic. That Bohannon story you were interrupted with earlier, do you still want to tell it? The doctor's expression darkened. I don't know, Mr. Howard. It is not a particularly cheerful story. Our table neighbor was already right. Are you sure you want to hear them? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead, document. I am not made of sugar. You don't make that impression either. All right, as you wish, I'll get started. He cleared his throat. Last night a young man was found dead, Dan Bohannon. His father, old Bohannon, discovered him after the boy did not return from the privy. Somebody shot him taking a shit. A bad end. That, and much too soon. But it was not quite like that. He was not shot. Someone or something bit his carotid artery. Leech was suddenly wide awake. Blood drinkers or vampires. But if he asked if the corpse had been sucked dry, he would inevitably admit that he knew about such things. He didn't want that, even though he liked the old doctor. Instead he asked, Do you know anything more specific? Could it have been an animal? A puma, perhaps, or a bear? The sheriff has summoned me as an expert witness. It didn't look like one animal to me, more like several. Rogers took a sip. Even though the cause of death was probably bleeding to death, the poor guy's entire body was marked by bite wounds. One calf was almost eaten away and the intestines were hanging out of the abdominal wall. 
I suspect that this happened when the young man was already dead. At least I hope so. Leech nodded. Many animals then. A pack of wolves perhaps? The individual bites were too small to be from wolves. And the wounds. The edges were frayed and bruised, apart from that wolves generally make some howling when they hunt. The family that was in the apartment building should have heard this, at least one of them. But according to the sheriff, nobody heard even the slightest noise. So he didn't scream? No. Whatever killed him must have hit him in the neck with the first attack. Did he leave the toilet door open? Could be. It was already dark and such a toilet does not smell very good. I guess that's right. So you and the sheriff are completely in the dark? The dock sighed. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. But that is not all. Tonight, about 24 hours ago, the dock said after looking at his own pocket watch, Colin Bohannon was found. He sat on the bench at the train station, a bottle beside him. Even in the middle of a huge pool of blood. He, too, is completely torn and bitten to pieces. Animals in the middle of the city? That is rather unlikely. Probably true. But it is said to have already happened. What about traces? No traces. No paw prints. No slogan. No urine. Apart from the excrements of the dead in each case. But with all that blood, there should be. Yes, exactly. With all that blood, there should be at least a few paw prints that could point us in the right direction. Anything. But there was nothing. The two men were silent with each other, and Leech ordered more whiskey, even though he already had to lean slightly on the bar. So no leads, then? No, no marks, said Doc Rogers and reached for his glass. However, there is someone who claims to have seen something last night. A drunk named Wu. A drunk and a Chinese on top of that? Yes, unfortunately not a witness a sheriff likes to believe. In this case, however, it is almost completely irrelevant. Why is that? Because he claimed they were rats, Mr. Howard. Rats? Yes, rats, big as dogs. He said knee-high and four feet long and with eyes as red as the devil's. This is how he expressed himself. Leech shook his head. Even if there were such animals, the missing traces suggest that he saw ghosts. Maybe too much moonshine? Well possible, but Wu admits without hesitation that they were ghosts. For after they had done their deadly work and abandoned their sacrifice, he says, they vanished into thin air as they left the scene of the event. Bip! The doc snapped his fingers. Disappeared from one second to the next. But that's bullshit. The swinging doors of the saloon were opened and the heads of all those present turned towards the source of the sudden noise. A large, pot-bellied man with a star on his chest pushed two cowboys aside who were too slow to voluntarily avoid him, took a few steps into the saloon and looked around searching. Another Bohannon asked Doc Rogers as he ran after the sheriff with Leech, who had not wanted to stay behind, in tow. No this time it's a Bohannon. Lizzie. Does she even count as Bohannon anymore? The old man has abandoned her. Perhaps he pushed her. But what the heck, birth name is birth name. Where is she? Where could she be? In her room in quick shot of course. Her John got it too. Same injuries as your brother's? What do you think, Doc? Leech who had listened to the words with great interest, took the floor. Big family, the Bohannons. The sheriff, who seemed to be aware of him for the first time, stopped and turned to him. He had obviously been torn from his sleep because he had pillow marks on his face, as Leech could see at close range. You could say that. Seven boys and four daughters. Five boys and three daughters, I mean. And you are? 
Philip Howard. Ah! The sheriff checked Leach from top to bottom, his thumbs hooked into the revolver belt. Sheriff Myers. And why, Mr. Howard, are you following us? Oh, I just had a conversation with Mr. Rogers at the bar about what happened in your beautiful city the last few days, and I thought. Tattletale, muttered the sheriff angrily in Doc Rogers' direction. Then he shrugged his shoulders. Whatever. If you already know about it anyway, you might as well come along. This whole thing is so strange that a few more eyes. A side view of Leech's eye patch. One more I can't hurt. Move on now. He turned around and wanted to run, but then he paused once more. Mr. Howard, if you can use a few dollars, I'll give you a deputy star. They look quite useful and I don't have enough men for this. He made an all-encompassing, helpless gesture and Doc Rogers giggled. Oh, yeah, he could use a few bucks. The Earl gutted him pretty good tonight. The men looked at Leech expectantly, and so he agreed. The blood of Lizzie Bohannon and her suitor had mixed in great laughter. The ultimate union. It even dripped from the ceiling and some of these drops landed on the sheriff's sweat-stained hat. Definitely not a blood drinker, Leech thought, although he had been aware of this before. You got caught in the middle, the sheriff unnecessarily noted, then stepped to the bed and rolled the naked, dead suitor down from the equally naked and dead Lizzie Bohannon. Doc Rogers shouted, wait a minute. It looks as if whatever it was had eaten threw the man's back into Lizzie's stomach. Nor was the man bitten by the neck, like she and her brothers. So he must have screamed. That for sure. But this is a brothel. Here the whole night is screaming in one way or another. What about witnesses? Has anyone noticed that this time it happened in a closed room? I don't like smart-ass people. The sheriff got visibly worse temper. Nothing. Nobody wants to have seen anything. Damn scaredy cats. Besides, Howard, turn your head. The window was open. Leech walked over trying unsuccessfully not to step into the half-dried pool of blood. No canopy or ledge. How could anyone have gotten in here? Yes, that's a good question, isn't it? Downstairs at the reception desk there are two guys who control the guests. Revolvers must be handed in, and so on. They don't want to have seen anything. And the other ladies? We're also screaming at work, or drunk, or both. Silence followed these words, and except for the fact that the sheriff confiscated all cash found in the room, a thorough search of the room yielded no new findings. Sheriff Myers, the doc and Leonard Leach sat at the table in the sheriff's office. The two cells at the narrower end of the room were empty, and Myers had just sent his other two deputies back to the brothel so they might get some experience after all. Is this some kind of secret meeting? Leach asked as he turned his new deputy star back and forth between his fingers. Yeah, something like that. I think it's about time we said a few things that are not meant for the ears of the general public. You only got the stupid star because you will leave my city soon, if I judge you right. So I don't care if you think I am a crazy person or not. But if my two deputies do that, I will have to deal with it for the rest of my term and probably beyond. So you believe the gibberish of this Chinese? That they were ghost rats? I don't want to believe it, but right now it's the only theory we have. Leech stroked his chin. There is one more thing. The motif. All the dead, with the exception of the freemen, were Bohannons. Does this family have many enemies? The sheriff laughed. Doc? How many men have you patched up over the years after they clashed with the Bohannons? Oh dear, let me see, that must have been about fifty or sixty. However, the doc added, they were all brawls. The old man and his boys are roughnecks, but not gunslingers. Broken bones and knocked out teeth. Oh, doc, come on. Why don't you stop protecting the brood? 
Yes, yes, all right. I just wanted to say that the hunt for the Bohannons that seems to be taking place here has nothing to do with any of these incidents, in my opinion. Leech, who had studied the facial expressions of the two men, interfered. Has anyone ever asked the Bohannons what they think about this? Yes, of course, replied the sheriff. We were there when Dan got hit. But the old man did not want to talk to us. But I heard that he had hired men to help him fortify the farm. What exactly was that? The hiring? Before or after the first death? The morning after. At that point, he had no way of knowing that there would be more deaths in the family, right? H.M., a good question, growled Sheriff Myers. But even if he had not yet been able to know it, is such a terrible death not enough for a man to wish for more protection for himself and his family? Maybe you should talk to him again anyway. What are the funerals held here? Normally it goes quite quickly, but they have already had the bodies picked up and brought to the farm. Probably wants a private funeral service. But if he hadn't done that, we would have had to stuff the dead all in the same box. The wood orders have not gone out. No telegraph connection. We haven't heard anything from the fort for a long time. All dead in that direction. Shame. At the moment we could use a few soldiers in the city. The people become restless. This morning there were already two brawls. It was all about who was allowed to buy the last ammunition in the store from Old Emming. Leach did not comment on this. The sheriff took the tin pot from the stove and poured coffee for everyone. The damned priest was already here and announced the end of the world. People should donate more to avert it. Leech felt uncomfortably reminded of Father Sinclair in these words and involuntarily pulled a face. If old Bohannon needs men, maybe he'd hire me. Speaking of which, sheriff, how much are they actually paying me a day? Ha! Ah. I'm sure the old man will offer you at least double. But the idea is not bad. If all this continues, we will soon have no more Bohannons in Stockbridge. Do you really think you can prevent this? Oh, never mind, the fact is that in my city people die night after night and the only lead we have is the chatter of a drunk Chinese man, which is going nowhere. All that remains is the search for a motif. So give it a try. You have my blessing. Yes, you really should, Doc Rogers added. I have a feeling you have a knack for this kind of thing. Was there a mischievous grin on the old doctor's face? Yes, Howard, go. You are sure to be successful. For such things one likes to hire strangers with revolvers. Does not hurt so much when they die. Prevent more deaths, otherwise we may soon have a ghost town here. Well, I'll see what I can do. In which direction is the Bohannon farm? About eight miles southeast. There is nothing else, is easy to find. And leave the star here. He will certainly not hire you with that thing on your chest. It can happen so quickly, Leech thought, one moment a wanted criminal, then an honorable deputy, and the next moment a hired gunslinger. The Bohannon's farm was indeed easy to find, although the term farm was clearly understated. Apparently the Bohannon's owned a lot of land, which they farmed very successfully. The individual fields and pastures were connected by paths that could almost be called roads. The largest of these paths led directly from Stockbridge to the chest-high fenced area. Two men stood directly at the gate with rifles in their hands and about twenty feet behind them sat another four armed men in the shade of a crooked apple tree. The main building was one of the most impressive, largest structures Leech had ever seen in private ownership. This house could easily accommodate an extended family. Notwithstanding this fact, there were two other houses, two barns and two stables on the property. One of them for horses, the other probably for dairy cows. Men were also posted on the roofs of the buildings and Leech was sure that guards were patrolling the back of the property as well. They saw him from afar, 
he felt their eyes resting on him. Nevertheless he stopped, far enough away that they could not see his wolf's eye, and searched the area. The auras of the guards were not remarkable. All human beings, in different stages of tension. There. Wasn't there something? He concentrated, but he could not find the hint of energy he had just thought he had perceived. He covered his wolf's eye again. Maybe he was still too far away? Leech continued to walk toward the two guards at the gate, the last ninety feet with arms stretched out to the side and empty hands. What are you doing here? A powerful black man addressed him. Here your boss is hiring? True. But not you. The black man and his comrade, a red-haired fellow who could have been a relative of the Earl of Dublin in stature, eyed him from top to bottom. But, but, no need to be hostile. The matter is quite simple. When word gets out that not only Dan Bohannon, but Cullen and Lizzie as well, and especially how this happened, no one will want to hire here anymore. I may be the last person stupid enough. The two took a look at each other and Leech continued. I arrived here yesterday and today I already know about everything. What do you think will happen if another Bohannon is torn apart tonight? I tell you. At least half of your men will run away, if not all of them, and then your boss will stand alone. If he's still alive, I mean. You got a big mouth. Do you hit anything with your one eye? Leech grinned. Does it matter? I just explained it to you. You can be glad of any idiot who is willing to stand between the Bohannons and what they want to kill. If you don't want to see this, send me your foreman, or your boss, or anyone else with a little brain. The redhead turned to the black one. Let him in, Goodman. Let Bobby Lee bother him. Five dollars a day? Leech frowned disapprovingly. All right. Six. Seven and I'll race you. All right, Mr. Howard. Seven. Okay. I start today. Yes, preferably right away. Leech nodded. And where? On the back. So far only Root and Simmons are listed. Go and introduce yourself. Simmons is in command on the back. Do what he tells you. Leech circled the gigantic main house. The core building in the center was three-story, two-story wings were added on the right and left, whose flat roofs served as extremely generous balconies. On the western one of these balconies a large tarpaulin made of canvas was stretched. Two men stood under the tent that was created in this way and smoked. All in all, there might have been seventeen or eighteen guarding the area. In addition to the old Bohannon and his remaining sons. Not to forget the workers and domestic workers, if any of them are still here. The women, too, might have to be included, thought Leech, even though he had met very few who could handle a revolver, especially within such wealthy families. Women who had the covered wagon trails behind them or lived far away from the city were of a completely different caliber. Arriving at the back, he saw the two men who must be Root and Simmons. Before he went to them, he took a look at the back of the building. Window. Far too many of them, and far too many of them were completely or half open. Anything but ideal. Hey, you. What are you doing back here? Mr. Simmons? Yeah, that's right. Bobby Lee sent me. Hired a few minutes ago. What's your name? Howard, sir. Mr. Howard, Leech said politely. Yes, yes. It's okay. Strong, gray-haired Simmons had been thirty feet away from Leech and was now approaching him. He wore thick glasses on his nose and looked more like an accountant than a man who would be given command, Leech thought, but revised his premature assessment when the man stood directly in front of him and shook his hand. Terrible thing, all this. Only for those who must pay men like us. Oh, I'm not like you, Mr. Howard. No? 
No. I am not, what would you call it? Paid gunslinger? Leech hesitated. He had actually thought he was looking at an experienced veteran. The eyes of Simmons had seen much. Then what are you? Simmons smiled. I don't know, honestly. I've been working for the Bohannons half my life, so I'm a fixture in the inventory. Really? Then maybe they will listen to you when you give advice? The windows. Simmons waved off. You're not the only one with some goo in his brain. I have already mentioned this. The old man is of the opinion that under no circumstances should one back away from a danger by even a millimeter. The day I have to hide in my own house, he says, I might as well put a bullet in my own head. Maybe he should reconsider. His daughter had left hers open and... Again he was interrupted by Simmons. You should not mention Lizzie. Why? None of your business. Maybe I'll tell you about it sometime when all this shit is over. Whatever you say. Tell me, are there any men in the house? Just the old man and the boys. Look after the women, I suppose. That's right. Is there really another Mrs. Bohannon? Died five years ago. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, sure. Enough of this, Howard. They stand at the northeast corner of the fence and let nothing and no one through. Easy task. I assume you understand. Leech nodded and turned to walk away, then paused once more. What else is there? Have I not made myself clear? While Leonard Leech kept watch and waited for it to get dark, he brooded. The conversation with Simmons had not been very productive. It would probably take him a while to gain the man's trust. However, by then it could already be too late. One Bohannon died every night that didn't leave much time for research. It would be good if he could talk to the Bohannons personally, preferably to the old man. The darkness crept agonizingly slowly towards us. Before it had fully arrived, he did not expect an attack. Simmons and Bobby Lee went around handing out oil lamps and torches. Rats. Was the drunken Chinese right? What else could he have seen? Many rats, he had said. He had already read about shapeshifters and animal men mixed with rats, but with these the transformation was always halfway through, hybrid beings on two legs. Not without danger, but anything but real rats. What else came into question? Ghosts? Demons? He had hardly made any acquaintance with such beings before and that alone was reason enough for him to take a closer look at the Bohannon problem. It was a shame that all the expensive occult books he had collected were burned in plain view. Superstitious mob. He spat out and then they came. But it is not yet all night, he thought, rather surprised than frightened, when he heard the first shots from the front of the house. And then also the first screams. Leech heard fear, fear and horror but no pain. Stay at your post, he heard Simmons yell. But he did not obey. He had to see, see with his own eyes, see with his wolf's eye who or what he was dealing with. He ran off, the revolvers in his hands, the cocks cocked. It was a real flood. It was at least fifty of the red-eyed, giant rats who, unimpressed by the men's gunshots, flocked to the Bohannon house. Six of them stopped at the gate to face the black man, Goodman. He had already emptied his gun, but still tried to keep firing, his eyes wide open. Only when the first of the animals had reached him, the brave expression on his face gave way to a panicky grimace. He threw himself on the ground, curled up, tried to protect himself with his arms. Leech aimed with both guns, ready to shoot the big shots off the man but then let the revolvers drop again. Too dangerous, too far away, and then. The animals were past the whimpering goodman. But was that true? To Leech, it looked as if they were running straight through him, always in a straight line towards the house. Completely unperturbed, 
as if he were not even there. Sure of being unobserved at that moment, he wiped the eye patch off. The oars of the men showed various mixtures of fear, horror, disbelief, determination and panic, depending on the character of the individual. But the rats, they were wrapped in a pure energy leech had never seen before. She seemed almost beautiful, no, the right word was immaculate. No, neither, not quite at least. There were glaring speckles that reminded him of his own red, his anger, his aggression. And then he saw something else. Gray speckles of sadness were under the red, and fine energy lines, gossamer, transparent. Each of the animals had one of these. They started at the head and then ran, along the spines of the rats, to the back, towards the dirt road, where they united and disappeared far away. And then all of a sudden there was no more time for observations. Through the crack of the shots he heard the great entrance door of the main house blowing open. Instantly he tore his head around. Two young men appeared at the top of the small staircase leading to the house, then the face of a frightened woman, which could be seen briefly and then disappeared again as the woman closed the door behind her brothers. The two men, they had to be Bohannons, immediately started using their weapons. One carried a double-barreled shotgun, the other, somewhat older, a revolver. With the appearance of the two men, all of the demonic rats suddenly stopped and turned their heads. For a second, two seconds they stood still while the shots of the two Bohannons and the other continued to crackle. In that short time, Leech was able to observe at least three times with his wolf's eye how a bullet pierced a rat's body and carried away some of the energy that surrounded the animals. However, none of the bullets seemed to have caused any damage. The energy returned almost immediately to its original state, just as a bowstring always returns to its resting position. Then, simultaneously from all sides, from each of the vicious rat mouths a high, many-voiced screech, an evil, threatening glow in the red eyes. No sooner was the screeching over than the rats pounced on the two Bohannons. The first animal that reached the older of the two jumped off and immediately bit into his neck. The man screamed, dropped his revolver, tried to pull the animal away from him. Leech raised his weapons. The time window was small. He put some of his red in the shots, but not very much. He didn't want him to end up here like he did in the fight with the Gorgon in Plainview, where those who had witnessed his abilities had raised their weapons against him. You kill what you do not understand. His bullets hit their target, the body of the furiously wriggling beast. One lung, one spine, he estimates. But on the fur of the animal no holes appeared, no blood splashed and the rat was not thrown away screeching. Instead, she ripped the throat out of the Bohannon and ran away with the cartilage in his mouth, only to make room for the others, who came in sevens or eights or tens to make way for the man whose life was being pumped out of his throat by his own heartbeats. From inside the house, Leech could hear horrified screams. The other Bohannons were probably watching. Leech fired and fired, but his shots could not prevent the younger man from going down under the demonic onslaught. Nothing and nobody was able to prevent what happened next. The two men were literally torn to shreds by the animals. No one was shooting anymore, neither Leech nor anyone else, some were out of bullets, others were afraid of hitting the Bohannons whose bodies twitched under the bites of the seething mass and still others lost their nerve and fled. The animals were everywhere on and around the men. The older one had gone down a few seconds ago and was surely already dead while the younger one had just broken his knees and tried to keep the rats away with his bare hands. But even in this way there was nothing to be done, his hands gripped and punched through the fiery-eyed attackers, his eyes wide open. So do something. Help him. And then he too had lost his last bit of life. Leech picked out an animal and tried to feel for its spirit, as he sometimes did with his horses, and found that there was nothing there. Leech found only emptiness in the animals. Not hungry. No animalistic lust for murder. No ghost. No consciousness. 
only these strange and delicate energy lines, which emanated from each animal and ran far back along the field path and disappeared from his field of vision. Leech covered his wolf's eye again. For a few more seconds he heard bloody smacking noises, the scraping of teeth on bones. Then, as if on command, the animals let go of their victims, sniffed even though Leech was sure that these creatures couldn't smell anything, and turned their ugly heads to where the energy lines disappeared in the night. The first rat turned around and slowly began to crawl away to where it had come from and the others followed. From inside, from the house, shouts, crying screams and the curses of old Bohannon still resounded, but no one responded. For before the eyes of all men, the animals vanished into thin air one by one in the light of the torches and lamps. The cries and shouts from the house fell silent, the crying remained. All the men who had not yet fled, there were not many, among them Simmons and Bobby Lee, staring at the bloody remains of the brave, foolish brothers. The rats had not only torn out the throat of the older one, but had also separated its limbs almost completely from the torso. The body of his little brother was also terribly battered. Simmons was the first to gather and took the floor. Anyone else hurt? Leech looked around. No one else had gotten even the slightest scratch from a man who had been grazed on the calf by a comrade's bullet. The doors of the house opened, and one by one the remaining Bohannons stepped outside. Iron faces, red howling eyes, throbbing temporal veins, all were armed. Immediately the shouting started. The daughters and the youngest, Leech estimated him to be seventeen years old, wept for their brothers, while the old man Bohannon and his other son went about in helpless vengeance. Didn't I tell you to stay on the back? Simmons had built up in front of Leech and flashed at him with angry eyes. Would that have helped a bit? Leech wanted to know. Simmons said nothing. Look, Simmons, you can hire as many new men as you want, it won't help you. We need to find the reason for all this if we are to keep at least a few more Bohannons alive. For two seconds Simmons stared up at the night sky, then he growled at Leech, fuck off. I cannot use people who do not follow my orders and are interested in things that are none of their business. Simmons, I can help. If you're still here in five minutes, I'll have them shot. He threw some crumpled dollar bills at Leech's feet, turned around and went over to his employers. For a while, Leech stopped on the spot and watched his foreman get yelled at by the Bohannons. The old man's head was red and the skin stood out against the patriarch's snow-white hair. Despite his age he seemed anything but frail. Those two idiots should have stayed in the house. But Logan never listened to me, and Noah ran after him. Sadness and resignation mixed with his anger when he spoke. While Leech let his gaze wander, he continued to listen to the conversation. The men who had stayed, who had not taken flight from a sinister and seemingly invulnerable enemy, could see that they did not know what to make of all this. At least half of them, Leech estimated, would also have quit service by dawn. If Simmons wouldn't talk to him, should he try old Bohannon? No, at least not now. The man screamed and raved again. Leech's eyes fell on Bobby Lee. The southerner was one of the few who still looked halfway composed. He went over to him. That douchebag Simmons won't talk to me, Bobby. Do you want to? Bobby Lee, who had just whispered with two other men, turned to Leech. Watch out. This with these critters has started four days ago. Critters? Whatever. And it only ever hit Bohannon's. You've been working for the family a long time, just like Simmons, haven't you? Not as long as him, but a long time ago. Why? Good. The reason for all this is probably not so long ago. And there must be a reason. Do you know anything? Has anything unusual happened in the last few days? Do the Bohannons have enemies? Say something, man. But Bobby Lee just pinched his lips together and shook his head slowly. 
From behind Simmons shouted, Get the fuck out of here, get the fuck out of here. Part 7 Bohannon's Last Ride Doc Rogers and the sheriff listened to Leach's story in silence. When Leach had finished his story, the sheriff of Stockbridge stood up and started making fresh coffee. With his back to his visitors, he said, I find it hard to believe you, Howard. But unfortunately I have no other explanation for all this. Why don't you describe some of the men who escaped? There must be someone who can confirm your story. Unnecessary. Even if we find one of them. A mere confirmation of what Mr. Howard just told us will hardly solve our problem, Doc Rogers argued. Yes, but I'd feel more comfortable, the sheriff replied. Leach nodded and began to describe some of the men as best he could. If the guys are still in town at all, they are certainly in the saloons today as soon as they open their doors. This usually happens around noon. I'll ask around there. Tell me, Sheriff, is anything familiar? Anything unusual in connection with the Bohannons? Well, let's see. The boys are roughnecks, the family is loaded not only because of the farm, even if that alone would be enough. They lend money on the quiet for interest, have shares in several factories, own some basically they have their fingers in everything, even in the construction of the railroad. That was Cullen's thing. Leach took a sip of the steaming coffee the sheriff had poured for him. Suppose there is someone who can control these rats and use them to wipe out the Bohannons. Who do you think would come into question? Hmm. A competitor, perhaps? What if it is a family member? Someone who wants to influence the succession, Doc Rogers said. No. Lizzie was disinherited. This motif is missing. Could have been camouflage. Could be, but I also think it's something personal. You better tell me how to control the rats. Well, there are more things in heaven and earth than. Don't you try and cast any spells on me now, Rogers. You have already said yourself that you have no other explanation. So why not build on the idea? Ah, you're getting on my nerves, document. All this gets on my nerves. Howard, go sleep it off, and you, Rogers, go to hell and ask him a hole in the belly. I need to think. Outside, the city slowly woke up. Leach tapped his hat and wanted to leave, but the doc held him back. One moment, Mr. Howard. The doc came close to him. Listen. I know that you know much more than you admit. This necklace, you know exactly what it is, don't you? Leach did not pull a mine and bluffed. Yeah, worth a lot more than seven dollars, that's what she is. All right, Mr. Howard as you wish, but should you ever feel the need to talk, don't be shy. It can sometimes be quite lonely in our world. The doctor's words still echoed in Leach's mind as he lay stretched out on the bed in his room. Did the doc know who he was? What he was? And if so, why was he so friendly? Or was he just pretending? And the Bohannons and their disloyal staff? Simmons and Bobby Lee? he would give them another chance. In the early evening he would try again to talk to the old patriarch or to anyone who was willing to tell him anything. If he should not succeed again, well. In this case he had to wait for another attack of the rats and try to trace the energy lines, which emanated from them, back to their origin. He could not think of anything else. Could this be successful? Twenty, maybe thirty seconds the whole spook had lasted. Maybe even a minute? How far would he get in that time? Far enough to get to the cause of the evil that was ravaging the Bohannon family? He continued to rack his brains. At some point he fell into a restless sleep. It was angry, the polymorph. It raged around Leech, blowing wind in his face with eagle wings, shoving him with bare paws hissing at him as a puma, storming towards him as a buffalo, dodging at the last moment, grazing him with its massive shoulder so that he was whirled around in the empty, 
black space, only to hit hard on a floor that wasn't actually there. The animal came down on him as a gigantic owl, carried him high, high into the air and higher and higher, only to drop him again immediately. He fell and fell and fell, and the faces and incarnations of the beast raced past him. Then he hit the ground, only to get up again. No sooner was he back on his feet than the huge tail of a rattlesnake swept him off his legs again. He understood. This time he stayed down, on all fours, and waited. A cobra built up in front of him, looking at him from cold reptile eyes. It hissed and flickered, tore open its jaws, grew as big as a house, big as a mountain, threw shadows on it, came closer and closer, threatened to swallow it, and then, suddenly a rabbit, small, munching. He knocked on the ground with his hind leg. In his place a cat, a possum, a mouse, a rat, a squirrel, a deer, a weasel, then the polymorph, a bear with eagle wings and antlers, then a millipede, and again the owl, which playfully and benevolently pecked at him with its beak and looked at him with big eyes. She had knocked him over, he lay on his back, a falcon circled above him, emitted his cry, pushed down on him, and when the falcon clawed him, Leech woke up. The headaches he had were indescribable, the worst he could remember. But the dream could not have lasted too long, because the sounds around him told him that it had to be afternoon. He had not yet dared to open his eyes. But sooner or later he would have to. When he did, it was fortunately not as bad as he had expected and he managed to get dressed and stumble out into the street. As he walked down Main Street, out of the city, he replaced the cartridges he used up during the night with new ones and checked the fit of his saber on his belt. Deep in thought, he did not notice how people avoided him. He was hungry. When the tree, between whose roots he had buried his money and the remains of the colonel and those of Silver's, came into view, he walked faster. With flying hands he dug out the bundles and wrapped the chunks of meat from the blankets. The flesh of the two men, the two murderers and rapists, was streaked with madness and had already partially detached from the bones. Yet it was full of yes, what exactly was it that satisfied his hunger? When this was over, he thought, as he bit off the soft, slimy tissue and swallowed large chunks without bothering to chew, he had to get on to Arkham as quickly as possible. This damn university just had to have answers for him. The colonel's leg, he didn't know whether it was the right or the left, he ate all of it and also Silver's half upper arm. Then he waited for his headaches to go away. Two hours later he was on his way to the Bohannon estate, again with sufficient money. He had not ridden to the main gate. He had not tried to cheat his way past Bobby Lee. He sat with closed eyes in the middle of a cornfield, surrounded and protected by the tall plants, and prepared for the night. He had to practice it. If it should work, he must practice. He groped for the spirit of a vole. There were countless around him, under him and everywhere, and he chose those whose fire of life burned the brightest. He groped for her digging, burrowing and eating spirit. Then he tried it the same way he did with his horses. Nothing happened. The vole paused in its action, turned its head back and forth, it felt him, but it did not understand. Go upstairs. The animal squealed confused, but stayed in place. A picture maybe? A picture of sun and water and food? That did not work either. But I should already know all this, he scolded. The other animal, the polyface, had shown him what to do. The truth was that he was afraid of it. He pulled himself together. Again Leech searched for the ghost of the vole, scanned it, searched. Searched for what? One entrance, one door, one open window. And then he found it. The dream had left no precise instructions in him, only a vague sense of the things he should do. He had found the right spot and pressed gently against it. The vole cried out shrilly, full of fear and discomfort. All of a sudden he was through. Strange sensory impressions rushed at him, 
a new body feeling, a racing little heart in his chest, a tail beating around him, nervously wriggling little paws. He pulled back a little bit to let the mouse rest. A split second later he realized that this was a mistake. The mouse's consciousness instantly regained the space it had released and regained just enough control to feel the intruder in its own body. Shrill cries of horror, the horror that Leech triggered in the little rodent, of which he himself felt a reflected, attenuated image, strangely distant and blurred. The mouse's pulse accelerated even further, it shook, vibrated, collapsed and then Leech was catapulted back into his own body in an extremely painful way. Something he assumed that it was death, the death of the vole, had touched him, touched him and felt him. He had been close to death several times before, but this one, this was different. It was as if he felt a cruel hunger that was infinitely many times greater than his own. He was freezing, and when he had come to again, he noticed that he was bleeding from his nose. Everything felt sore. He forced himself to rest, took a deep breath and searched for the spirit of another vole. This time he did it differently. When he had found the entrance to the spirit of the animal, he threw himself against it with all the force he could muster, leaving the little animal no time to notice him, no time to feel anything. In no time he had completely taken over the mouse and she had not even noticed. He tried to walk in her body and he succeeded. Further and further through dark, earthy tunnels, he pushed himself past his conspecifics, his paws found an earthworm, he bit and swallowed it down, then further and further, always upwards and finally he saw daylight. At first he found it difficult to orientate himself in the cornfield but then he had the idea to rummage through the vole's pictorial memories and realize that he already knew the way. Soon he was on the property of the Bohannans. He saw Simmons and Bobby Lee talking to some other men and their voices were deep and rumbling. Only after a while could he understand what they were saying. Cannot be talked to. He says, we should get more men here, but nobody wants to work for him anymore. Is he drunk? No, not yet. They laid out the corpses in the entree. What is left of them? Did they at least put towels on it? Yes. Ellie has seen to that. The others are either blubbering in their rooms or running around in circles with the old man and raving. Told them to get out of here, but they don't want to know about it. Why did the boys go out tonight? Do you really think they'd still be alive if they'd stayed inside? I don't know. Bobby Lee spit out and when his slime hit the ground, it was like a grenade exploding in front of him for Vol Leech. He bypassed the foul-smelling place extensively as he scurried closer to the men, always careful not to be discovered. Probably not. Honestly, Simmons murmured. I don't know why I'm still here. I'm scared shitless. We shouldn't have done this. It's part of the job, you know that. But you'd be stupid not to have one. On the other side. Did you actually notice that the critters did not hurt any of our men? Not a single one. I definitely see it this way. If the rats show up again tonight, I will do my best, my duty. But if the other Bohannons die anyway, I'm going in the house and I'm going to take everything I can get. Bobby Lee gave Simmons a searching look. He replied. Why not? After all, in that case we would be unemployed. Simmons did not seem very convincing to Leech, more like he wanted to avoid a fight with Bobby Lee. But he didn't seem to notice. That's exactly how I see it. If all goes well after all, we still have a job. If not, at least we have enough starting capital for a new start. So you're in? Yes. Bobby Lee, yes, I'm in. Leech had heard enough. He was now sure that there had to be something, something in the recent past. Some kind of explanation. We should not have done this. It only affected members of the family. It always took place only at night. That the rats, 
like a common spook, were bound to a certain place, this idea had to be rejected. The lavatory of the farm, the train station, the brothel, and again the farm. Did these places have anything in common? Once again Leech cursed the lynch mob of Plainview. If only he had his books at hand. He scurried away from the men, with quiet, tripping steps. Out here he wouldn't find anything helpful anymore. The already huge house of the Bohannons seemed truly gigantic to him in the body of the vole as he circled it and searched for an entrance to the interior. The advice he had given Simmons regarding the windows had obviously been listened to after all, he remarked. At least on the first floor they were all closed and probably barricaded from the inside. Once again he searched the memory pictures of the vole, but it had never been in the house. He had to find a way himself. In order to inspect the windows on the second floor, he had to move quite far away from the house to get the right angle of vision. He did not have to consciously think up this insight, it came to his mind quite naturally. He was surprised how quickly he had got used to his new body. He easily snuffed out the few guards who still remained loyal to the family and continued to search for a way to get into the house. There. At the top, where the tent canvas was stretched over the flat roof of the west wing, a window was open a gap wide. How should he get up there? Yes, the tree at the southeast corner of the cultivation. This should work. The bark of the trunk was rough and cracked enough to provide support for its small claws, and climbing was hardly more strenuous for the vole's body than walking on level ground. He had just completed the first half meter, when a deafening hissing sounded, and an enormous blow in the back hit him with barbaric force. Leech was torn away from the trunk and hurled away, tearing off one of his small claws that had become entangled in a crack in the bark. Leech squealed pathetically in his vole body. Disoriented and full of pain in his bleeding paw and from hitting the ground, he looked around in panic. A cat! He could just think before another paw stroke carried him away again. He felt that his left flank was torn open and was bleeding. His mouse heart beat up to his neck. Leech tried to get his new body to calm down and find out from where the cat would attack next time. Again a hissing, a blurred shadow, big as two, no, like four buffaloes rushed towards him. Leech threw himself to the side, rolled over, tried in his panic to pull a saber he wasn't even carrying, realized that this impulse had cost him valuable time, cursed himself for his mistake, and then she had him in her paws. With one paw in his neck she pushed him to the ground, no, into the ground, while the other paw was digging around in his flesh with casual, terrible force. The blood loss made him dizzy, his eyes threatened to burst due to the high blood pressure and if not them, then one of the veins somewhere in his brain. No. 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 Then the pressure was suddenly gone, the claws of the manure withdrew from his entrails. He felt air, warm wind blowing into him, heard male voices cheering the cat, heard rough laughter. Fucking wankers. He had to get away, far away, under the ground, away into the sheltering darkness, to the other burrows, to his family, but there before him was this terrible beast, worse than the flutterers with their claw feet. At least they killed their own kind quickly. What kind of bullshit was he thinking? Dirty animal. It lurked before him, lurking for him to move. Even in the patience of the cat lay playful cruelty. He knew what was in store for him. But he still wanted to smell damp earth and eat earthworms and produce offspring and dig corridors and nibble on roots and weakness. Shin. He had to pull himself together. The stupid vole was as good as dead, and being ripped out of a dead creature was very, very unpleasant, if not dangerous, as he had learned. Leech sniffed. Corn, the blood from yesterday, Bobby Lee's snot the smell of the cat that still watched him incessantly. It became very easy for him, the pain moved further and further away from him. His consciousness diluted. The smell of his own blood. Again the thought. 
dirty animal. Anger. A moment of clarity. Finally. Like an arrow he shot his own consciousness at that of the cat. Visualized how his pierced hers, spread in her head and body, made the beast its property with brutal speed. Resistance. More, much more than with the vole. Fast and furious and devastating, he struck the wall of her will, smashed it into a thousand, into two thousand pieces, and then, finally, he had destroyed it. Again a new body feeling. Power. He was a predator. Lust. Domination. With one jump he was over the vole, which twitched in front of him and broke its neck. The men stopped laughing. They seemed disappointed that the play was over so quickly. He wondered why the doc had wanted to come along. Of course, he had helped him, had told him where he could find the Earl of Dublin at this time of day, but he was far from happy that the old man rode with him, not as long as he had no idea what the guy knew about him or what he wanted from him. It can sometimes be quite lonely in our world. Howard, if you want me to stay here, you're gonna have to knock me down. But Leech hadn't wanted that either. Where the hell are we going, Howard? To the orphanage, Doc, and we gotta get there before dark. Ah. Uh -huh. And what are we doing there? I will tell them later. Ride, damn it, growled Leech and drove his horse. The sun would set soon. To enter the house decorated with crosses and figures of saints in the body of the murderous cat had been easy. He had seen the Bohannons. Desperate, in the end. The old man stubborn and angry on the outside. The sons, the two he had left, also angry, but also full of fear. The youngest two daughters, kneeling stunned before the prayer book, and the eldest, who took refuge in pragmatism. It had also been she who had had the bodies of her brothers and sisters taken from the city and laid them out in the hall together with those who had breathed their last on their own land. When he had been strolling around the house, she had sat with the dead on the lowest step of the stairs and read aloud from a large book of fairy tales. Her face showed sorrow and insomnia, just like the faces of everyone else. Next to her was a shotgun. He purred softly as he walked past her, then scurried into the parlor where old Bohannon and his son sat in front of the extinct fireplace. They all carried revolvers and had rifles within easy reach. I tell you, that's that crazy Miller kid, that miserable brat. Why didn't you listen to Bobby Lee and Simmons? Why did you let him live? Because he is blind and retarded? No. Or at least not only. The child is scary. Babbled the whole time. Should have fucked it up like his fucking parents has no future anyway. But you've always been a wimp. Enough, it is what it is. That does not help us now. The Millers stole from us, this Frank and his cunt of a wife. Not the boy. Marcus did the right thing when he let him live. We are not heathens after all. Really? Father? We could have just reported the Millers to the sheriff. Good Christians would have done that. But we are not hypocrites. We are Bohannons. We manage our own affairs, and that is good. We have always done. And we'll take care of the boy, too. And that today, before the soft-heartedness of this one. He pointed his finger at his brother cost even more of us our lives. Old Bohannon said nothing, just stared into the cold fireplace. But why kill the child? He is just a boy, brainless to boot. He can't say anything to anyone. Damn it. You still don't get it? He does not have to. He just keeps sending us his rats until we are all dead. How do you know that? How long have you known about this stuff? Tell me, how did you kill his parents? Their throats were cut. Bobby Lee and Simmons were holding her. Why? And what is the first thing the rats do? They bite your neck. I tell you, I know a witch brat when I deal with one, and the Miller boy is one. 
we should have burned him with his parents in the house. You have seen these signs all over the walls. Signs that no man can understand are not proof of nothing. How can you be so sure? Do you have another explanation? Do you see another way? Eh? We have no choice. You have spoken of God, Father, and you. Perhaps he does not agree with our methods? Now you start out like our idiot sisters? You should have been a girl, I think. God has always been on the side of those who forge their own happiness, and whether he agrees with our methods we will see, namely exactly when the brat is dead. If then the rats show up, and only then, you are right. But in this case, this is no longer important. If God wants to punish us, then we have lost anyway. One dead child more or less is not important. All right, all right. Gather the men. You cannot be serious, father. You want to ride to the orphanage to murder a blind child? No, damn it, I don't want that. But what else should we do? Your brother is right in the end. We do not have another chance. But he doesn't know, not for sure. Do you want to see more of us lying dead in the hall? Do you want to lie down right away? The beasts do not even stop at women. Do you want your sisters to be torn apart in one, or two, or three nights from now? No? Then get ready already. We ride. That's right, father. I'll tell Simmons, Bobby Lee, and the others. How much resistance do you expect from the nuns? No, just the three of us. No one needs to know we're going to murder a child. A witch's brat. To her, it's a child. At least Bobby Lee and Simmons don't care. You dumb bastards, barked old Bohannon, did I raise idiots? Do you really think we can ride to the orphanage, walk in, pass the other brats and the nuns, shoot little Miller, tap our hats, say hello and leave without the sheriff coming panting and asking what that was all about? There must be no witnesses. Not a single one. Silence. You are right, father. We have to kill them all. Are you out of your mind? I'm not going to take part in this. Old Bohannon jumped up and gave his youngest son a hard punch in the pit of his stomach. The boy went panting to the ground. If you still want to be alive tomorrow, do as I tell you. You think I want this? There is no more time, don't you understand? The night will come, and the rats with it unless we do something. We gotta go. It's all your fault anyway. Your brother is right. You should have killed the brat right away. Now get up, you coward. Leech, the cat, waited no longer. His consciousness released the body of the animal, was attracted by his own body and took possession of it again. He started up as if from a nightmare. He felt disoriented in a way that was difficult to describe. His back and head hurt him and his nose was bleeding again, but he didn't have the time to take care of it. As he ran through the cornfield, away from the Bohannons and Simmons and Bobby Lee and their killer cat, he tried to clear his head. I must be at the orphanage before them. And that's exactly where he was now, five miles out of town, with Doc in tow, even though he didn't know exactly why he had taken him along or why he wanted to get involved in the first place. What did he care if a family of unscrupulous murderers, religious nutcases to boot, wanted to send a witch's brat to the afterlife. Would they really come? Of course they would, whether they were right about the boy or not. From their point of view, they had no choice and probably, Leech had to admit to himself, in such a desperate situation, he would be capable of such an act. Would he be able to spare the young Bohannon, the one who hesitated? He hoped so. Did the boy even deserve this? After all, he had killed the child's parents. But the other orphans couldn't help it, Leech confirmed his decision. Doc? What do you know about a family named Miller? What do the Millers have? Are we riding to the orphanage because of the boy? I know him. 
blind and dumb, not quite right in the head, but that is no wonder. His parents often sought my advice before killing themselves, I mean. Killed? Yeah, owed money to the Bohannons. When they could no longer repay the loan for the farm and were threatened with seizure, Miller burned himself and his wife, along with the house. Bad thing. The little one was found, together with the farewell letter, in the dirt in front of the well. Why do you ask? It wasn't suicide. Yes, of course. The two were found side by side in the marriage bed, or what was left of them. No bullets, no tracks. The meat is burned from the bones. You must have been damned desperate. Did you see that yourself? No, I only examined the bodies later. One of the deputies was the first one on site. It wasn't suicide. Well, let's just say you're right. What? Oh. Yes, oh. That's right, ride faster, we have to get there before the Bohannons. Dreamer, muttered the Doc and Leech pretended not to hear anything. Doc, I'm staying outside. You are known here. Get the nuns to bring themselves and the children to safety. Young Miller too? Do you want to keep him awake or do you want him to sleep? I could give him something. I don't give a shit. Wait, why do they ask that? Damn it, Howard, don't they know anything? It is obvious. Leech bridled his horse in front of the orphanage and looked at Doc Rogers with a mixture of perplexity, confusion and astonishment. Doc? Who are you? Don't pretend that you don't know about all this. Hypno-manifestation. Don't tell me you've never heard of it. Otherwise the missing footprints at the scenes of the rat attacks cannot be explained. Ah. Uh -huh. Time's running out, Doc. Leech turned to face the riders who were behind them at high speed, followed by a mighty cloud of dust, heading for the orphanage. They were only a scant mile away. In you go, Rogers. Now go on and watch out for the Jesus bitches. Leech sat down, took the Winchester out of the rifle pocket on his saddle and instructed his horse to wait behind the large church-like building until it was all over. He took aim at the riders while the dock behind him hammered on the gate of the orphanage. The Bohannons had brought along five other men besides Bobby Lee, Leech recognized, who had pushed his eye patch aside. They were all masked, but he could identify some of them by their auras. With a hint of relief he realized that Simmons had not come with them. Somehow he liked the guy despite everything. They too must have seen him by now, but they made no attempt to reduce their breakneck speed. It hurt Leech's soul when he decided to first take aim at one of the front horses. But at this distance it was the safest target. The Winchester barked in Bobby Lee and his animal went down, rolling over. The other murder burners returned fire with their revolvers, but the bullets buzzed past Leech and smashed into the orphanage's brickwork, due to the insane speed at which they continued to charge at him. He might have had enough time to shoot two more times. Then he would have to move if he did not want to be ridden down. While he took aim again and put another ball on the way, he made a decision. He would try what he had also tried with Reginald Burns and his people, and what had been prevented by Father Sinclair's strange magic. A bullet tore meat from his upper arm. Leech closed his eyes, concentrated, blocked out the pain and sent a picture to the Bohannon horses and their henchmen. An enormous conflagration, which went out from him and raced towards the animals, hissing furiously. He heard the panicky name even before he opened his eyes again. It had worked. Three of the seven beasts shied and threw their riders off, two others could no longer evade and collided with their frightened conspecifics. Old Bohannon was also thrown off. The chaos was perfect. The young Bohannons had been able to stay in the saddle and reached Leech who threw himself to the side at the last moment to avoid being trampled under the horse's hooves. They rushed past him and had to restrain their horses hard not to crash against the facade of the orphanage, 
which gave Leech time to reach for his green and heal the wound in his arm. The ball was pressed out of him by the regrowing flesh and rolled down through his sleeve. Without much feather reading, he put a bullet in the head of the youngest Bohannon, who was jumping out of the saddle with a knife in his hand. The lad got his foot caught in the stirrup and the fleeing, frightened horse dragged him behind him. His brother, who was still busy turning his mount, had just as much bad luck. Without much haste, Leech raised his gun and shot him twice in the back. The first bullet shattered his shoulder blade, the second severed the nerves in his spine at the level of his stomach and came out the front. Then the Winchester was empty and Leech dropped it to draw his revolvers and turned to the fallen riders. Two of them lay motionless in the dirt, one of them half buried under two horses. One crushed the man's skull under an iron hoof as it tried to stand up again and again. This was also attempted by old Bohannon, who must have seen Leech kill his last two sons. He fired three shots in quick succession at the monster eater, whose wolf's eye glowed evil. He missed him. Leech wondered if it was the tears or blind rage that made the man miss before he in turn raised his guns and put two bullets in the patriarch's kneecaps each time. The three henchmen, who were still alive, reacted very differently to their employer, who was screaming in pain. One turned and started running, another, a black man, shot Leech in the left hand. The bullet tore away Leech's revolver, along with his ring and middle finger. Leech cried out in pain and with two furious blows to the chest of the person responsible for this. The third one let himself sink to his knees and threw his gun away. The monster eater looked around. At the moment none of his enemies posed any danger. Old Bohannon rolled on the ground screaming, and the one who surrendered had also decided to flee when he realized Leech would not shoot him immediately. Leech halted his remaining revolver. Then he picked up the one that was lost to him and did the same to him. His fingers were beside it. The priest's brew was no longer effective. So they would not grow back on their own. He picked it up and looked at it for a second before he started to clean it on his trouser leg. When he had reattached it to his hand, with the help of his green, the old man's cry had turned into a whimper. Leech drew his saber and joined him. He made the injured man see how he put the fallen horses out of their misery, one by one. Then he knelt down to the patriarch and cleaned the blade on his jacket. Why don't you just kill me now, you son of a bitch? Leech looked at him long and calmly. No. No, I don't think so. I'm going to go in now. He pointed to the orphanage behind him. And sing a lullaby to a blind child. And when the child is asleep, I will go to the window and look out. And then I will see you. You and the rats. Leech stood up. Bohannon had his eyes wide open in horror and began to crawl away from Leech, stammering confusedly. But, but. Where are you going, Bohannon? With these words he drove the saber blade through the old man's left calf and deep into the ground. The last Bohannon wouldn't crawl anywhere. Epilogue Doc Rogers shoved a beer over the table for Leech. There was not much going on in the saloon in Westford. Tomorrow we will reach Arkham. And you actually want to introduce me to the university? Of course, although I probably don't have to. You probably only have to knock and take off the eye patch to make people listen to you. Leech laughed barking. Yeah, either that or they put me in a cage to study me. The old doctor also laughed. This is also possible. But either way, this chain is more sensibly used where it is now. You do not need it as a ticket to the Miskatonic. Leech took a sip, then nodded. As long as the nuns make sure the boy does not take them off, the Bohannon women are safe. A dreamer. Why do you think he drummed about rats? He's probably very scared of them himself. They were silent. Um, Mr. Leech, tell me. Do you have enough food for your first time in Arkham? It will last a few more days. 
but you do not need to worry about that. I'll be fine. Yes, yes, Mr. Leach. It's just. The university is not just about people. You should avoid eating the staff. Are you serious? But okay, don't worry. I will leave the staff alone as long as I get answers. He winked. Now tell me, document. Why did you leave there at that time? Maybe I'll tell you this story some other time. Do you feel like a game of poker? Part 8 One Grid and Two Ghouls The Great Hall, deep down in the seventh basement of Arkham University, was bathed in dancing brightness by countless candlesticks, torches, oil lamps, and fire bowls. Most of the approximately 100 chairs were empty. In the midst of the chairs, Leonard Leach and Doc Rogers stood in front of the impressive carved desk behind which the heads of the University of Arkham were enthroned. We saw our wolf's eye, Mr. Leach. Please cover it up again. The pale, blonde girl who had spoken was not a pale, blonde girl. She was a black fairy and much older than her childlike appearance would suggest. The question we must ask ourselves is whether your intentions are morally sound. If we allow you to study here, you will undoubtedly gain access to knowledge that we feel responsible for applying. The fact that you are quite an interesting creature, a fascinating freak of nature, is not enough in my opinion to accept you. Even if Dr. Rogers vouches for you. A short break. Yes, I see your disappointment, Mr. Leach and I understand it. Nevertheless, I am in favor of granting you, Mr. Leonard Leach, only limited access. The lower scriptures can perhaps increase your knowledge, quench some of your thirst. Study them and practice patience. Let time show whether you are worthy to attain even greater knowledge. The brawny, black-haired Italian who sat next to her nodded in agreement. With your permission, dear Countess, I will compile a selection of writings that I consider suitable for the aspirant to begin with. Then he turned to Rogers. Good to have you back, Nathaniel. We should empty a bottle or two later. It would be a pleasure, nodded the man I was talking to almost solemnly. Then a pale giant with long, almost white hair and a full beard took the floor. Leech, who had quickly identified the Italian as a werewolf, could see that the white-haired man was not a normal person, but he had never encountered such an aura before. He could not tell what kind of beast the man was. There was also another person behind the desk. She hadn't said a word yet, played with a curly strand of her hair and had her eyes fixed on Leech the whole time. A succubus. Now she leaned aside and whispered something into the werewolf's ear. He nodded slowly before raising his voice again. Mr. Leach, hear the decision of the leaders. We hereby set a seven-year probationary period. During these seven years you will be granted limited and controlled access to the resources of the University of Arkham. You are not allowed to attend lectures, but you may study certain writings that we release for you. Don't worry, Mr. Leach. Even the limited selection will keep you busy for more than seven years. During this time, you must provide for your own living expenses and donate one-third of your earnings to the university. Again the succubus whispered into the ear of the werewolf. A word of warning, if you get into trouble with the law, you stand alone. The university is dependent on the goodwill of the human authorities and will cooperate fully with them if necessary. So if you have something to settle, settle it. And discreetly. Apart from that, you are of course forbidden to eat members of the university. Under death penalty. That applies everywhere. On the premises of the Miskatonic and also outside our walls. Did you get that? The threat in the werewolf's words was blatant and sounded grim, which Leech was not surprised to hear, since he hadn't concealed the fact that he had already sent many of the Italians' conspecifics to the afterlife and given them a higher purpose his survival and generally didn't think much of them. I have understood. Thank you, Leech said formally, 
but his tone of voice left no doubt that he was not particularly happy with the outcome of his hearing. Very good, Mr. Leach. Do you have any further questions? Yes. When can I start? Again the superiors of the Miskatonic University consulted each other. Then the old, blonde girl raised her voice again. We will send a messenger to a hotel of your choice tomorrow, during the course of the day, with the list of books released for you. You may study up to four works at the same time. In addition, there is a loan fee of $200 per book. This is to be understood as a pledge and should make clear to you how precious the knowledge is that you can gain here. Approach your studies with understanding, with reason and zeal and treat our property with care. Leech swallowed. Isn't that a little too? The girl raised her finger in a warning, a gesture that Leech would have expected from an old governess. No, Mr. Leech, no, that's not too much. We will meet here again in a year to review what you have learned. If you pass the exams, we will perhaps, perhaps, extend your powers. It depends on you. And now remove yourself. Get settled in the city and don't make trouble. Addressed to the doc, she added. Nathaniel? If you would stay for a word? Back in his hotel room, Leach was far from satisfied with the results. It felt like a failure, despite the enthusiastic intercession the doc had made for him. It felt as if a door, through which he had to go at all costs, had been slammed shut right in his face, locked and the key thrown away. Yes, you may play, but only if you are good. But what did he expect? He had been naive. A probationary period of seven years. Oh, you can do that as long as you do what we tell you and give us a big bag of dollars. But well, he said to himself, I will find ways and means. On another level, he was probably grateful for the sermon he had just listened to. Trouble with the law. At the moment his entire cash position consisted of what was left of the Fort Hunter payroll. Not necessarily little, but seven years? Never would his dollars last so long. At least not if he wanted to maintain a certain standard and pay the outrageous tuition and loan fees of the university. He set himself a deadline of one week. Until then he wanted to find a way to increase his fortune without having to take too much time off his studies for this purpose. He would probably have to move out of the hangman's and soon, to some cheaper room. However, it would probably be better to rent his own small house, which he could furnish according to his special needs. But one thing at a time. For this evening he had arranged to have dinner with Doc Rogers and assumed that it would come afterwards to the one or other round poker and to the one or other drink. Until it was time, he could take a closer look at the city. The air was humid and hot like a syphilitic whore. A musty smell wafted from the Miskatonic, on whose shore the town nestled, bringing thousands and thousands of mosquitoes with it, which plagued Leech and the other inhabitants of Arkham. Ignoring the insects as best he could, he strolled along Church Street. He had to get new clothes, again, and a visit to the barber was more than advisable. And not only because he stood out here in the city like a wolf in a flock of sheep, and these sheep, without exception all the sheep, the dirty and the poor and the rich and the perfumed stared at him, pushed themselves fearfully past him and bleated quietly and stupidly behind him. He stopped and observed the goings-on around him for a moment. Somehow he had to succeed in not attracting attention. Not that the bleeding would bother him, but he was wanted for murder. For multiple murders. And for cannibalism. Ironic, considering that when all this started, he had been hunting cannibals himself. Oh yes, and he had stolen property of the U.S. Cavalry. He looked down on himself. Damn it. How stupid did you have to be to still walk around with a saber on your belt under such circumstances, with your name engraved on the blade? He would have to get himself a frock coat, like the one the man across the street was wearing. The one who walked by there with his fiancée or his wife on his arm. 
Maybe one of those hats with the ridiculously small brims? The monster eater went on and looked for a tailor. He entered the first store that displayed textiles in its shop window. He was the only customer who was there at this afternoon's time and was promptly served by a small man with a bald head who introduced himself as Quince and seemed to have no interest in being addressed as Mr. Leach announced an order for three sets, and while he was being measured by the busy tailor, he described the exact size and position of the extra pockets he wanted to have attached. He also ordered a double-shoulder holster that would hold his revolvers and also had a leather sheath for his bowie knife. Yes, the frock should be cut slightly wider under the arms. No, don't deliver, he would pick up the stuff. Tomorrow? That would cost extra. Never mind. Quince, who hadn't fallen out of his servant role once while discussing the special requests, looked up to Leach when he asked him which barber he could recommend. Go to Billings, sir. Leonard Leach took the instructions he had received from Quince to heart and followed the road further east. The barber's business premises should be located to his right, between East Church and Baptist Church. And so it was, even though Leach would never have suspected a barber behind the dirty glass. The words haircut and shave had been scribbled on the rotten wood of the door with chalk and in clumsy letters, Leach recognized on closer inspection. He casually killed a fly that had settled on the back of his left hand. He opened the shabby door and entered the store. It seemed to be a family business, and Leach was surprised that the interior of the premises was not only clean, but shining and glowing with cleanliness. Mrs. Billings greeted him with a friendly smile, while her husband, after giving Leach a friendly nod, continued to pull his blades over a leather in monotonous, even movements. The lady of the house pointed to the armchair, and Leach accepted the invitation. She stepped behind him and gently pulled his head to her chest. What's it gonna be? Leach looked at himself in the mirror. No wonder people had been staring at him. Oh dear. Smooth, please. The hair after a cut usual here, but not too extravagant or in need of care please. Leave the sideburns. She nodded to him friendly over the mirror, while her husband's actions continued to make scraping noises. So you're planning to stay in town for a while? For now. Nice. Then let's see us turn you into a civilized human being. She spread a large white cloth with a practiced waving in the air and let it float down on his upper body. Afterwards she tied both ends behind his neck, being very careful not to catch any of his hair. Something, an undertone in her words, had made him sit up and take notice. But by then it was already too late. The cloth was pulled tight with relentless force and Leech could no longer breathe. In the mirror he saw his own face and the ugly, distorted face of Mrs. Billings. At the same time, Mr. Billings jumped forward, a wooden club raised to a blow. Leech groped for his weapons, in fact he wanted to do so, but the cloth not only cut his neck, it also pressed his arms to his body, with the laws of physics defying force. He reached for his red to call out his anger, but a milky white veil lay over it, making it pale and weak, and he couldn't reach it. He reached for his green to make his body more resistant, but a white veil lay over it, making it pale and weak and he couldn't reach it. The beating hit Leech on the head, his eyes blurred. Do not give up. He was not allowed to give up. He searched for the auras of his attackers, the blow had made his eye patch slip, but the mirror didn't let him see the auras, instead he saw Mr. Billings pull the beating up again noticing his own blood that seemed to be absorbed by the dry wood. Leonard Leach woke up late at night. His skull roared and countless mosquitoes had attacked his defenseless body. Had stung into his skin. Your poison pumped into him. Drank his blood. He almost wished to get back to the carriage, back to Father Sinclair. If only the itching would stop. With difficulty he brought himself into a sitting position, looked around and then down on himself. Apart from his pants he was undressed. 
They had taken everything from him, even his boots and eye patch. Instinctively, he listened inside himself and the horror hit him completely unprepared. It's red. It's green. His auric vision. They had also taken all that away from him. As if from his senses, he groped around his wolf's eye, making soft sounds of fear and only calmed down when he had convinced himself again and again that both his eyes were still in their sockets. Only after a while did he notice that although she had taken away his auric vision, he could still see in the dark. What an idiot he was. He was obviously not an Arkham anymore. He felt for the wound on his head. The hair was sticky, the scalp split open and swollen. He could see light shimmering over the hills, and he heard the miskatonic flow. They had not taken him far away. Slowly, in order not to lose his balance, he stood up. The ground beneath his bare feet felt burnt and lifeless, and no one seemed to be around. Also the unpleasantly sultry wind that had blown the mosquitoes into Arkham during the day seemed to have abetted. The air stood still and smelled of decay. He became dizzy and sat down again in the dust. He was probably still too weak to return to the city. He was thinking about dinner with Doc Rogers. Would he look for him? Would the Doc ask his way through, follow his tracks back to the predatory couple? Get them to confess what they had done under threat or use of violence? For sure, they had thought he was dead or not. They had known that he would come. Or not. How could she have taken away his red and green? The priest's silver chain, may burn in hell, had only worked as long as Leech wore it. He no longer wore this disgusting white cloth, but instead it now lay heavily and somehow tenaciously on his powers and separated them from him. Why didn't he notice earlier that there was something wrong with the billings in their store? As soon as he felt a little better, he would return to Arkham and let them pay. Yes, and then he would take Quince the tailor. Son of a bitch. But he had to be discreet. He had to get used to dragging a trail of corpses behind him. Scorched earth where he walked. For him there was only Arkham. Just this one chance to get answers. Or should he shit a big pile on the Miskatonic University? Get your answers by force? These four fucking beasts behind their wooden desks ganged him as if he were a schoolboy. He would tear them up and bite them and devour them and... And then he would laugh long and a little mad. When he finished, he looked up at the moon, which bathed the desolate landscape in a sickly light, making it look even more rugged than it probably already did in daylight. Whenever he thought about the events of the last years, he found himself in a deep pit, full of thick, heavy mud. A morass of helplessness. But he didn't want to go in there now, and so he stood up for the second time. He had to take care of the more urgent things first, no matter if his skull was buzzing or not. He walked a few steps, stumbled over sharp stones sticking out of the ground, slashed his foot. The mosquitoes attacked him again and their bites made him more and more aggressive. The light, the breeze of light towards which he was moving, became stronger and the vegetation increased. If one wanted to call what was growing here such. Crippled, starved and dried out looking shrubs and trees were more likely to crawl across the ground than to stand out from it. Leech dragged himself along. For an hour he put one foot in front of the other and imagined what he would do with the billings if he got his hands on them. Then. Something. Leech paused and looked up. The moon seemed to have wandered no further in that hour in which Leech had agonized, and no animal had crossed his path. No bird, no rabbit, no jackal, just those damn mosquitoes. And the trees. All of a sudden they stood so dense and left him only a path that was getting narrower and narrower on which he could move. He turned around. It seemed to him as if they were moving together behind him, just outside his attention area. An indeterminate feeling of threat grew in him. An assault that was aimed at his life or his possessions, with that you couldn't scare him much, but this area could, and in a way he couldn't grasp. 
Goosebumps made him shiver. He walked towards one of the trees and put his fingers around an arm-thick branch. Using all his strength, he tore at it and finally succeeded in breaking it off. A branch was not a saber, but it was better than nothing. At least now he felt a little more defensive, a little less naked. He walked on, careful, attentive, and after another half mile he was sure. The sick trees with the crippled limbs led him. The only question was, where to? Did they lead him toward a specific target or just around in a circle? Something moved, a shadow, always at the edge of his field of vision, intangible, but always with him, close to him. As he walked along the path, he tried again and again to catch a glimpse of the presence, but he never succeeded. He did not know how long he had been walking, stick in hand, fingers cramped around the wood, as the path widened in front of him. He seemed to have arrived where they wanted him. A hollow lay before him, a hollow in front of which he now stood, and whose side opposite him ended in a wall of sharp-edged rock. It was three men tall, and in its center was an oval hole about the size of a man. For a second Leonard Leach lost his determination and he turned around, wanted to go back, wanted to choose another way, but there was none. Behind him, as he could now clearly see, the trees moved and grew together into an impenetrable wall of trunks and thorny, pointed branches. The bottom of the depression seemed marshy and wet. Deeply it went through Leach's mind. A slime-covered throat, deep and greedy. That's where he should put his bare feet. He shivered at the thought. Resigned, he turned once again to the wall of trees. Hundreds. They would not let him through. So what choice did he have? Someone or something apparently wanted him to go into this cave. If he wanted to find out why, he said to himself, he had to do so. He gripped the stick tighter, so tight that the bark under his grip crumbled, and took a first, careful step. His feet immediately sank ankle-deep into the mud, but contrary to his fears he was not immediately pulled down and swallowed up. He was covered in sweat all over when he finally reached the cave entrance. Not even the mosquitoes dare to come here, he noted with a mixture of relief and discomfort. The first steps, the first minutes in the rock were determined by narrowness and anxiety and apparent shortness of breath and fear. His wolf's eye allowed him to see where he went and crawled and crawled. Nevertheless, he soon lost his orientation. Constantly the walk changed direction, often he had to climb, often he had to duck and crawl. Countless scratches, caused by the sharp-edged rock covered his body when the passage finally became wider and allowed him to stand upright. Cool, mold-sporty air blew from the depth of the cave to him and gave him some relief as it gently, it seemed to him, stroked his skin. He followed the passage further down until he reached a fork. To the left or to the right? He had not yet been able to make up his mind, was still too busy stretching, wondering and taking deep, careful breaths when a noise could be heard from the left tunnel. A rumble, followed by a deep rumble that rolled in from further down. Leech looked at the stick in his hand and decided to take the tunnel to his right, but not without scraping a mark in the cave floor with the stick. This passage also led further and further into the depths. Soon Leech noticed a change in the rock. The floor became smoother, and in a way that is difficult to describe. Almost as if thousands of bare feet had walked here long before him. A breath of old size, a reflection of. Yes, of what? Part of him surrendered to this feeling, this hunch, and another part found it amazing that he could perceive such things even though these Billings people had taken away his auric vision. Then he realized that this part of him, the one who was receptive to such things, had nothing to do with what he had gone through in recent years but had always been in him. This part was ancient and it existed in every human being, he assumed, in every living being on this earth. When the cave walls gave way to roughly hewn masonry, he had lost all sense of time. Curious, but still cautious, he looked at the large cuboids. They had nothing in common with the craftsmanship he had seen on the buildings in Arkham. 
Or is it? Didn't they remind him of the deep underground vault of the Miskatonic University where the High Council had found about him? Was this cave connected to the university? Leech walked a few steps further and a tingling sensation came over him. Something in him seemed to change. He listened within himself, tried to find out what it was, directed his wolf's eye inwards, scanned the black plane in which the many face used to appear to him. There! A touch of red, a tiny glimmer of green, he could only see the bright colors when he tried hard, but they were there. They were there again. Did the milk-white spell that the Billings had cast over him were off? This is how it had to be. He started to collect the tiny color fragments to be able to access them faster. Then he used a little of the green to suit the pain of his countless scratches and the miserable itching of mosquito bites. It wasn't enough to make the wound on his skull throb, but Leech was so relieved that he hadn't lost his colors once and for all that he hardly cared. A little more confidently he continued on his way. The masonry changed again. The roughly hewn cuboids gradually gave way to seemingly unworked rock, but the boulders, in their arrangement, must have been set by human hands and they had primitive paintings that reminded him of those he had seen in the Indian cave. A fierce smile twisted his lips as he thought of Vargas, the werewolf. His father, whom he had eaten and shat out again. In passing, Leech stroked the paintings with two fingers, but nothing happened, or if it did, then something else that contrasted with his memories. Where the paintings in the Indian cave had sent confused, flashing images into his brain, here he rather had the feeling of going blind, or being restricted in his perceptions in a way that was difficult to describe, when he touched them. Something pulled him on, an indeterminate feeling, a dreamy longing. Polly face, he exclaimed involuntarily. As if in response, the rumble he had heard at the fork sounded again. It was far away, but not as far as the first time. Suddenly driven, Leonard Leach accelerated his steps. All shaking at the big gate brought nothing. The iron bars were as thick as his wrist and showed no weakness whatsoever. A forging of impressive perfection. A blacksmith's job that Indians could never have done, and Leech doubted that there was a blacksmith in Arkham or anywhere else who would have been able to do it. But perfection or not, the damn grid prevented him from getting closer to his goal. He wondered whether he should not turn his red against the iron, but he feared that it would not be enough. Apart from that, he had the feeling all along that he might need it in the near future. Frustrated, Leech stared at the lock that held the massive latch in place. The growling and rumbling, the polymorphism, the realization, the end of his odyssey, all that was waiting for him behind that grating, he was convinced of that. He had already broken his cudgel while trying to bend two of the struts with leverage to finally get further. Angrily he stared at the fragments at his feet. He picked up the larger and sharper of the two pieces. Maybe he could pick the lock with it? No. To realize the pitifulness of this thought, he did not even have to look at the castle. Hello, Wolf's Eye, a woman's voice suddenly sounded behind him. Startled, he turned around, ready to fight from now on. Well, are you surprised? asked Miranda Harper, the blood drinker. The blood drinker who had let him live, although she had reasons to kill him. Him who had eaten her friends. He, who would have eaten her too, and everything and everyone she could have called her family, would not have turned up Reginald Burns and Father Sinclair. No, he corrected himself, she had not just let him live. She had saved his. And there she stood before him, in the same clothes as her dead comrade, which Leech had forced her to wear. How did you get here? You don't need to know. He stared at her. What was that in her hand? A gun? It was clearly metal, but her fingers hid the exact shape from his eyes. A hunch. His eyes twitched between her hand and the grating. Yes, that's right, Wolf's eye. I have the key. Here, in my hand. What do you want for it? 
What do you know? Tell me. Say it, he reined over her and took a step towards her. What if I don't want to? What if I just say, thank you for bringing me here, and now order you to leave me alone? Then I will force you. I will not give you the key. You're not ready yet. So far? For what? I have a right to the key. No, you didn't. It's not for you to decide. Leech's wolf's eye glows red with rage. South close to his goal and his damn food, his food, wanted to play games with him. He gritted his teeth and pressed out. Give me the key, and stretched out the palm of her hand to her, demanding. Miranda Harper smiled in a fragile, strangely sad way. For a moment she held up the key so that he could see the iron-pointed beard. Then this piece of dirt put the key in his mouth and swallowed it. Leech could see how the much too big thing deformed her esophagus under the tender skin of her neck in the ugliest way and slowly slid down. You shouldn't have done that. Threatening violence was in his voice. Now you show up here and want to play games with me, right? I will not give you the key. You're not ready yet. She coughed while speaking and her eyes were watering. And who are you to decide that? I eat dirty abnormalities like you. You are only prey. No more than a fucking cow on two legs. With these words Leech jumped forward, so fast that she didn't stand a chance, and rammed the pointed end of the stick into her body. A cry of triumph. A cry of pain. Both mingled in the widths of the cave to a single, gruesome sound. The rough would pierce the blood drinker where he thought the key was, and came out in her back. He could smell their rotten gastric juices. Accompanied by an obscene smacking, he tore back his murder instrument and transported bloody organ and tissue shreds from the blood drinker's body to the outside. Miranda Harper staggered and swayed, her hands resting on his shoulders, looking for support. But I saved you, I. And for what? He struck again, in time, as he roared the words into her ear and the cave and into the black plane of his soul. Where to, you saved me? He turned the stick in the wound and blood and something else flowed over his hand. Then he tore it back, rammed it into her again with all his might, a little higher this time. This cunt simply could not have enough holes. What is all this? He shouted again. This time he left the defiled stick in her chest. He shook her bleeding body like an angry child shakes a doll, grabbed his red, took it all at once and with crunching twisting movements tore off first her left arm and then her right. Carelessly, he threw her limbs behind him, grabbed her chin, tore her head back up, which had sunk to the bottom, and forced her dead eyes to look at him. What for? He heard her lower jaw break under the red pressure and pieces of her teeth trickled out between her flaccid, bloody lips, tickling his hand and then falling to the ground. Damn sharp teeth. Right on. He ran the other hand into her intestines. The key. The key. Where? Where the fuck? He could not find him at first go. His hand encircled her spine. He pulled her by himself, bit her face, once, twice, bit off her nose and tore a large chunk out of her cheek. He kept chewing and snarling and digging around in her body, ripping out organs, sullying herself with her blood and the contents of her torn intestines, and then, finally, he felt something hard, harder than her bones and colder. He grabbed it and pulled his hand out. There it was, the key. Now it belonged to him. Leonard Leach carelessly dropped Miranda Harper's body and hurried towards the grating with a few big sentences. He wiped the key on his trousers to clean it from the shreds of flesh and other disgusting substances, then, with a mad giggle, he rammed it into the lock and turned it around. And turned. And turned. And turned until his giggle got stuck in his throat. The key did not work. He could not open the lock. An echo. You are not ready yet. 
That was wrong. Wrong. Leonard Leach grabbed his neck. When he pulled back his hand, there was blood on it. Excuse me. Mr. Billings stuttered fearfully. They suddenly screamed like mad and twitched, and I slipped. I'm very sorry, sir. You don't have to pay either. Leach saw his own wild-looking face in the mirror and struggled for self-control. When he thought he was halfway out of control again, he said, It's okay. Everything's okay. Just give me a tissue and get on with it. Mrs. Billings, who had stepped back a few steps to be on the safe side and watch the scene, took her eyes off Leach's revolvers, which of course were not covered by the white cloth. Are you sure you're all right, sir? Leach was glad when he finally stood on Church Street again and realized that hardly more than half an hour had passed. With his clean-shaven face and short-cut hair, he felt naked, but at the same time enjoyed the touch of the sultry air on his damp skin. He pondered as he went back to his room in the hotel. How he had reacted in this strange dream. So far he had actually been of the opinion that he was coping quite well with his fate. Was that perhaps a fallacy? Was it even a dream? Normally he did not dream at all, as far as one could say with certainty. Only when the many face came to visit him could he remember it, but that just now, that had been different. So real. So tangible. He shook his head, tried with moderate success to get rid of the images he had in mind. A mother pulled her child away from him. It stared at him in fear. Leonard Leach recognized Doc Rogers, who was walking up and down in front of the hotel and waiting for him, from a distance. He, too, had obviously got his appearance in order and Leach discovered with mild surprise the glasses dangling from a leather strap in front of the doctor's chest. He had never noticed that the doc had problems with his eyes. You look like a freshly castrated horse, Leach. Much obliged, document. If you weren't so old that it doesn't matter anymore whether you are neutered or not, I would say the same about you. Well countered. Shall we eat? You can take something to your room. I have leftovers from Fort Hunter upstairs. The doc knew about Leech, but seemed to forget it every now and then. Now he said, with a slightly derogatory expression on his face. They can nibble on them later. You should be seen at dinner. No, document. I am really hungry. Why don't you take a table? I'll be right behind you. My shaving was very exhausting, and apart from that I don't want to walk around with a saber on my belt anymore. I will be with you shortly. Well, see you soon, the doc relented. See you soon. The room Leech had taken at Hangman's Inn was almost as luxuriously furnished as his Plainview premises had been. He felt the need to wash up, to rinse the dream blood of Miranda Harper from his hands. But first he ate the remains of Major Silvers and the Colonel. He snapped greedily, as if trying to numb the stale feeling that the dream had left in him. It did not work. Only after he had had two drinks with the dock washed and without a saber on his belt did he feel a little better. Stock and he told about what had happened in his head in the billing store. When he had finished, the doc said. I am not really surprised. If it was really just a dream, it is easy to explain. You have finally made it here, and now, just before you reach your goal, you are denied the last step, knowledge. It must be very frustrating for you, but let me tell you one thing, even if you hadn't been given a trial period, the road ahead is still a long one, Mr. Leach. But that doesn't make it any less frustrating, to stick to your words. Doc, Leach growled and let his gaze wander through the saloon attached to the hotel. But what else could it have been, if it was not a dream? A test. The heads, well, imagine the whole thing from their point of view. Two men come into the city and demand to be heard. One of them left Miskatonic University three decades ago and has never been seen again since. And the other is a magically rampant, untrained person of any kind 
who is crying out for answers. If I were one of the leaders, I would also be very careful and watch these men before making any decisions. A test? Someone could have seen what was happening in my head. If it was an imposed clear dream, it is quite possible. Have you perhaps been bitten by a mosquito recently? Could you possibly have been hypnotized? Monotonous scraping of steel on leather. Leech looked resigned. Damn it. Is this a joke? They send clear dreams with midges? Either way, I failed. I have. They will never give me access after seeing me tear up Miranda Harper just to get the key. I. Take it easy, Leech. At least now they know how serious you are about all this. No reason to throw in the towel prematurely. Do not forget, the heads are not orphans themselves. Do you really think so? Yes, of course. Do not worry. By the way, I have something for you. I have offered to act as a link between you and the university. I also take on the role of errand boy for the books you want to study. Look! He pushed five densely written sheets of paper against Leech. Here is the list of fonts you currently have access to. I also took the liberty of working out a meaningful order in which I think you should study the works. Leech reached for the leaves and flew over them with joyless glances. Thanks, document. With pleasure. Tomorrow morning I will bring them the first four. Oh, and here's another letter for you. From Miss Lincoln. Miss Lincoln? The girl? Blonde, braids, head of the university? Does it dawn? Read the letter at your leisure later. I don't want to know what it says. Leech, who was about to open the envelope sealed with red wax, paused. Okay, Doc, whatever you say. Thank you very much in any case for your help. Oh, Mr. Leech, she's not that unselfish. The old man grinned mischievously. Well, let's just say, for me it was an incredible stroke of luck to run into you. Leech frowned because he could not imagine that getting to know him could bring happiness to anyone. Doc Rogers smiled and then continued. All right, I'll explain it to you in the short version. But instead of speaking, the old man first stared into the depths of his glass for a few seconds, seemingly fascinated by the refractions of light and the amber-colored liquid. At last he raised the word again. I was at Miskatonic since childhood. My father was already a scholar of the offside arts, first in London, and then here in Arkham. I was practically born into this world. And before you ask, I am neither a beast nor am I magically gifted. I am an advanced adept at best, and only with a lot of goodwill. Basically, I am a scholar with a, shall we say, extended education. So I was very teachable, but as is the case with young people, even though everything, this second world, was and is so incredibly fascinating, at some point it became too tight for me at the university. Too small. I want it out, you know? See the world? Leech asked. The doc nodded. Yes, exactly. What good is all this old knowledge if it is not used for the good of the world? So I accepted an assignment. At the other end of the world, somewhere on the west coast, there should be a large nest of vampires. Vampires, leech, not blood drinkers. Leech was actually surprised, but kept silent because he didn't want to interrupt the dock. I found this nest near a small fishing village. Killed every single beast. Almost. In the course of my attack on the beasts I was injured, physically and mentally. But I finished them. Yeah, I'm a little proud of it too, silly me. The rest of the story is completely profane. I was found crawling along, crying and bleeding, by a young woman, the daughter of a fisherman who also did some farming. We fell in love and I stayed there, because I didn't want to take her into my world. I'm sure you understand why. The old man smiled sadly. 
It was a simple, good life. Until one day she fell ill and died. Soon more people in the area became ill and the number grew steadily. At some point it dawned on me. The death of all these people is on my head, Leech. I had missed one of the vampires. Vampires, Mr. Leech, are devious creatures and they have a different concept of time than we humans or most other beasts. The one I was dealing with was particularly sneaky. He poisoned the wells of the land with his excrements. By the time I found out what happened, hundreds had already died. I hunted him down, but the simple life was over once and for all. I just couldn't stay there anymore, even though none of the survivors knew of my guilt. I let myself drift, drank and played, and now and then I practiced as a doctor. Actually only when I ran out of money. As I noticed only in the middle of the process, I slowly moved further and further east, towards Arkham. Unconsciously, and not in a straight line, not in the fastest way, and then I met you. He laughed. You thought I was your ticket into the Miskatonic? At least to the same extent you were mine. You're a very interesting case, Mr. Leech, and it seems that I'm being forgiven without hesitation for my unexcused absence over the past decades because I brought you along. Well, that's the way the world works, Doc, grinned Leech. Then, more seriously, thank you for telling me all this. I'm sorry about your wife, Document. Yeah, me too. You know, maybe I can make up for some of my guilt by taking care of your education. To you leech, with your hunger, this would not have happened. You wouldn't have missed a vampire. Their greed would have prevented this. They hate the beasts. No. I don't hate them. They were like livestock to me. Were? A blood drinker has shown me mercy and at the university too there seem to be some who deserve a more differentiated assessment. That's probably true, but if you are alluding to the heads, things are a little different. They have consciously allowed themselves to be transformed. What? Why would anyone do that? Well, on the one hand, to prolong one's own life, and on the other hand, to better understand the chosen type of beast. But how could they be sure that? The doc finished Leech's sentence. That their new life form does not take control? Changed your motives and views? Yes, exactly. Guardian. You are never alone. Each of them is monitored at all levels and their room for maneuver is very small. But they must hunt and eat. The guardians take care of that, too. But I didn't see any this morning. That doesn't mean there weren't any. Leech made a questioning gesture over his glass. Whatever. And how exactly do they hunt? Convicts. Convicted criminals. These people pay for their sins with their blood and flesh. For a while the two men drank and thought. Leech swayed slightly. After the serious part of their conversation was over, he had been drinking and playing cards with Doc Rogers until late at night. During the third round of poker, he had discovered another jackal man in the saloon, but he had left him alone. Firstly, he was full, and secondly, given his consumption of whiskey, he did not have the sense of hunting. But he had stored an image of this man in his memory. For later use. He fell heavily onto the bed and pulled out the letter. With clumsy effort he broke the surprisingly strong red seal and unfolded the closely written sheet. Good evening, Mr. Leech. I and the other leaders were most surprised by their appearance in Arkham. I can only imagine your disappointment at the precautions we have taken. Unfortunately, the miscellaneous, as we call them, has many enemies and we must be overly careful about who we trust and who we don't trust. You, Mr. Leech, are still very, very young in our eyes. Unfinished one could also say, even if you may have already lived a good part of a human life. In view of this fact, 
I would like to prevent you from turning away from the university out of some immature impulse and assure you that you will get your answers as far as we have them. Have patience and continue your studies. We are also aware that you are subject to certain necessities regarding your diet. In a way this is a stroke of luck for the Miskatonic. Our scholars are, despite all their knowledge, and, to my regret, I must admit, not suited to face the many dangers that surround us. And these dangers are becoming ever more numerous. It is not only the beasts, Mr. Leach but also organizations like the Order and other zealots are trying to hinder the work of the Miskatonic. The political situation is difficult. So I propose a symbiosis, a community of purpose for mutual benefit. In addition to the decision we made this morning. From time to time I will mention names and places. The individuals you will find in these places and under these names are intended for your nutrition. In return you are not allowed to go hunting on your own, Mr. Leach. Too great would be the damage you would cause unknowingly. As additional compensation for your waiver, I will deposit a monthly amount of money into an account that will allow you to effortlessly pay all your university fees and live a modest but carefree life in Arkham. Money in the possession of the named individuals may also be taken by you. Captured jewelry and artifacts are to be handed over to the university specifically to me. Without exception. I will know that you accept this agreement when you take a closer look at Christchurch Cemetery in the next few days. On the spot, you will certainly see for yourself what needs to be done. Needless to say, neither the people of Arkham nor the authorities must know about your actions. Carpe noctum, Mr. Leach. Clarice Lincoln. Lincoln? Was she related to Honest Abe? Leach had read the lines with impatient interest. Now he held the letter to the embers of his cigarillo, waited for a first flare and let the paper sail into his unused chamber pot, where it burned to ashes. Miss Lincoln was really no child. Did the other leaders know about the letter? Or did she play her own game? Was the whole thing another test in the end? On the other hand, he had to eat, of course, and if the Miskatonic was worried that he would kill himself uncontrollably by the beasts that lived among the people of Arkham, he could take away that worry from the chiefs. After all, he was dependent on her goodwill. When he stepped onto Church Street the next morning and reluctantly welcomed the sticky air and the mosquitoes, he was sure that it had been Miss Lincoln who had sent him the clear dream. Oh, she had really been able to observe him? He strolled along the street and finally entered the store of Quince, the treacherous tailor. Leech did not hold it against the man, but decided not to forget to tell him that he had sent him to the Billings. In return, he was pleasantly surprised by the care and speed with which the man had worked. Actually, he just wanted to check if at least one of the ordered frock coats was already finished so that he wouldn't be so conspicuous in the streets of Arkham, but the tailor proudly and smilingly presented him the entire order that Leech had just placed the day before. He was more than enthusiastic. The clothes not only looked good, they were also functional and did not hinder his movements in the slightest. The tailor had really understood what Leech was all about and the generous tip Leech gave him was more than deserved. Satisfied, the monster eater brought his new possessions to the hotel before he set off for the graveyard. The weight of his revolver on his hip was missing, but he would get used to it. The shoulder holster allowed him to carry the weapons concealed, which he hoped would make him appear less threatening. He would have to practice pulling if he wanted to regain his old speed but that was a small price to pay for his newly gained inconspicuousness. The eye patch, of course, still brought him curious glances, that was unavoidable, but on the way he noticed with satisfaction that nobody changed sides of the street anymore and twice even a slight nod was sent in his direction, which, much to his own surprise, delighted him. Despite this pleasant experience, his mood was, all in all, mixed at best when he took his first exploratory walk through Christchurch Cemetery at noon. In direct proximity to the chapel crouching crouched on a hill, two funerals seemed to be in progress. 
the scraps of words carried by the sultry wind that reached his ear suggested that the two preachers were trying to outdo each other in volume, which Leech noted with amusement. At some distance he waited until the ritual actions were completed and the dead were buried. Then he walked through the shuffling mourners up to the chapel. One of the preachers, a surprisingly young man, was still standing before the fresh grave and seemed to be praying or lost in thought. Leech ignored him and entered the chapel. He convinced himself that he was alone, then he exposed his wolf's eye. Nothing unusual. The chapel could not have met Miss Lincoln. He remembered the gorgon in plain view and also scanned the ceiling of the stone building. There, too, he found nothing to indicate the activity of a beast. A sound coming from behind his ear made him drive around at lightning speed. Involuntarily, his hands were twitching towards his hips, but then Leech saw that it was only the priest who had entered the chapel behind him. Leech quickly put his eye patch back in place, not without feeling his wolf's eye once more over the man's aura. He was a human being, now looked at Leech attentively and took a step towards him. Can I help you, son? No, father, I was just looking for a moment of peace. The pale eyes of the preacher sought his own. I have never seen you at one of my sermons. What is your name? I gotta go, kiddo. Another time, perhaps. Outside, Leech thought about the conversation he had just had. He had to become better at dealing with people. The priest had looked quite piqued. He had to do so many things. He had to be constantly on the lookout for bounty hunters, and even if he was staying at the hotel under a false name, if any gunslinger was persistent enough to look for him, he would find him. He had simply left too many traces Carson and his buffalo hunters knew that he wanted to go to the East Coast, and so did the soldiers of the fort and with them the U.S. Cavalry. He had talked too much and thought too little. Did you see a guy? With two revolvers, a saber and an eye patch. Who would not remember him? And even if he no longer wore his revolvers open and had left his saber in the hotel, he would not get rid of the eye patch. His hope was that he would be able to feed himself so well here in Arkham that he would look much younger than he did in the fort or in the rat town of Stockbridge, where he had met Doc Rogers. Despite this small glimmer of hope, he cursed the mistakes he had made on his way here and hoped that they would not take revenge sometime. He should also avoid new errors of this kind in the future. He thought these and other thoughts as he looked at the area north of the chapel. This part of the cemetery was apparently reserved for the wealthier families of Arkham. Not only were the tombs larger and further apart, but they were often decorated with detailed, splendid gravestones instead of simple wooden crosses. Now and then the regular rows of tombs were interrupted by mausoleums and the covered entrances to crypts. One of these mausoleums attracted his attention. The tomb was almost as big as the chapel. The weathered marble was covered with moss and the entrance was symbolically guarded by two man-sized angel statues. He walked slowly around the building, his hands crossed behind his back like an idler who had all the time in the world. Why had he noticed the mausoleum? It took him a few minutes to come up with it. It was not the tomb itself, it was the graves around it. Many of them looked as if they had either been freshly dug or had crooked gravestones, often only shifted by a tiny amount. From all the modest knowledge Leech had gathered during his time in Plainview, this could indicate ghouls or other corpse-eaters. These creatures were usually only a minor danger to humans as they were not their main source of food. But woe to the one who disturbs a ghoul while eating. This, however, only applied to wild ghouls, and these were very, very rare. Most ghouls were created and were in bondage to their creator. And, Leech thought, this creator could actually only have base motives. What should one do with such creatures, if not to set them on his enemies? Again he let his gaze wander over the graves. Someone here didn't want to attract attention. Obviously, efforts were made to clean up after the beasts and to cover their tracks, 
otherwise the damage to the graves caused by the ghouls with their scratching and digging for dead meat would have been much greater. He spent the afternoon and early evening in his room, studying the list that Doc Rogers had given him the night before. Hermeticism I, the power of the runes, nature spirits and elements, the doctrine of manifestation, blood magic. The list seemed endless to Leech. For the beginning he chose interpretation of dreams and tides, the confessions of a blood drinker, the thaumaturgical basics and herbs and their effect on the aura. At the moment, the book on dream interpretation interested him the most, but he also hoped to find helpful information in the other books. He was not quite satisfied with his choice, but at least he could tell the doc something now when he met with him next time. Today, however, Rogers seemed to have something else in mind, as the time for dinner had passed without the doc showing up. Leech spent the remaining hours until nightfall cleaning his revolvers, sharpening his bowie knife, and when he was done, he practiced pulling the weapons out of the shoulder holster for a while. Then the time had finally come. The small window of his room was, he had been careful to make sure, facing the dark courtyard of the hotel and it was no problem for him to reach the floor from the second floor unharmed, without making any noise. Soon he had also reached the cemetery without being seen by one of the last night owls on Church Street. He placed himself in the moon shadow of the chapel and observed the mausoleum of Van Wandens. For two hours nothing happened. Only the slowly fading remaining life radiation, which hovered over the fresher graves, briefly caught his attention. Those, and those of the animals. Bats hunted the mosquitoes and an owl hunted the bats. Hunger, meat and death. Everywhere. All that eating and dying. Would he really find answers in Arkham? He recognized the necessities that nature imposed on him and all other living beings, but at the same time he longed for more. Perhaps it was this longing that distinguished beasts like the werewolf Vargas, his father, from him. A bat shrieked when the owl had finally succeeded in getting hold of it. Leech saw the tiny drops of blood fall to the ground as the bird of prey carried its prey away. Then he noticed movement at the edge of the cemetery, at the northern entrance. A small figure wrapped in a hoodie and surrounded by a female aura. Miss Lincoln? No, Leech became aware that he had never seen this aura before and it was human. The unknown woman approached the mausoleum with small steps and great determination. While the woman was tampering with the door of the tomb, Leech got out of the shadow of the chapel and crept a little closer. As a precaution he drew his revolvers and made sure he had enough of his red ready to enhance the bullets. The creaking of the hinges penetrated his ears as the woman laboriously opened the heavy wooden door of the mausoleum to the outside. Max? Daniel? Are you there? Come on, time to play. Leech thought he had misheard himself when shortly afterwards two ghouls, whose movements seemed grotesquely awkward and yet unnaturally powerful at the same time, shuffled out of the family grave and stopped in front of the woman. If the woman under her hood was already of delicate stature, this applied all the more to the two undead. It's me, Mommy. She stretched out her hand and stroked the cheeks of the two, only slightly decayed creatures, one after the other. Grief colored her aura gray. She whispered in a weak, high voice. Come along. It's time for you to get something to eat. Leech hid behind a tombstone, from which he watched as the woman led her sons to a grave two rows away. Go ahead. Tears sparkled on her face as she watched them crawl and dig and grunt, listening to the breaking of bones, the smacking and tearing of dead flesh. Now and then she looked around furtively. She is rightly afraid of discovery, Leech thought. They would be burned as witches if they were to be discovered in their activities. Salem is not far from here. After half an hour the bizarre, nocturnal feast was over. She led her children, only now Leech noticed that they were twins, back to the mausoleum, stroked their cheeks again and finally locked them up in their place of death again. 
Then, hurriedly now, she returned to the desecrated tomb and began to repair it. What should he do? Obviously, no one built an army of undead here. On the other hand, he had an assignment on whose success much depended for him. Should he then wipe the woman and her carnivorous twins from the face of the earth? Although he could not detect any malice in the aura of the desperate mother, nor in her actions, the petite woman had finished her work and stared unhappily at her small hands, illuminated by the cold moonlight. Then she began to move towards the exit with slow, powerless steps. Leech looked after her. Her two ghoul children were a danger. If they were no longer fed in this way, for whatever reason, they would become more and more aggressive, and even if the door of the mausoleum was heavy and seemed strong sooner or later it would be opened by someone, someone other than this woman. Either because there was another Van Wanden to bury, or because someone wanted to see what kind of noises were coming from the tomb. This person would fare badly. When she opened the door and called for her children, neither Max nor Daniel responded to Natalie Van Wanden's quiet, tender invitations. No shuffling came to her ears, not the pitiful, sick wheezing of her sons. With trembling hands she lit a sulfur wood and went into the tomb of the family she had so unhappily married into. Flickering light illuminated the stone coffins of her devilish husband's ancestors. Two of them had been freed from their heavy lids. It had been a miracle that she had managed it that first night. But the care for her little ones had given her powers she would never have dared to dream of. Powers and an unbending will. She cried out. The flame of the sulfur wood had reached her fingers. Immediately she tore a new one. When she reached the two coffins, because of which she took so much upon herself, and took a look inside, something broke inside her. Leech watched as she entered the mausoleum. He had already been there before her. He had tried not to damage the bodies of the undead too much when he finished them off. He was even a little bit proud that he had managed to keep his hunger in check. Each of the children's bodies showed only a broad knife thrust in the abdomen, which was, however, covered by the clothing carefully put together by him. Leech had let so much red flow through the blade of his bowie knife that further stabs were not necessary. He had also refrained from severing limbs. He had only removed some organs by drilling his arm through the puncture into the body and carefully palpating for them. Liver, heart, and kidneys. But Mrs. Van Wanden would not notice that. When he had finished with them, he had put the twins back into their coffins, closed their eyelids and spread the shrouds over them. Apart from that, nothing indicated his actions. Two days later he was sitting at dinner with Doc Rogers, who had come to give him his books and take the loan in the name of the university. While Leach choked down the one potato to keep up appearances, the Doc commented on his report. And you're not concerned that the Van Wandens are obviously messing with black magic? No, said Leach, laboriously chewing on his disgust. Not really. She just could not let go. I read in Arkham Advertiser that Mr. Van Wanden is looking for a supervisor for his wife. Mental hardships after the tragic death of her children. This is how he described her condition. If someone is found, she will not be able to do anything more in this direction. Does he pay well? Well above average, I would say. Why? Maybe that would be something for me. After all, I'm a doctor, said the doc, chewing too, and then added. At least until I find out in what way she helped the children to their second life. Well, if that's what you want to call it. Yeah, if that's what you want to call it. They ate their plates empty. By the way, I have a new letter for you. Back in his room, Leech tore open the envelope later that evening. On the paper was the number of an account at the Bank of Boston, Arkham Branch. Below that only two words. Well done. Epilogue. Father Sinclair knelt before the superiors of his order, who were covered with gold-embroidered robes, and reported. 
so you let yourself be shot down by an ordinary blood drinker, lost your blood Bible and your scourge chain, and are indirectly responsible for the death of many God-fearing men? That's how you could interpret it, Sinclair thought, if you were an ignorant, self-righteous bastard. Brother Geronimus was one such. He had never liked Sinclair and that was mutual. Only their common fanaticism united the two men. What, what, Sinclair, you're not gonna say anything? Leave him be, Geronimus. This was the voice of Marcus McBride echoing loudly and deeply through the old church that the Order had chosen as its headquarters in New York. He knows that he made mistakes and he sincerely regrets them. Right, Father Sinclair? The addressed man looked up from the floor and felt over the fresh, round scar on his forehead, which the blood drinker had taught him. Yes, I sincerely repent, he pushed out from behind clenched teeth. Then you shall be forgiven, McBride roared anointingly. The dozen men spoke simultaneously and solemnly, may you be forgiven in the name of the one true Lord. Then again the voice of McBride. Rise and continue in your noble service. The other eleven solemnly repeated the words. Later, Father Sinclair and Crusader McBride walked side by side through the streets of the city. All this and all around. All this depravity. All the blinded souls. And then there are the creatures of hell that walk the earth. Sometimes it becomes almost too much. Yes, you're right. It is an eternal trial, replied Father Sinclair. God hates wimps like you. McBride sighed, theatrically suffering. That's right, Father, that's right. How did this toad manage to be beaten to become a crusader? McBride stretched out a thick bundle of dollar bills towards him. I was able to convince the other superiors to give you another chance. Rest, get men and then finish what you started with this leech. Destroy him. Thank you, Knight McBride. May the Lord bless and protect you and the order. Sinclair uttered these words emotionlessly, but inwardly he cheered. Of course McBride had stood up for him. After all, he had to, because otherwise Sinclair would spread the man's unnatural inclinations before the Order's superiors. Yes, it was a difficult power structure that had developed within the Order, and he, Sinclair, was a master at balancing it and directing things his way. The End Rats of the Ruins, Sample the degenerates stood in a respectful distance in a semicircle around their offering. There had to be about fifteen of the tattered figures and further back, behind the spearmen and archers, even more people were sitting on the cold ground. Prisoners The dirty blonde hair of the girl hid most of her face and the head hung low. She had given up defending herself. Under the rhythmic chant of the others two of the degenerates had dragged her to the motorbike and tied her there. She had fought back then. Even after she was tied, she had screamed and tugged at the ropes for a while, but now she seemed to have given up and instead let the teary red eyes wander fearfully back and forth. She waited. They were all waiting. They were waiting for dusk. For the twilight with which the dogs would come. I looked up at the sky. The sun had been in retreat for a while now and would soon have set completely. I checked my equipment. For the crossbow I only had four bolts, and then there was the machete, which I had taken from a hardware store two days ago. On my belt I still had one of those cheap survival knives with compass and fishing gear in the hollow plastic handle, but this thing could hardly be labeled a weapon. Resigned, I exhaled. No, there's nothing I could do for the girl. Even if I managed to free the girl, what would I do with the child? I couldn't take her with me and alone she would sooner or later peg out anyway. I made my decision, let myself sink behind the burnout car wreck whose hood I had peered over and cocked the crossbow. While I was inserting the bolt, I was thinking. I had to wait until the dogs really came out of the cellars and urban canyons to get to the girl and attract the attention of the slavers. If the degenerates noticed my shot, 
it was more than likely that they would hunt me down. I took aim on the poor, trembling thing for a test, checked the wind direction and watched as the light of the sun slowly departed. They were still in the shadows of the ruins, crept suspiciously around the group, but soon they would have explored the situation sufficiently and then the scent of the girl's fear would make them attack. The pseudo-sacred chant of the Degs gradually became louder and more menacing and soon I saw movement in the shadows of the buildings lining the square. The dogs were here. Through the scope of the crossbow I watched the child, who in the meantime had also discovered the dogs and tried whimpering and panicking to keep an eye on all of the beasts at the same time. The loose circle that the beasts now formed became tighter and tighter, and for my shot I wanted to hit the exact moment when the first animal went on the attack. I imagined I could hear the vicious, hungry growling of animals. But I most likely heard nothing except the distant chant of the wretched creatures who wanted to buy themselves safety from the beasts by sacrificing the girl. This time it would probably even work, because I wasn't able to distinguish more than eight of the shadowy creatures, and there was enough meat on that kid for all of them. Then it happened. The first animal, the largest, the Alpha, left its orbit, the girl screamed and tore herself bloody at the ropes, the dogs howled, barked and growled, then the Alpha jumped and bit into the girl's ankle. The scream was unbearable when the tender skin burst and the bones were crushed. Then the others followed. That's enough distraction. I pulled the trigger. At dusk I could not follow the trajectory of the bolt with my eyes, but half a second after I pulled the trigger, a terrible noise came to my ear. Quiet and barely perceptible under the screaming, barking and growling the noise that occurs when metal meets metal. I missed the girl and hit the motorcycle wreckage. All of the sudden, the screams of the girl seemed twice as loud, and I hit my hands over my ears as I sank to the ground behind the hood my back to the rusty will well and paralyzed by my own failure. I wouldn't dare to fire another shot. It seemed to me like an eternity while I waited behind the destroyed car and had to listen to the terribly wet and raging noises. When I was able to get up again and leave this miserable place, I didn't look back. The songs of the degenerates had stopped, and all that got to my ears was the sound of the wind. I crept away. Loser. That happened a week ago. I still woke up night after night bathed in sweat and had then relived the events of that evening. The dream had taken me out of my sleep again today and I sat down in my sleeping bag. Disoriented for a moment, I looked around. No dogs. No degenerates. Instead a pale, early morning sun lit the bedroom of the abandoned house in which I had settled for the moment. My backpack leaned against the wall together with the crossbow and the machete lay on the unused half of the wide double bed I had chosen to sleep on. I was barefoot, wearing only my dirty jeans, and the rest of my clothes formed a sluggish clue at the foot of the bed. After my recent experiences with the degenerates who offered their sacrifice to the wild dogs, I had become tired of roaming and wandering for the time being. In a suburb of Frankfurt, at the lower end of a dead-end street, I found a house surrounded by a high fence. The entrance door was turned towards the turning hammer and an overgrown park full of tall trees adjoined at the back. From the bedroom in the first floor I could overlook the street, which gave me a vague feeling of security. I had closed the gate, which interrupted the fence a little over the height of a man with a chain and a padlock and therefore allowed me to relax a little in the deceptive safety. I still had canned food for three days and I had managed to shoot a rabbit who must have made it out of the park onto the fenced property somehow. Sleepy I looked down the street. In front a weathered sign had proclaimed the name of the road. Mittler or Hasenfad. The asphalt had cracked in ferns, grass and here and there even a young tree sprouted. The front gardens of the other houses also were overgrown, and, as everywhere else, nature pushed with irresistible force into the remains of our so-called civilization. With a disposable lighter, a handful of which I always had with me, I lit a gas burner and heated some water in a tin cup to stir an instant coffee. 
I would never have drunk a brew like that before it all changed, but right now it seemed like the greatest luxury to me. As I sipped on the blackish liquid, I gazed across the cloudy sky. Autumn had come. Later that day I would check the attic and the cellar for useful things. But for the moment I simply sat on the bed and drank my coffee. I still had to think about the dogs. About them and about the degenerates. To the same extent that the flora pushed forward and occupied the space that man had so suddenly and so terribly released, much so did the fauna. But that wasn't the real problem. The problem was that in the few years after the Great War and without human influence the animals had very quickly found their way back to their archaic behavior. Dogs now lived in packs again and they had remembered how to hunt. In addition, the simplest of all mechanisms had been applied. In our brave new world the weak and the little ones were eaten or starved to death. Not only were there significantly more dangerous animals in relation to humans than before, but those who made it were really big beasts with sharp teeth who were prepared to kill for their food. And so it was not only with the dogs. A very similar development had taken place with the humans. Where there were remnants of civilized behavior, the survivors had formed tribal social structures. Each of these structures had developed its own rules, often based on the right of the strongest, and when you met such a group as a stranger, you had to be extremely careful. Even the smallest argument could quickly end in a deadly fight. It was better to avoid people. People are trouble. Even if they were still trying to maintain a minimum level of civilization. But there were others. The degenerates were among them. Degenerate, that's what I called those people who had discarded almost any behavior that had been labeled human before the war. Whether this development was caused by our collective trauma, or whether these people had always been closer to the border of animalism, and now, in the absence of law and order, could live out their disposition without inhibition, I did not know that and in the end it did not matter much to me. They were nothing more than predators, roaming in groups, stealing, plundering, murdering and raping wherever they could. Mostly these groups consisted of men, but now and then women were also present, and when they were, they usually appeared to try to be more cruel than the men. The dangerous and disgusting thing about them all was their intelligence and their will for unnecessary sadism. The herders were another group. They were found where uranium ammunition stuck in the walls and biological warfare agents had been used, or where tactical nukes had turned the large industrial facilities of the world into contaminated debris fields. Many of them had almost nothing human in their appearance. Molten flesh, cancerous, mutilated, Without teeth and affected by scabies, they had also come together in small groups. Often they lived isolated from the healthy, who wanted to have nothing more to do with them. Whether out of the fear of an infection or simply out of innate, instinctive disgust. Some of them had gone insane because of their suffering, but I had already been able to barter with others on several occasions. But even I had been anxious to avoid any physical contact back then. Self-protection. Once a herder woman offered herself to me in search of protection and some company. I could do with her whatever I wanted, she had said, just leave her behind, that I should not do. I left her behind and wandered on. I can't say exactly why I roamed this gigantic battlefield alone. There was no place I wanted to go, no person I cared about and no big goal I was pursuing. Basically. I could have killed myself just as well as so many before me had done. Especially in the first years after the war. I decided not to think about it any further. I took off my jeans and underpants and began to clean myself with a bar of soap and the rest of the water from the plastic bottle. Every other day I sprayed myself generously with disinfectant, from which I had taken three small bottles from a half-collapsed drugstore. Since there was no more basic medical care by doctors and hospitals, it was more than advisable to pay attention to hygiene. A blister on the foot could be fatal on the run, just like fungal infestation in the crotch. 
an inflamed ear could be the reason why you couldn't hear when someone or something sneaked up on you. You just had to take care of yourself. When I was done, I got dressed. After the jeans came socks, leather boots, and a holy gray t-shirt. I took my machete with me and left the rest of my belongings in the bedroom, because I basically didn't expect any trouble. When I had reached the house, exhausted and depressed, the first thing I'd done was to take a quick look in each room to see that no one was here. The door to the cellar had been locked, so I hadn't dealt with it any further. At the end of my search I had arrived in the bedroom, had blocked the door with a chair and had quickly fallen into an exhausted sleep. Now I took a little more time. When I arrived I hadn't noticed the name tag on the door, but everything here looked as if this family had been quite wealthy before the war. You could tell by the furnishings and the contents of the wardrobes. Kitchen and living room were open and generously laid out and separated from each other only by a counter. Modern back then. In a pantry bordering the entrance area, I found some food cans with an acceptable expiry date, which I stacked next to the entrance door. Then there was a small toilet and a larger bathroom on the ground floor. There, in the mirror cabinet above the wash basin, I found a toothbrush still sealed in, a booklet with plasters and a few rolls of gauze. I stuffed my prey into the pockets of the jeans and turned to the cellar door. It was still locked. I felt around a little, and in fact, there was a key on top of the door frame. I used the key and opened the door, the machete on my right. Listening, I stared into the darkness. Shit. Darkness. I closed the door behind me again and began to rummage through drawers and cupboards until I found a small flashlight that, to my great joy, had a battery that still was functional. Other electricity no longer existed in the most parts of the world, the war had made sure of that. For a brief moment I had to think of all those nuclear power stations that now stood unattended, gloomy and threatening and represented a silent, intangible threat to everything that was left of the world. I couldn't change it, so I pushed the thought away. With the flashlight in my hand I felt much safer when I descended into the cellar. Arrived downstairs, I was immediately pleased. In the room to my right was a well-equipped workshop. Worktop, various orphaned, meanwhile useless power tools. The wall hung full of hammers, files and saws and there were thousands of nails, screws and nuts in the drawers. Everything was a little messy. Here the master of the house must have had retired for. Relaxing handicrafts. This assumption was confirmed by a half-full box of beer standing in a corner on the floor. Beck S. I let the beam of the flashlight wander further. Behind the door were some pieces of wood, among them a few round bars from which I immediately planned to make some bolts for the crossbow. There was another room which, apart from clotheslines, washing machine and dryer, was empty in the boiler room, which also no longer contained anything useful. I took a bottle of beer from the crate and left the cellar again. When I reached the top, I opened the bottle at the edge of the counter between living room and kitchen and took a deep sip. At that moment I nearly felt happy. Then I almost dropped the bottle in shock. Someone sneaked down the fence. At first just a shadow on the edge of my field of vision, then I realized it was a degenerate. I froze, didn't want him to look through the windows. I wouldn't let him see me. I wouldn't give him a reason to enter the house. I needed the security and protection it offered for a little while longer. Please, just a few more days without tension and without always having to look over my shoulder. My hands trembled as I watched him move out my field of vision. Ragged clothes, more holes than fabric, a spear made of a long iron pipe and a kitchen knife and a dirty scabby hand and bloodshot eyes and a suspiciously looking face. I couldn't tell if the guy was one of those degenerates who had been giving me nightmares for a week, but as soon as I thought about that night, a cold rage started boiling inside me. I could no longer see him and quickly moved from the counter to the kitchen window facing the street. There he was again. 
A little perplexed he looked at the chain with the padlock that I had used to lock the gate wings when I arrived outside. Then his eyes searched the windows, and as his gaze glided over me, I shivered. He hadn't seen me. He paused for a moment, then turned around and left. Was he really alone, or was he just a scout to lead his pack to fresh prey? As quietly as possible, I hurried upstairs into the bedroom. The outlook from this elevated position confirmed my fears. I watched him move away from the gate and stop. He made a brief gesture, and shortly afterwards they stepped out of the overgrown front garden of one of the neighboring houses on the right side of the dead end. Two more degenerates. One of them also carried an improvised spear, the other figure was a woman holding a baseball bat lined with nails in her hand. They exchanged a few words, then they went down the alley together. One of the men looked around again and I felt as if our eyes had met. I stopped at the window until after about 60 meters they turned right into a street and I could no longer see them. I noticed that I still was holding the beer bottle spasmodically in my hand forced me to loosen my grip a little and took another novice sip. One more, then. And another. The last time I had drunk alcohol was a while ago and so a warm, cozy, light feeling soon set in in my body, which seemed somehow inappropriate to me. I sat down on the edge of the bed and allowed myself for a moment to enjoy this paradoxical feeling regardless of all danger. With one last, Big sip I emptied the bottle and thought about what I should do. I could not say for sure if the Degs had noticed me, but when the last drop of beer was finally drunk, something dawned on me. I had made a mistake. The padlock on the gate. It hung inside. Not on the outside. If the scout had been alert enough, he would have noticed that someone had locked himself in here. And where someone lived, there was food and there you could plunder and murder. On the other hand, he couldn't have known that I was alone. Maybe this uncertainty would keep them from taking the risk. So I could not say for sure if they would try to enter here, but I cursed myself for my mistake and decided not to stay longer than necessary. I gathered my belongings together. The backpack, the crossbow and the olive green bundeswar parka which was still on the bedroom floor and in whose side pocket were the remaining three bolts for the crossbow. In the drawer where I had found the flashlight, there was another pack of suitable batteries. I took those two, then I went back to the cellar and locked the door behind me. First thing I did was cocking the crossbow and put in a bolt. To have it handy, I placed it on the left edge of the worktop. Then I took another bolt and started working. I messed up two workpieces, but for eight others I managed to make improvised missiles out of the round bars and long nails from a drawer with the help of wood glue, a small drill and hemp string. Since they had no feathers like the aluminum bolts from the sports store, they would never fly as far and straight as these, but at short range you could certainly cause enough damage with them to dissuade one or the other of the degs from possible attack intentions. I kept going. With a whetstone I sharpened the machete and the cheap survival knife. Then I left the basement again. I just wanted to put the cans I had stacked at the front door in my backpack and leave the house, when I saw them. In a small caravan they came along the dead end street. Five or six ragged figures with spears went ahead, followed by two carts, a four-wheeled car trailer and a handcart, each pulled by naked, emaciated people who had ropes around their necks. The body seemed weak and scuffed. Especially the body of the woman who had to pull the larger car trailer together with an old man. On the carts were supplies, tarpaulins and tent poles and some other things that I could not recognize exactly through the thick glass next to the front door and through the struts of the fence. Again I hurried up the stairs to the bedroom and tried to be quiet, although the procession was certainly still forty meters or more away. From here I could see a lot more, and the hair on my arms stood up. Behind the carts, also prevented from escaping by ropes, three children trotted. At this distance I estimated the age of the little ones between 8 and 11 years. 
it simply had to be the same degenerate group I came across a week ago. At the end of the caravan, for more degenerates walked tall, armed with knives, clubs, and spears. Two of them carried additional sports bows with translation and quivers with arrows on the shoulders. But all this was not that important at the moment. More importantly, in the blink of an eye I had made a decision and the sight of the prisoners had given me certainty. This pack of degenerate slavers wouldn't let any more kids get bitten to shreds by wild animals. Never again. However, my new determination did not prevent me from feeling fear. Fascinated like a rabbit in the spotlight, I watched fist balling and sweating how this platoon of wretched and wicked people set up camp right in front of my fence. That's why the scouts were there. They were not looking for easy prey today, but for a safe place to camp and the dead end was ideal since the supposedly empty houses, the fences and the overgrown gardens offered protection on three sides. As I watched the degenerates and their prisoners setting up camp outside my house, I tried to analyze the situation as objectively as possible. On the first floor of the house I was safe from discovery for the time being. No one bothered looking up. Soon I got aware of a simple hierarchy within the group. One guy was a little older than the rest, about fifty maybe. He was of wiry stature, the only one not dressed in rags and relatively tall. He stood, flanked by two strong-looking men, in the midst of the activity and seemed to consult with them. The rest of the troop was busy unloading the wagons pulled by the naked prisoners, or carrying flammable material, furniture and a lot of books, out of neighboring houses and piling it up in the middle of the improvised camp. The prisoners were still tied to the two carts, but had in the meantime sat on the ground and tried with a lowered gaze not to attract the displeasure of the bustling degenerates. Every now and then, however, one of them was beaten or kicked in passing and their fearful and damp noises of pain made the degs laugh mockingly. Once one of them pointed towards my house. Another time someone even shook the chain with which I had closed the gate, and I got sick with fear. Don T. Not now. I'm not ready yet. Icy Song, Sample. Conquerors. On the sea off air and armor, twelfth day of the hunger moon, 1546 after the rise. Urgic and Dalman stood side by side at the railing of the wave rider and stared at the burning city. So this was air and armor. Weeks of shelling by the Namurkan fleet with lightning tubes and catapults had reduced the once proud fortifications of the fortified harbor to rubble. Smoke rose from many points, even from deeper within the great city. Dalman made a striking sight in his armor. Urgic was no small man either. However, compared to his companion, he seemed more hulking than warlike, despite his size. He, too, wore the Namurkan armor as well as a cutlass and dagger at his belt and a crossbow on his back. Soon it would be their turn. Well, Urgic, do you still think it was a good idea to volunteer for the naval forces? Urgic understood what the man meant. The pay was ridiculous, the food bad and there was a good chance of coming to an unpleasant end in the 437th Campaign of Conquest in the name of the Immortal Island King. What's more, Urgic found it difficult to find anything like a plan or a common thread in the seemingly confused troop movements of the last few days. It almost seemed as if the Island King left it to chance which of the coastal cities should be plundered next, which caused heavy losses to the Namurkan naval forces time and again when the United Coastal Cities managed to isolate individual troop formations from the main Namurkan fleet. So far, Urgic and Dalman had been lucky. Even today, they had not been assigned to the first attack waves. But now, Captain Hadger had announced a minute ago, they were to be deployed to wipe out the last nests of resistance in air and armor. Urgic shrugged and turned to Dalman. I don't even know what you want. The others have already done most of the killing and bleeding, haven't they? When we get to the city, we'll probably be mostly busy looting. By the sea gods of the deep, I hope you're right, Urgic. Dalman averted his eyes from the burning city and turned to Urgic. 
He eyed him up and down, then in one swift motion grabbed Urgic's weapon's belt and tightened it over his portly belly, causing Urgic to gasp. You better not lose your cutlass though, huh? Urgic snorted unwillingly, but thanked him afterwards anyway. I'm actually not that fat, it's all the antidotes I. Dalman grinned and interrupted Urgic. Come on, here we go. They're already launching the first landing craft. Urgic looked, swallowed as he perceived the state of the boats, and then nodded. The men at the oars were working hard and Urgic was forced to do the same. If he hadn't been sweating before they even started, he was sweating now at the latest. He cursed inwardly. The sea was almost silent, as if it was completely unconcerned with the actions of the people. Which was true, Urgic thought now as he rode alongside Dalman in unison with the other ten warriors who sat with them in the worm-eaten boat. Urgic hated rowing, in any way. He was not a warrior. Besides, he preferred it when he could see which way he was going. Having to sit with his back to their destination now, not knowing what the last of Aaron Armour's defenses were up to, and forced to trust that the boat's helmsman really knew what he was doing, was against his nature. They moved in formation, the boat Urgic and Dalman were in being in the middle of the thirty other boats that were each supposed to bring a dozen warriors into Aaron armor. Fortunately, Urgic managed to divert his thoughts from the dangers ahead, even if it was only for a moment. He was not here for gold. Nor for fame and glory and the chance of social advancement, like Dalman. No. He was here for the scrolls and books for which Aaron Armour was so well known. For the Eternal Library, that repository of knowledge whose fame was sung about even in Namurka. For him it did not even matter what kind of knowledge he would find there. Not as long as it would help him in his profession alchemy or be useful in any other way. He only hoped that no foolish Namurkan port thug had come up with the idea of setting the library on fire and he hoped that Dika, the goddess of luck, would see to it that he would somehow get near the gigantic building, which he himself knew only from the tales of his mentor, the gods be merciful to him. The old potion brewer had raved about this fountain of knowledge almost every other day, and when the old man had finally died and bequeathed his laboratory to Urgic before the latter's education was even close to completion, Urgic had decided that he wanted to see the place for himself some distant day. As he had then discovered, this was not such an easy undertaking, for it soon turned out that his master had accumulated indecently high debts. By the time Urgic had settled them, there was not too much left of his inheritance. Sure, he could have sold the big house at Ray Square to finance his trip to the mainland. But he had not wanted to do that. The location had been too good and there were too many memories of his childhood and early youth attached to the building. Besides, it was good, he thought, to have a place where you belonged. So he had sought out a new master who could teach him and help him complete his alchemy training. During the day Urgic studied like a man possessed, every evening he experimented, and otherwise kept his head above water by selling simple potions, powders, and tinctures that could relieve infirmities and minor ailments. A school of cliff sharks rocked some boats as it circled them once and then disappeared toward the open sea. Urgic watched them until the last dorsal fin was submerged. Things had gone on like that for a while, and the thought of the library of Aaron Armour had never quite left him. It happened one evening, half a year after he had successfully completed his training, that Urgic had overheard a conversation between two guardsmen of House Swordwale. In this way he had learned that Aaron Armour was one of the places to be plundered in one of the yearly raids the Island King had announced. Of course, he had not thought for too long and had hired on the wave rider. Dalman, of course, knew nothing of all this. Urgic had let him believe that he was only interested in gold and adventure. He had not told him that he would leave the fighting party to which they were both assigned at the first opportunity. He would set out on his own to find the library, at least if he had to. Of course, Urgic hoped that he would be lucky and that it would be his squad, 
of all people, that would be led by to the vicinity of the building by pure luck. He hadn't he been counting on it, though. He gave Dalman a sidelong glance. It was unfortunate that his friend did not have similar foresight as he did. Sure, the battle was already as good as won, and Dalman would perhaps be able to grab a few coins here and there, which he would then squander as quickly as possible in the taverns and harbor brothels. They were very different in that respect, Urgic thought, as he rode on, the sounds of battle carried by the wind to their ears slowly growing louder. When they had moored at the fortified harbor, they had met only weak resistance. At first, Urgic had not even had to endure the embarrassment of having to draw his cutlass. A good thing, because he couldn't really handle it. That was more like Dalman's territory. The man was eager to eventually draw his blade and dip it in some blood. Urgic could see the barely hidden displeasure in his face because things didn't want to move faster. And that was despite the fact that they hadn't known each other for very long. For Urgic and Dalman, it was the first time they had been involved in the sacking of a city, and for both of them it would be the last. It was not the corpses of their slain enemies that disturbed Urgic. It was not the dead warriors, men, women and children, scattered in the Great Harbor Alley and on the quay walls. It was the screams and wails and pleas of those who had survived the initial battles wounded and were now trying to crawl and limp their way out of the hands of the Namurkan invaders. It now fell to Urgic's squad to put these poor dogs out of their misery, while other boat crews formed larger squads at the harbor and charged into the city. What a ghastly job! Fire, smoke and debris all around them. Urgic held back as best he could. Dalman, too, did his job rather grudgingly. They both hit and stabbed just often enough not to stand out among their comrades as lazy, cowardly or squeamish. Urgic tried to shield his emotions as best he could from all the suffering. He did not succeed completely. With each life he ended, something grew inside him that he could not name. But he could feel it, deep down in his guts. It was straining him. He was panting and sweating as he roamed the streets of air and armor with his comrades. His insides grew colder and colder. He watched Dalman split the skull of an old woman who had collapsed, whimpering, beside the corpse of her son. Dalman seemed to take it on differently than Urgic. Urgic could see that Dalman quite quickly developed a certain ambition to kill as quickly and efficiently as possible. Almost after each blow, the young man looked around, seeking the approval of his mates. Urgic did him the favor a few times, nodding appreciatively. At some point, however, he stopped. Instead, he began to think about how he was going to get away from the squad. Clearly, the battle was already won, and all he and his comrades were doing was more or less. Well, clean up work. They continued through the sacked city, past a burning temple, past dead bodies and sling stones lying around and the splinters of sea fire amphorae that the ship's catapults had rained down. The streets were full of blood, death, corpses, and wounded. Full of frightened and grieving women and wailing children. Urgic's squad, meanwhile, had moved on to just finishing off people in armor. It wasn't as if there had been an order or something. It had happened silently, all by itself, after their squad leader had been shot in the eye with a bolt from some window, from the third or fourth floor of a Port Authority building. Just a second before he had yelled, down with the enemies of Namurka, as he had done more or less constantly since they had entered the city. This time, the last time, he had only gotten as far as down with. He had simply fallen over. Immediately dead. Briefly, there had been perplexity, and Urgic and Dalman had been no exception. For some reason, each member of the squad had sought reassurance from his comrades. Dalman was the first to realize they were under fire and began yelling. Get back! Get back! Urgic was quick to interrupt him, as he wanted just about anything, but certainly not to go back. Not back! 
Not if you don't want to risk being dishonored and ending up in front of an American court-martial. Follow me. With those words, he was off and running. More or less. Urgic did not like running. First, he found running to be a very undignified form of traveling. Second, it was difficult for him with his girth, which was already quite considerable despite his young years. And third, it was because of the war gear he had to lug around. He was just used to his robes. When Urgic put his feet up, Dalman realized that he was serious about what he had said and followed him without provoking any further discussion. Briefly, Urgic looked around to the rear and realized that four more of their small fighting force had decided to follow him and Dalman. They would never find out what had become of the other men and women. Urgic was lucky. Just before he would have really run out of breath, he stumbled ahead of the rest of his squad onto a crossroad. There had been a major skirmish here, not too long ago. There still were enough wounded enemy soldiers here to kill and plunder. He raised his arm, giving the order to stop. That was all he had to do. Dalman and the others pounced on the wounded, making short work of them. Rings, necklaces, purses and other items changed owners in no time. Only Urgic held himself back. While his friends pounced on the dead like greedy carrion birds, taking whatever they needed or wanted, he looked around, inwardly cursing the fact that he had his map of the city of Aaron Armor not with him, and feverishly rummaged through his memory. Fortunately, his memory was excellent. While he had not been able to memorize the complete map, he had been able to memorize some of the more prominent landmarks. They had come closer to the Great World Library of Aaron Armor. Now they had to. Urgic! Aren't you going to participate at all? The voice belonged to Dalman. Urgic shook his head. You go ahead and do it. But hurry up. I will lead you to a far more rewarding prey if you trust me. Dalman hesitated briefly, then shrugged and continued, cutting two rings from the fingers of a fallen soldier. A brief pang of disgust and disapproval flashed through Urgic, but he soon suppressed it. He still needed these people. Who was he to judge or interfere with them? On the other hand, Thyshor. Thyshor, let the girl live, do you hear? She has nothing of value to you. Urgic shouted these words in the direction of the veteran who had just lashed out to slay a little girl who was crouching apathetically beside the corpse of a woman on the devastated street, humming to herself. She doesn't. But she doesn't want to leave her mother, and she has. Leave her alone. Thyshor said nothing more in response. He merely scowled at Urgic and went to work on the corpse of an enemy soldier. Urgic turned away. There were three directions to choose from and he had to decide which way to go. Urgic liked to make his decisions based on information. But he didn't have any. He thought he knew which way was the shortest, but unfortunately he had no idea if it also was the least dangerous. Left into Mirabine Street? Straight ahead into Thun Alley, or to the right, along Goldbrasson Street, only in a different direction? Or should they even try to get to the Great World Library of Aaron Armor through the houses and in as straight a line as possible? The decision was partially taken away from him when loud roars of attack sounded from the right, from Goldbrasson Street. In a flash, Urgic whirled around. His heart was beating up to his throat. Two dozen torn and battle-scarred soldiers of the local city guard were getting ready to charge at them. Crossbows up, shouted Urgic, leading by example. The panting alchemist jerked his crossbow around by the strap until he could grasp it and send a bolt toward the onrushing fighters. He had aimed at the chest of a saber-wielding woman with her mouth agape and a hair lip in the midst of the attackers. Well, he was sure to at least have hit someone, but he didn't look to confirm that assumption. It didn't matter. There were too many of them anyway. Escape was inevitable. 
If he landed a hit, the best he could hope for was that the person's death and subsequent fall would briefly stall the assault of the Aaron Armorian soldiers and buy him and his men a little time. Retreat, he now shouted. Quickly! This way, he roared with fake optimism, waiting until at least two of his men, Dalman being one of them, had turned to face him and seen which way he was pointing. He ran ahead, once again, and despite the still continuing battle cries of their new opponents, he could hear his men following him after they too had unleashed their bolts on the city guard. They ran even farther this time than the first time. One of his soldiers, a woman named Ellen, was the first to catch up to him and finally started to overtake. She almost made it, when a bolt hit her in the side, and she cried out, staying behind, dumbfounded, one hand closed around the red-feathered wooden shaft sticking out of her body. Testily, and as if in a trance, she gave it a little tug, but she could not get herself to pull the bolt all the way out. Soon everyone else had overtaken the wounded warrior and continued to run after Urgic, and then the first members of the city guard reached the woman they had left behind. The first of the enemy soldiers ran past the dying Alan, but the last three just about hacked her body to pieces. A tiny bit of guilty conscience stirred in Urgic. She had been here because of him. At least the slower Aaron Armorians had also accomplished a heroic deed in this way which they could now tell their children and grandchildren. About. Well, if they survived this raid. Urgic had not even noticed that he had stopped to watch the gruesome spectacle. Panicking, he turned the other way and saw that all his warriors, Dalman included, had overtaken him. He registered that he now was right between them and their attackers. As fast as he could, he ran again and tried to join his comrades.